I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. In accordance with Standing Order 41G and the determinations of the Selection Committee, I present copies of the terms of the motion for which have been given by the honourable members for Bendigo, Gippsland, Fowler, Fraser, La Trobe and Shortland. These matters will be considered in the Federation Chamber later today. The member for Reid has the call. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. And on indulgence, can I begin the week by wishing a very happy birthday to the former member for Throsby, the great Jenny George. Happy birthday, Jen. Uh, Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Standing Committee on Petitions and in accordance with Standing Order 207, I present the following petitions. From 4,224 petitions regarding persecution of Falun Gong in China, from 176 petitioners requesting the retention of the definition of marriage, a petition from 428 petitioners and a petition from 95 petitioners requesting the amendment of employment standards in the Fair Work Act 2009 to recognise uh, the Monday and or Tuesday following Christmas, Boxing and New Year's Day and Easter Sunday and additional public holidays. From one petitioner uh, requesting that the Private Health Insurance Act 2007 requires that private health insurance providers offer full health insurance coverage with no co-payment charges or gap payments from 2,645 petitioners requesting a nationally owned bank to be established, from 134 petitioners requesting that asylum seeker legislation uphold standards set by the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights. Deputy Speaker, the following ministerial responses to petitions have been received from the Minister for Foreign Affairs to two petitions regarding human rights issues in West Papua from the Treasurer, a petition regarding the cost of living for pensioners in the northwestern region of Victoria. From the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, a petition regarding permanent residency requirements for a sibling of an Australian citizen. From the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, a petition regarding world heritage listing for the Dampier Archipelago. 
from the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry to two petitions regarding foreign ownership of Australian farmland and agricultural businesses, from uh, two letters from the Assistant Treasurer to two petitions regarding foreign ownership of Australian farmland and agricultural businesses, from the Minister for Health, a petition requesting federal funding under the Health and Hospitals Fund for La Trobe Regional Hospital, from the Minister for Financial Services and Superannuation, a petition requesting legislation to mandate disclosure by financial institutions of customer information being accessed offshore, from the Minister for Human Services, a petition regarding the eligibility process for concessional medicines under the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme when a dependent child turns 16, from the Attorney-General, a petition from Christians and Muslims opposing changes to the Marriage Act 1961, from the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, a petition opposing the closure of the Australian Post Delivery Centre at Ravina, Queensland. From the Minister for Health, a petition requesting a hydrotherapy facility in the Tomaree Peninsula, New South Wales. From the Minister for Foreign Affairs, a petition requesting increased foreign aid funding by 2005 for water, sanitation and hygiene. From the Special Minister of State, a petition requesting lowering the voting age to 16. From the Minister for Health, a petition requesting action to address shortages of general practitioners in Proserpine and the Whit Sundays. From the Minister for Human Services to two petitions regarding account-based pensions and superannuation income for people 55 or over under the Social Security Act 1991. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, over the winter recess there has been continual petition activity, petitioning activity, as you know, with petitioners forwarding their petitions to the committee for consideration in the first sitting week. And I thank you for your contribution on our committee. Similarly, ministerial responses have arrived and, following the committee's formal receipt of them when it met last week, I have today presented them to this House. This is a feature of the committee's work. Whilst its formal activities revolve very much around the activities of the House, it has its own ongoing processes that are followed in the same way as all parliamentary committees. Deputy Speaker, the Petitions Committee primarily facilitates tabling activity in the House but it also maintains its committee decision-making and stewardship role. For example, ministerial responses to petitions are addressed to the committee and as such are handled as private committee documents until reported to the House. The committee therefore acts as both a conduit to the tabling of petitions and responses to them and as a gatekeeper. Deputy Speaker, I believe this unique combination provides the House's petition system with a high level of certainty and responsiveness. This is because the House, House's committee-based system stipulates an objective mechanism of assessment against the House's petitioning requirements and, importantly, the guarantee that a petition which is certified as meeting those requirements can be tabled at the next available announcement opportunity. Madam Deputy Speaker, this assurance is strengthened by the ready access petitioners have to committee resources to ensure their draft petition complies with the House, House's requirements before they gather signatures. Deputy Speaker, the petitions process, as you know, is a dynamic one. A petition addressed to this House and meeting committee requirements can be tabled in the House, irrespective of when it is received. For example, unlike the inquiries of House standing committees, the petitions process does not conclude on the tabling of a report or lapse on dis dissolution of the parliament. Petitions may not be able to be assessed, presented or referred to a minister during a parliamentary recess, but a petition will be received and held for assessment when sittings recommence. The petition itself remains live. Deputy Speaker, as today's announcement attests, the ebb and flow of petitions and ministerial responses to petitions is outside the committee's control. The committee scrutinises petitions within the compliance framework set by this House. However, it has two important discretionary powers. The first, it may choose to refer a petition to a minister for comment, and secondly, it may conduct public hearings on presented petitions. Deputy Speaker, the committee usually refers petitions to the relevant minister where the subject matter has not previously been recently referred, although every petition's referral outcome is individually decided by the committee. Similarly, the committee can, but is not required, to speak with petitioners at public hearings. It does, not, it does take the opportunity to conduct public hearings from time to time. Rather than take a blanket approach 
to holding public hearings on a large number of petitions received, the committee has found value in selecting petitions which have displayed strong local interest for other notable characteristics and to discuss these petitions in general in greater detail. The committee cannot follow up or make recommendations to the government on individual petitions, as you know, but the hearing process enables a public dialogue with the potential for further action to take place beyond the committee's role merely because the matter has received further parliamentary airing. Deputy Speaker, the committee looks forward to discussions with a number of petitioners at public hearings to be held in Perth after this sitting fortnight. I'm sure it will be a worthwhile exercise and I will report back to this House on the outcome. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The member, the clerk. Delegation business, report from the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. The member for Werriwa has the call. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, and Defence and Trade, it gives me great pleasure to present the committee's report on Australia's human rights dialogue with China and Vietnam. Many submissions and witnesses to this inquiry express concern about the perceived lack of progress achieved by Australia's human rights dialogue so far. But overall, the consensus in the community seems to be that it is constructive to be talking to other countries about Australia's perspective on human rights. This support notwithstanding, there were many suggestions made on how the dialogues could be improved including taking steps to measure the effectiveness of the dialogues, actively engaging NGOs in the dialogue process, strengthening the participation of parliamentarians and more detailed reporting of the dialogues. In order to address the concerns about evaluating the effectiveness of the dialogues, the committee recommends that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade convene a panel of experts to consult widely in order to produce a report outlining a set of principles and aims for Australia's dialogues as well as a set of benchmarks so that progress towards these aims can be effectively measured. And I say that was a matter very much raised by a number of members of the committee, the uh, inadequacy or non-existence in many cases of benchmarks. To increase the, roles of the, in, of the, of the role of the NGOs in the dialogues process, the committee makes two recommendations. Firstly, we recommend the construction of a human rights web portal to act as a central access point for all Australian government human rights information and activity. This web portal will also enable NGOs and other concerned groups and individuals to engage in an ongoing online interactive dialogue and will allow them to receive more regular feedback on what happens in the dialogues. And I'd say that's uh, part of the uh, problem we do face, that whilst there was very widespread interest uh, in this process by uh, uh, the diasporas uh, of, China, of Vietnam in particular and to a lesser extent China uh, and from other communities that thought there should be dialogues with their own uh, homelands. Uh, the actual wider uh, response to the inquiry by the Australian public uh, was not uh, overwhelming and I guess that's uh, important that there is more information out there uh, for people. Secondly, as an additional way to engage NGOs in the dialogue process, the committee calls for biannual meetings between the participating agencies and interested NGOs, ethnic community groups and individuals devoted to discussion of the dialogues. We recommend that these meetings be held alternatively in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne so as to make it easier for community groups with limited resources to participate. Now, obviously that's a very important uh, point. The committee itself has been uh, taking up with the minister uh, the lack of resources of members to actually participate in these dialogues, let alone the general public's uh, lack of finance to be, play a role. The committee also calls for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to provide prompt reports after each round of dialogue and furthermore for the department to work to facilitate the participation of parliamentarians in the dialogues themselves. These two recommendations are crucial for strengthening parliamentary oversight of the dialogues. In addition to the human rights web portal's obvious additional benefits of increasing the transparency and reporting on the dialogues, the committee also makes another recommendation to enhance the reporting of the dialogues. The committee recommends that the department expand the reporting of the dialogues currently contained in its annual report to include at least a list of participants, the issues raised by each dialogue partner and a list of the key outcomes of the dialogues. The community groups also suggested that Australia adopt bilateral dialogues with a number of other countries where obviously there were concerns, including Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Burma, Cambodia, Iran and Sri Lanka. 
The committee formed the view that it is an appropriate time to consider re-establishing its human rights dialogue with Iran, as well as making representations to the Sri Lankan government to open a formal dialogue on human rights. And I note we've had many submissions and uh, witnesses on that particular issue over the, the past year. In addition to establishing these dialogues, we think it is important to continually monitor and evaluate the human rights situations of countries in Australia's region, including an assessment of whether Australia should adopt a human rights dialogue with these countries. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to sincerely thank everyone who participated in the inquiry. One of the most pleasing aspects of this inquiry was the high level of participation by NGOs and ethnic community groups. These groups and individuals have generously donated their time, effort and limited resources to make thoughtful submissions and to appear at public hearings to voice support. I'd also uh, like to commend the work of the Secretariat in, uh, uh, as, a as a committee report where there was much uh, that was agreed upon, virtually the whole report, without any division It's all, and that uh, reflects on the work done by the committee Secretariat, and I recommend the report. Thank you, Member. The Member for Barawa has the comment. Well, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I endorse the comments of the Chair of the subcommittee and uh, support the report that is before us. Um, my approach will be somewhat different. Uh, but let me first thank the Secretariat for their help and assistance in relation to this matter. Um, we were asked to report on the effectiveness of the human rights dialogues, particularly those with China and Vietnam. Uh, we didn't get many submissions, uh, but amongst those that we did, um, you would have to ask yourself the question, uh, are the dialogues of any value at all? Um, the Australian Council for International Development said they were at risk of becoming rit ritualistic and an end in themselves. The International Commission of Jurists said they could be seen to legitimise or make respectable a particular government. The Tibet Council voiced its concern over Australian government's reliance on the annual human rights dialogue as a centrepiece for its efforts to improve China's human rights performance and had not seen a tangible outcome. And the Vietnamese Committee on Human Rights, after almost a decade of implementation, the lack of human rights progress in Vietnam raises serious questions about their relevance and impact. Uh, you see, Madam Deputy Speaker, you'd have to ask yourself the question, uh, were they really seen to be of any value when you have uh, questions of that sort being asked? Uh, the committee noted that it did not receive enough evidence to undertake an assessment as to whether there are measurable outcomes as a result of the human rights dialogue process and how effective it has been to date. Now, I looked very carefully at the human rights dialogues, the discussion that occurred and was reported on it, although I might say somewhat meagrely. Um, you, one of the reasons that the committee has recommended that it be enhanced is that there is not a great deal of information uh, available about the, these matters. The NGOs that deal with them uh, have had limited information, even the reporting uh, to the parliament has been somewhat meagre. I might say when members of parliament are advised as to when these dialogues might be uh, occurring, uh, we're lucky to get several weeks' notice, even though there is this desire uh, for members of parliament to actually participate in the process. Now, where is this leading me, Madam Deputy Speaker? We have recommended that the dialogues continue. Um, I think there is not much good sense in Australia berating governments abroad on human rights issues if it denies us an opportunity to talk about a range of other issues that are important bilaterally. And that's what tends to happen. I think there is some value um, in, the, uh, in, in the way in which the dialogues enable us to progress uh, human rights issues in a, in a way of advocating for change, um, and uh, it certainly enables us uh, to raise matters that we think are important bilaterally. Um, it also, I think, helps to increase um, our knowledge about human rights issues when these matters are progressed. It helps in relation to broader debate. Um, but I am one who has a very strong view um, that the parliamentary engagement in relation to the human rights dialogues has been something that the Department of Foreign Affairs has been happy to see sidelined. Um, but I think if we're going to get a very useful advance um, engagement which brings members of parliament into the process um, would encourage change also in the countries that we're talking to as to who they include in the processes. And I just happen to think that uh, if members of parliament or members of the congresses of whatever they call them in Vietnam and China were to be engaged, 
um, you might find they start to think about these issues domestically in a much more positive way. Um, now, how are we going to get this parliamentary involvement? At the moment, what the government says is, look, if members of parliament want to be involved, uh, let them find some philanthropic uh, organisation that might agree to send them. Uh, or uh, they say you can use your parliamentary allowances, uh, which we're just about to take away, um, and you can assume that that is the priority concern that you have and therefore the one that you should progress uh, when you're spending it. Well, I think the, uh, the rubber is hitting the road, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the uh, allowances that members have had to undertake some private travel is being stripped away. And if members of parliament are going to be engaged in this process, the government has to take seriously the recommendations in this report about the way in which members can be involved. And I would encourage them to take that up very seriously because it could make a realistic difference as to the way in which the these um, works has are undertaken. Expired. The time allotted for statements on this report has expired. Does the honourable member for Werriwa wish to move a motion in connection with the report to enable it to be debated on a later occasion? I move that the order of the day be referred to the Federation Chamber for debate. The question is, in accordance with Standing Order 39, the debate is adjourned. The resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Does the honourable member for Werriwa wish to move a motion to refer the matter to the Federation Chamber? Yes, I do, actually. I move <laughs> that uh, it is referred. I thank the member. The question is, in the motion, that the order of the day be referred to the Federation Chamber for debate be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Report number two, report from the Standing Committee on Regional Australia. The member for New England has the call. Well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Regional Australia, I present the committee's report incorporating additional uh, comments entitled certain matters relating to the proposed Murray-Darling Basin Plan, together with the minutes and proceedings and evidence received by the committee. Deputy Speaker, I rise today to present the Standing Committee on Regional Australia's second report on its inquiry into certain matters relating to the proposed Murray-Darling Basin Plan. This report was presented out of session on 6 July 2012. The committee undertook this inquiry on the request of the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, the Honourable Tony Burke, MP. The minister specifically asked the committee to direct its focus on three areas. One, progress to date on, in water recovery towards bridging the gap by 2019. Two, the role that environmental, environmental works and measures can play in offsetting the sustainable diversion limit reductions and three, uh, the uh, groundwater sustainable diversion limits. Mr. S uh, Deputy Speaker, being very aware that consultation on the draft plan was in its final stages, the committee agreed to undertake a narrow and focused inquiry intending to highlight areas that need to be addressed prior to the basin plan being introduced into the parliament. The report makes four recommendations in key areas that the committee believes must be addressed prior to the plan being introduced into the parliament. The committee found that there are some areas when the government, uh, wh there are some areas where the government can still improve the information being given to basin stakeholders. The first two recommendations of the report address issues where the committee believes that more information is required before the basin plan being introduced to the parliament. Firstly, the committee has recommended that the Commonwealth government develop and release a water recovery strategy addressing how the remaining 1,270 gigalitres of water is due to be recovered. Stakeholders are concerned that the government is acting without an appropriate forward strategy as to how this will be achieved. Secondly, in its uh, original report on this matter, the committee recommended that the Commonwealth environmental water holder be able to trade water into the productive market when not needed for environmental assets. Again, the committee has recommended that this pro uh, proposal be finalised so that the parliament can consider it along with the plan. Deputy Speaker, another key area of debate uh, in whether sustainable diversion limits may be offset by environmental works and measures. The committee has recommended that a mechanism be developed to automatically adjust these sustainable uh, diversion limits in response to the efficiencies gained by environmental works and measures, rather than the parliament having to approve the sustainable diversion limit changes. This will allow flexibility and responsiveness to be built into the plan. 
uh, rather than it being tied to the parliamentary calendar. I am pleased to note that the Sustainable Diversion Limit Adjustment Mechanism is included in the latest draft plan that was issued on 6 August 2012. Finally, the committee has recommended that the government look more seriously at river and irrigation management and monitoring. The committee had evidence in this and the previous inquiry that better river and irrigation management and monitoring can achieve water savings and prevent evaporative losses, and yet governments at all levels have been slow to act. This is one of the key areas that must be addressed as part of this reform. Without acting to better manage the rivers, only half of the reform process will have been uh, completed. Deputy Speaker, whilst not making recommendation on the groundwater issues that were part of the inquiry, the committee notes its ongoing concern about the uh, impact of the coal seam gas mining uh, that may have on the groundwater resources. Finally, Deputy Speaker, the report is a unanimous one, with some additional comments uh, from the member for Murray clarifying her position on some matters. I commend the report to the House and thank those committee members, that, not only in terms of this particular inquiry, which was a short, sharp inquiry, uh, but the, to the quite exhausting inquiry that uh, we did uh, earlier this year and, um, and last year as well. Uh, the committee has worked extraordinarily well together, in my view, and I think if, uh, if that demeanour can be carried through the parliament, where people across the political spectrum actually come together with a, with a common aim and, and a common objective, uh, we can see some achievement uh, come out of this particular parliament. I also thank the Secretariat for their very diligent uh, and hard work and all those people who have taken the time to be part of this process. The member for Bendigo has the uh, Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I would like to endorse the words of the member for New England. I uh, would also like to point out that uh, both inquiries, the very gruelling inquiry undertaken earlier uh, and this very short inquiry, were very skilfully led by the member for New England. And I think it's, uh, a lot of the credit as to why we've got a unanimous report was down to his stewardship and negotiation ability, and uh, we should be forever indebted to him. As he said, this inquiry was conducted over a period of five weeks to enable the committee to report in a timely manner to enable the recommendations to be incorporated into the Ministerial Council's uh, consideration of, of its draft plan. Submissions were directly uh, support, uh, sought directly from Basin state governments, peak interest groups, the general public and 40 submissions are received, with 17 organisations and three state governments represented at public hearings. As with the committee's first inquiry in this matter, the community, uh, the com community submitted a range of water use saving proposals, ranging from uh, six gigalitres through to the use of the desalination plant in Adelaide to 1,100 one, uh, 1, gigalitres by better watering of the Lindsay Walpola Island in Victoria. Uh, the report found that there are some areas where the department has been not quite effective in uh, getting its message out, and I understand that's been addressed. Uh, I won't go on for much longer except to say that, uh, again, to thank the chair, uh, very capably led by the member for New England, but also the secretariat under Glenn Worthington and uh, ably assisted by Suborn Lane, Casey, Katrina and Emily. Uh, not so much in the second inquiry, but the first inquiry was conducted sometimes, not often, under the most uh, gruelling and trying of circumstances, uh, not to mention the heat, the, flus uh, the dust and the flies travelling in uh, North New South Wales and uh, Southern Queensland in high summer. Uh, but it was a very enjoyable trip. A lot of good comradeship was uh, shown during that. And I think we've come up with a report that uh, very, very uh, accurately reflects what the people in the basin are thinking, both sides of the argument, if you like to use that word. And I still think very, very strongly that there is capable of getting a win-win situation. We took evidence to prove that. I know the minister is striving to do that. And uh, I just say on a note of caution, if we don't get this right this time, well, there will probably never be another opportunity to be able to get uh, the reforms needed to ensure a sustainable Murray-Darling Basin for all of the communities involved, whether they be environmental, uh, irrigators, farming communities or small businesses. Thank you very much. The time a lot of statements on this report has expired. Does the honourable member from New England wish to move a motion in connection with the report to enable it to be debated on a later occasion?
Uh, Deputy Speaker, I move that the House take note of the report. In accordance with Standing Order 39, the debate is adjourned. The resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day of the next sitting. Does the Honourable Member for New England wish to move a motion to refer the matter to the Federation Chamber? Deputy Speaker, I move that the order of the day be referred to the Federation Chamber for debate. The question is that the order of the day be referred to the Federation Chamber for debate. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Report number three, report from the Standing Committee on Health and Ageing. The member for Hindmarsh has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Health and Ageing, uh, I present uh, the committee's discussion paper on the late effects of polio post polio syndrome together with the minutes of the proceedings. Thank you. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, as I said on behalf of the Standing Committee, uh, um, we present here today the discussion paper on the late effects of uh, polio and post polio syndrome. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this report uh, was uh, a roundtable that we uh, held earlier this year, and we know that polio is a crippling and potential fatal infectious disease. Uh, between the 1930s and the 1960s, many thousands of Australians contracted polio. Uh, some experienced mild flu-like symptoms, perhaps not even realising that they had contracted uh, polio, but others were permanently uh, paralysed. The good news, Deputy Speaker, uh, is that the development of effective uh, vaccines uh, in the 50s and 60s, coupled with uh, a global effort, has all but eradicated polio. And Australia was officially declared polio-free by the uh, WHO in 2000. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, the bad news is that polio has left uh, a legacy. Uh, even though people seem to recover from the initial infection, uh, years later many polio survivors uh, started developing new symptoms. The most common complaints include fatigue, muscle weakness and pain. Uh, these are collectively uh, known as late effects of polio or LEOP for short. LEOP can be a very, uh, um, a very severe condition. Its impact on uh, sufferers and their families is very significant. It's unclear how many Australians are affected by LEOP and how many more are at risk of developing the condition. Uh, it is likely that there's thousands of Australians affected or at risk, uh, even so the late effects of polio appear to have gone largely uh, unrecognised uh, in Australia. Uh, it is likely that there are thousands of Australians affected, um, as, as I said. Uh, but uh, to learn more about this issue and to the, raise the awareness of this issue, uh, the uh, Health and Ageing uh, Committee decided to hold a roundtable discussion. Uh, this took place in Melbourne uh, last March, uh, sorry, in March this year. And um, I, I also note the presence of uh, uh, Acting Deputy Speaker, who was uh, there at the roundtable. Um, it was attended by polio advocates, doctors, uh, people involved in research. Uh, and it uh, took part, as I said, uh, in March this year. There were also some patients who came along to share their first-hand experiences of living with the late effects of polio, and they told us about all the physical, social, emotional and financial impacts uh, of uh, late effects of polio, of which uh, there are many. Deputy Speaker, people with LEOP have uh, restricted mobility. They get tired easily, which makes it hard for them to attend uh, social functions and get involved in their community. Uh, it's also expensive to have the late effects of polio. You need to pay for medication, doctor's appointments, uh, special equipment, modifications to cars and home. So after hearing all this, but we, you know, we weren't surprised to hear that people with the late effects of uh, polio are often socially isolated and financially disadvantaged. And it was interesting to hear that it can be hard to even get the right diagnosis to begin with, uh, which was a uh, big factor in, uh, in treating the, uh, the, the, the illness. There are a lot of reasons for this, but one of them is that there's no particular test for the late effects of polio. So unless your doctor knows about it, you might not even get diagnosed. In fact, it takes, uh, on average, we heard, the committee heard, six years for a patient to receive the correct diagnosis for the late effects of polio. In, and in the meantime, you might be uh, misdiagnosed and given treatment that makes it worse. Uh, once people have been correctly diagnosed, Deputy Speaker, it's really important that people have access to proper support services. Um, in fact, Polio uh, Service Victoria is Australia's only public funded specialist service, but it's not, uh, it's not all bad news. The committee found that several current government policies are likely to help people with uh, the late effects of polio. Uh, the GP super clinics and Medicare locals uh, that the government is rolling out will fill some of the current gaps in services and improve delivery on multidisciplinary uh, care. Uh, having a personally controlled electronic health records would mean that people with LEOP don't need to drag their massive re uh, medical records from doctor to doctor. 
Um, the, the committee made some recommendations which are contained in the report, um, such as uh, information, how important it was. It was surprised to hear that no one really knows how many people have LEOP, so we've recommended that the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, or the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare establish mechanisms to collect that information and report on, these, on this data. We've also got two recommendations about awareness. The first is that information on LEOP should be included in relevant uh, undergraduate health degrees like medicine. And the second is for the Medicare locals to help to increase the awareness of LEOP among health professionals already in practice and among the wider community. Uh, we now eagerly await the response of the Health Minister uh, to these recommendations, and I sincerely thank everyone involved in the, uh, in the inquiry. And, uh, <laughs> Deputy Speaker, I commend this paper to the House. Thank you. I call the member for Swan. Thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the discussion paper on the late effects of polio, post polio syndrome and uh, also support the comments of the chair uh, that he just made in the chamber. It's also good to see that uh, we've got a quorum of the committee here, uh, with current members of the chamber sitting here, including yourself, Acting Deputy Speaker. Poliomyelitis, commonly referred to as polio, is a viral infection that was widespread in the Western world until the early 1960s. Polio is a crippling and potentially fatal disease. Between the 1930s and 1960s, there were more than 40,000 cases recorded as Australia experienced a number of epidemics. International efforts led to the rollout of vaccine programs beginning in the late 1950s and have prevented new infections in Australia whilst resulting in a 99 per cent decrease in the number of polio cases worldwide between 1998 and 2010. Australia was officially declared polio-free by the World Health Organisation in 2000. Despite the eradication of polio in Australia over the last 20 years, much attention has been drawn to the development of new, previously unrecognised symptoms which occur in people who are thought to have reached a stable level of recovery after the acute disease. Many polio survivors who have emerging symptoms still report difficulty in obtaining correct diagnosis and treatment. These symptoms include muscle weakness and pain, fatigue, respiratory compromise and an inability to stay alert. These characterise the late effects of polio or post-polio syndrome. Acting Deputy Speaker, the Health and Ageing Committee, which uh, I am the Deputy Chair of, has been looking into the late effects of polio post-syndrome, and this is the paper that came from that uh, inquiry, or the roundtable that was held in Melbourne. Acting Deputy Speaker, although it is unclear how many polio survivors are in Australia, Post-polio syndrome is a potentially debilitating condition. The time lag from initial infection to the second phase varies but is usually around 30 years and the onset is usually slow and steady. Although there is no accurate data on the prevalence of post-polio syndrome in Australia, it is estimated that thousands of individuals are either affected or at risk of developing the condition. Many of those affected are over 50 years of age, which reflects the fact that polio was an uncommon infection in Australia by the, 90, by the early 1960s. However, there are cases amongst those who migrated to Australia from countries who did not eradicate polio as successfully or where it is still an epidemic. This younger group of survivors affected by post-polio syndrome means that the condition needs to be addressed now and for many years to come in Australia. Despite the seriousness of the symptoms, awareness about post-polio syndrome amongst health professionals and the wide co wider community <coughs> in Australia is very low. The Health and Ageing Committee decided to hear about the post-polio syndrome and its impact on polio survivors, their families and carers. On the 30th of March 2012, the committee held a roundtable discussion in Melbourne. Participants at the roundtable included representatives of Polio Australia and associated state-based polio networks which between them provide support and advocacy for Australia's polio survivors. The roundtable also included representation from health professionals involved with the treatment and clinical management of post-polio syndrome, as well as representatives of the Health and Ageing Department. These discussions held with these groups formed the basis of the committee's discussion paper. The aim of the roundtable was to provide a better understanding of the challenges facing those affected and to raise the profile of the condition through discussion in a public forum. Roundtable participants demonstrated strong knowledge of the area and there was strong consensus amongst participants on the main issues. Acting Deputy Speaker, the committee concluded there are some key issues that warrant specific recommendations. The committee was particularly concerned about the lack of information on the prevalence of late effects of polio post syndrome and the size of the population at risk. 
The committee understands the basic research needed to improve diagnostic capability, which will enable accurate determination of prevalence. However, there is still a need to establish a mechanism to gauge the possible extent of post-polio syndrome in Australia. The committee recommends the Australia Bureau of Statistics compile data to estimate the number of polio survivors living in Australia and determine within that population the proportion currently experiencing the condition. A key benefit will be to raise awareness of the prevalence of this post-polio syndrome to ensure GPs and other health professionals are aware of the condition and better able to diagnose it and recommend appropriate treatment to the patients. The committee also recommends that Medicare locals actively engage with, post -polio, with Polio Australia and state-based post-polio associations, with state and territory government departments of health and with general practitioners to promote activities which will raise awareness of the late effects of post-polio syndrome. Acting Deputy Speaker, I commend the report to the House and thank the Secretariat for all their work and also the other committee members and also to all the post-polio syndrome sufferers who have, since the discussion paper has been released, uh, applauded the work by the committee. Thank you. Thank you. The time allotted for statements on this report has expired. Does the honourable member for Hindmarsh wish to move a motion in connection with the report to enable it to be dated, debated later on a later occasion? Uh, I move that the House take note of the report. Um, in accordance with Standing Order 39, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made an order of the day for the next sitting. Does the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh wish to move a motion to refer the matter to the Federation Chamber? I uh, move that the order of the day be referred to the Federation Chamber for debate. I'll put that motion. Um, put the question. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the motion is carried. The motion is carried. The clerk. Report number four, report from the Australian Parliamentary Delegation, European Parliamentary Institutions. I call on the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the European Parliament, an institution and, and bilateral visit to Israel from 20 April to 4 May 2012. Seek leave to make a statement as uh, well. You have leave. It's okay, Deputy Speaker. You have leave. I, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to table the delegation report on the parliamentary delegation to the European Parliament, European institutions, and bilateral visit to Israel, undertaken from the 20th of April to the 4th of May this year. The delegation was led by the President of the Senate, the Senator the Honourable John Hogg. Uh, who sadly has since announced his retirement. He uh, did great service to the parliament on this delegation and obviously since he's been elected. He was, he was accompanied by Senator Ian MacDonald, uh, Senator Bridget McKenzie and from the House of Representatives, the member for Macmillan, Russell Broadband MP, the member for Robertson, Deb O'Neill, uh, who will speak after me, uh, and myself. Parliamentary delegations are an important part of building inter-parliamentary relationships. The opportunity to meet with parliamentary counterparts in the European Parliament in Brussels and the Belgian and French Senates and continue the already well-established parliamentary dialogue led to a frank and good-humoured dialogue that benefited all participants. At the European Parliament, the delegation met with the President of the Parliament and participated in the 35th Australian-European Union interparliamentary meeting. President Schulz address, expressed a strong desire to visit Australia during his term as president, and the delegation noted that the Australian Parliament would welcome such a visit. Deputy Speaker, the Australian EU parliamentary meeting has been occurring since 1981 and is the focal point for the relationship between Australia and the European Parliament. The report outlines the discussions held at this meeting and hope that we'll be soon able to return the excellent hospitality that this delegation was offered while in uh, Israel. Certainly, Deputy Speaker, one of the, the most uh, memorable moments for me was, standing, was going to the Tynecott Cemetery and, uh, and um, a service conducted by um, Brendan Nelson, uh, uh, where, where Brendan Nelson spoke uh, at the, in front of the Cross of Sacrifice. Probably one of the coldest mornings I've ever experienced in my life, but uh, to do that on Anzac Day was certainly a very moving experience. Uh, also. Uh, great to see Australians all around the world uh, doing great things. We went to the Nuclear Energy Agency uh, and um, met with Mr Ron Cameron uh, and his colleague Mr Ted Laso. So it's great to see Australians, especially after the Fukushima disaster, 
doing great things in terms of monitoring nuclear controls, and then uh, to go to to go to Israel, as a, especially as a um, as a Catholic, but also someone with a significant population who are concerned about what's going on in Palestine, was an incredible opportunity. And we went to the Aida UNRWA refugee camp, um, an incredible area, just. 0.71 square kilometres, but houses 4,700 refugees. Obviously, incredibly overcrowded. And to stand on the roof of the one of the schools and look down at the uh, the walls separating this community, the walls separating houses from their farms, was quite quite a moving experience. And to to uh, see the boys to go to a classroom with the boys was also an, an incredible opportunity. And I particularly thank David Hutton. The direct, deputy director from the, the West Bank UNRWA and all the staff at the, the Aida camp for the time they spent with us, and uh, as I said, uh, particularly as a Catholic, to go to the Church of the Nativity was also, uh, and to meet with the um, uh, Dr. Batter, Battersea, uh, Dr. Victor Battersea, the Mayor of Bethlehem, and the church leaders was quite an experience. Uh, then we also met with the Palestine Monetary Authority and Dr. Ghassan Khatib, the director of the Palestinian Government Media Centre, to hear about uh, the history, the future, the hopes, the dreams, and the challenges facing that community. Um, well, it was quite, a, quite an experience. Uh, Deputy Speaker, it, we were honoured to be able to represent the Australian Parliament on this important delegation, and I commend the report to the House. Thank the honourable member for his contribution. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I rise to speak also to the delegation report, the parliamentary delegation to the European Parliament and Institutions and bilateral visit to Israel, 20th of April to the 4th of May, 2012. Uh, in in this place, where sometimes conversations are very harsh and bipartisan uh, cooperation isn't always at the forefront, it's very important to uh, note the way relationships develop that enhance the work we do here in the parliament when we actually do spend significant periods of time with our colleagues across, uh, across this sometimes cavernous divide. And I want to uh, pay particular tribute to the contributions that I believe are in our national interest from this delegation's visit to the, EU, for, to the EU, to Paris, uh, to um, Palestine and to Israel. Uh, we were very ably led by the, Senator, Honor the Honourable Senator John Hogg, and uh, his assistance uh, was very well um, offered also by the uh, Deputy Leader, the Honourable Ian MacDonald. From this chamber, uh, Russell Broadbent uh, and Graham uh, Perrett attended with me, and from the Senate, Brid uh, Senator Bridget McKenzie. Uh, I think that it was a team that did Australia proud. Uh, we were Team Australia while we were away, and I have to say that uh, the, the very first place in which we gathered to undertake our work as a parliamentary delegation was in Brussels, where the current uh, ambassador, Brendan Nelson, uh, is doing an absolutely outstanding job in terms of making sure our interests are represented at the very highest levels. Uh, the point of these delegations in terms of parliament to parliamentary, parliamentary to parliamentary conversations was always very, very much emphasised by Senator Hogg, who uh, understands that the permanence of these relationships can sometimes transcend uh, the other relationships of, uh, of our place, our, response, our, our relationship with this place, I guess ourselves. So to build on great work that's been done by those before us and to continue to represent Australia in these places is a vital part of the work that we do. Um, in terms of our visit to the European Parliament, uh, we had extremely uh, high-level talks with uh, Mr Martin Schulz, the of, President of the European Parliament, and Mr Klaus Weller, the Secretary-General of the European Parliament. Critically, this is uh, vital for us at this point of time. Uh, since 2008, the Australian-EU relationship has been guided by a partnership framework. But there have been changes to the Lisbon Treaty that have created a new institutional structure within the EU. Now, this has very much impacted on Australia's relationship and how we intend to interact with the EU in future. Um, in October of 2010, Prime Minister Gillard proposed that Australia and the EU negotiate a treaty-level framework, which is basically the underpinning for all of the great work that we can do with the EU. And I'm pleased to say that I believe we were able to advance that agenda in our time there. Um, we followed that very, very quickly with, um, 
one of the most uh, moving experiences of my life thus far to be at the dawn service in Polygon Wood uh, on Flanders Fields. Uh, the music that was offered by three amazing service women from the Air Force, the Army and the Navy enhanced tremendously that recognition of Australia's service and the great loss of life in the cause of freedom in those uh, fields of Flanders so many years ago. And I feel extremely privileged to have been there and very pleased that the Australian Government was represented at that occasion because there are so many Australians who are going to acknowledge that. In Paris, our work uh, has been reasonably uh, undertaken in, in his report by my colleague, uh, the member for Graham Perrett, the member for, member for Morton. Morton. Uh, sorry, thank you very much. And uh, he also uh, spoke about the second part of our trip where we were in Palestine and also in Israel. Um, I too was very touched by my visit to the uh, Aida camp, the refugee camp in Palestine, but I want to take the time that's remaining to me to put on the record um, how moved we were by our experience of visiting Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. Uh, that is a truly remarkable place that aptly records the horror of that period of time with an indication for us never to forget and always to look to the future to better ways of solving the conflicts that necessarily emerge between us from time to time as human beings and as nations and as people who have different ideologies needing to negotiate a safe space for all people to participate. Uh, I'd also uh, like to take this opportunity to give my thanks to the Australian ambassadors and embassy staff serving in Belgium, in France, in uh, Israel and also in, uh, the, in Palestine. We are ably served by these missions. They do us great credit. Thank you. Members, time has expired. Uh, uh, that concludes debate in this matter. The clerk. Members, business. Notice number one. Joint Select Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, um, the clerk, um, in relation to the German. Yep. I beg your pardon. The parliamentary delegation from uh, report from parliamentary delegation to the UK, Spain, Germany, and the United States. I call on the member for Tangney. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I present the report of the Australian parliamentary delegation to the UK, Spain, Germany and the United States from 14 April to 3 May 2012. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this was a very uh, Deputy Speaker, this was a very uh, busy delegation. It uh, entailed 14 flights in 17 days and all that that means in terms of travel. It's uh, certainly uh, was uh, very busy and too much time, frankly, spent in aeroplanes. Um, however, it was very useful. I was the only member of the House of Representatives on this delegation. The other five, uh, led by Senator Bishop, were obviously of the other house. The um, trip started in the UK, where we went to uh, Plymouth, the naval base uh, and uh, spoke with Babcock Marine about submarine sustainment and methodologies that they use in terms of maintaining the British nuclear submarine fleet and the fact that the, they, as sustainers, are these days integrally involved in the de design aspects of the submarine to ensure that uh, you have the relevant design technology so that maintenance is made a lot easier. Following that, we went to Spain. The first place we went to was Ferrol, and I've got to say that I was surprised. You hear about sunny Spain, and it was pouring rain the whole time we were there. Uh, we went to Navantia and uh, saw the, um, our two LHDs being made, and following that, we went to Madrid. We uh, spoke to the uh, Ministry of Defence, uh, also went to Navantia head office, and then went to Airbus Military to speak about both the uh, refuelling tanker that, tankers that we're introducing to the uh, Royal Australian Air Force and also their bid for the light tactical transport. Uh, following that, we went to Cartagena, which is in the south, and uh, it was very sunny and pleasant there. 
and we spoke to Navantia again about submarines. Now, what is very clear is that there is no submarine in existence, conventional submarine, that will actually do what we require in an unmodified form. Uh, the simple fact is the European submarines, which we'd be potentially looking at, are all too small. We then went to Kiel. Uh, in Germany and spoke to HDW about submarines again and once again made clear that you know the submarines are small. I'm going to have to go through this fast now. We went to, following this we went to the USA, started off at Washington DC. We had uh, 10 meetings including Frank Kendall, the Acting Under Secretary for Defence Acquisition, uh, expert referen Export Reference Roundtable, uh, Government, uh, Government Accountability Office, Dr. Mike Gilmore, the Director of Operational Test and Evaluation, two House of Reps members, uh, the JSF Program Office. Now, I have to say that what, is, what was very interesting at uh, these meetings, there were 10 in all, I haven't uh, outlined all of them, but both with uh, uh, Under Secretary uh, Frank Kendall and the JSF Program Office, an issue that was highlighted that they pushed very strongly and unfortunately isn't reflected in the report was their concern about losing foreign customers to the joint strike fighter given that the program is very loaded up in the early sections uh, in the early years with foreign customers and obviously if they fall over it has very significant implications for the program generally and this is something that I think that the Australian government needs to be very cognizant of. Following this, we went to Boston, we went to Raytheon, had a look at uh, integrated air defence systems and uh, particularly Patriot and NASAMs. Following this, we went to Fort Worth for a day of classified briefings on the Joint Strike Fighter program and also saw their facility there where they built uh, thousands of B-24 Liberator bombers in World War II. Following that, we went to San Diego and we spoke with General Atomics about uh, Predator and U, uh, Reaper uh, un unmanned aerial vehicles. And following this, we went to Palmdale and spoke to Northrop Grumman about the Joint Strike Fighter and also the uh, Broad Area Maritime Surveillance Capability, better known as Global Hawk. And I will leave it there. It was a very useful delegation. Thank the member for his contribution. Uh, that concludes that matter. The clerk. Business notice number one, proposed joint select committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The member for Dawson. Mr Speaker, I move the motion relating to a joint select committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme in terms of which it appears in the, white, in the notice paper to be discussed. Uh, is there a seconder? The, the member for Hughes. Uh, the member for Dawson. Mr Speaker, my mother would turn blue when she had her fits. I grew up in a family where disabilities were a lived experience every single day. My father lost a leg to cancer when he was 19, before I was even a twinkle in his eye. And my mother was an epileptic who also had cerebral palsy. And while, as a child of parents with disabilities, you got to understand the difficulties that people with disabilities have to put up with on a daily basis. Nothing, nothing was more shocking than watching your mother turn blue when she was having an epileptic fit. And she would alarm us by crossing her arms or folding her arms and asking for my father's help before she went into one of her epileptic fits. But you know, uh, my dad, he was out making a living driving taxis so he could uh, have food on the table. So he couldn't be there all of the time and certainly wasn't there a lot of the time when she had her fits and was calling for help. And even then, as an eight-year-old kid, I knew that when mum did that, you had to take her on the floor, put her on the floor in case she fell off a chair that she was sitting on or fell over. But then her eyes would, would roll back into her head and sometimes she would stop breathing and her face would turn blue. And I would, I would literally smack her on the face because as an eight-year-old it was the only thing I could think to snap her out of it. You know, and I, I never knew 
whether that would be the last memory of my mother and to think of that as an eight-year-old kid. And all because the support services for people in her situation were non-existent. So I know too well why a national disability insurance scheme is needed in this country, and certainly I'm very proud that the government and the Liberal National Coalition strongly supports the National Disability Insurance Scheme. But Mr Speaker, forgive me for this one negative shot, but I know why I also bristle every time I hear disabilities and indeed the NDIS proposal being politicised. And when I do hear the Prime Minister say that the NDIS is a quote, great labour reform, unquote, as if the Liberal National Coalition is somehow against it, well, to me, that's politicising disabilities. And as someone who had to revive their epileptic mother from unconsciousness several times, it's quite frankly disgusting. National Disability Services, the peak body for non-government disability services, gives an apt description of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. They say it will be an entitlement-based funding mechanism which will provide flexible, person-centred supports so that people can, carry, can participate in ordinary daily life. It will provide people with a disability, their families and their carers, with the ongoing care, support therapy and equipment they need. Most importantly, it will be individualised and person-centred, with support based on the personal choices of either the person with a disability, their family or their carers. And this is the fundamentally great thing about the NDIS empowerment. It lets individuals and families decide what services will best fit them rather than have some bureaucrat in the state capital work it out on a desktop model. It opens up competition and opportunity in the disability services sector, which is good for both the person with disabilities, as they will have affordable choices for service provision, but also for disability service providers, as they will have greater certainty in terms of long-term service demand. In my electorate of Dawson, we have many quality organisations working in the field of disability support. Organisations such as Kutharinga and Getty, Mackay Lifestyle Choices, MADEC, CQ Community and In-Home Care, Bowen FlexiCare, the Burdekin Flexible Support Services, Bowen Community Associa the Burdekin Community Association, Lifestream Mackay, Blue Care and the Endeavour Foundation. These local organisations provide quality care services and make life easier for their clients. People with disabilities and the families and carers of those with disabilities. They are great local service providers in my electorate, but I know they could provide so much more for their clients if there was a better, more streamlined funding system that their clients had access to. But the benefits of the NDIS go beyond just people with disabilities and disability service providers. It actually benefits the entire nation. As the leader of the Liberal National Coalition and opposition leader has said, one of the great things about the National Disability Insurance Scheme is that it will give people with disabilities and their carers more opportunity to be productive and more opportunity to participate in our economy. The opposition leader went on to say words that aptly express my feelings about the NDIS, and I quote, that's why it's not just a cost, he said. Over time, it's an investment in a better society and in a stronger economy. The NDIS isn't about handouts. It's not about charity. It's about an investment in our future. National Disability Services says that timely interventions, appropriate aids and equipment, training and development would become investment in individual capacity rather than welfare. The scheme would therefore lead to more positive results for people with, dis with a disability, their families and carers, as well as being fiscally responsible. It is for these reasons that the Liberal National Coalition believes that the National Disability Insurance Scheme is an idea whose time has come. Earlier this year, the opposition leader, on behalf of the entire Liberal National Coalition, released a statement which deserves putting on the parliamentary record. He said, right now, the treatment given to people with disabilities depends upon how the disability was incurred and which state it happened in. Most rely on state government funded disability services where demand always outstrips supply. It's wrong that people's treatment should depend upon the litigation lottery or more upon what the system can afford other than upon people's needs. The National Disability Insurance Scheme should be a new project that unites Australians. It has to be done responsibly, but it does have to be done. The Coalition will do what we reasonably can to make the NDIS happen, 
and would accept a government invitation to be jointly responsible for this vital national project. On 13 April this year, the opposition leader sent a letter here to the Prime Minister putting forward the concept of creating a parliamentary NDIS committee that would ensure policy stability for the proposal until its full implementation. There was no written response but merely a brush off that was put in the media. On 27 April, the opposition leader repeated the offer to the Prime Minister, but this offer was formally rejected. As we know, the implementation of the NDIS as proposed by the Productivity Commission will take seven years, spanning the life of three parliaments and quite possibly different governments. That offer by the opposition leader was sadly rejected. So now a new offer lies on the table for the government and for this parliament in the form of my motion. Upon passage of the motion in this place and in a concurrent motion in the other place, this parliament would resolve to immediately establish a joint select committee on national disability insurance scheme, which would oversee the implementation of that scheme. It will be subject to terms of references to be agreed upon by the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader and ratified by this House. Uh, it would be chaired, jointly chaired by a government member and an opposition member, and most importantly remain in existence until the full implementation of the NDIS is achieved. This joint committee today that I propose is the only vehicle for true bipartisanship uh, on this issue. National Disability Services Chief Executive Ken Baker has issued a statement this morning in light of this motion being brought before the parliament today. I want to read a section of this statement. Dr Baker says, if you compare the progress towards building the NDIS to a race in the Paralympics, we are 20 metres into a 400 metre race. You don't get a gold for leading at the 20 metre mark. You have to keep your head down and keep working. When it comes to the NDIS, we need all parliaments to keep working at building the scheme. I don't think anyone in the disability community thinks that we have won the NDIS. We know that neither political party has outlined how they will fully fund the scheme. We also know that the discussions around the funding will involve federal, state and territories parliaments. Parties at both levels of government should recognise that this is a long-term reform which requires support from both sides of politics. To deliver the NDIS in full, political opponents across successive parliaments, both federally and in the states, are going to be required to work together for the, comp for the greater good. The truth remains that before the NDIS is locked in, we will need both political parties to outline how they intend to fully fund the scheme. And this finally, Mr Speaker, we will also need both political parties to commit to true political collaboration on the design and rollout of the NDIS. Well, Dr Baker is right. We're at the 20 metre mark of a 400 metre race in the Paralympics, and after the next election or the one after that, this could very well be a relay race where the baton needs to be passed to the, a different player. On National Disability Services campaign posters for the NDIS, they've run the line, it's time to make every Australian count. And indeed, that has been the campaign slogan for the NDIS movement. Well, right now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's time for this parliament to count when it comes to the NDIS. Let's put aside petty politics, join together on the NDIS and make this work for the betterment of our nation. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Blair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. There are many unsung heroes who live with disability who care for those with disability or provide services for those with disability in my election to Blair. Organisations such as Irazi, Cody, Alara, Focal Extended, just to name a few. To pity the member for Dawson didn't mention the fact that the Campbell Newman government is taking away funding from these organisations and also, also stripping away and sacking public servants in my electorate who provide services for people with disability. That wasn't mentioned in relation by the, by the smooth soliloquy of the member for, member for Dawson. When it comes to the LNP and the coalition, look at what they did, not what they the say now. Because under the coalition, when it came to the last 12 years of the Howard government, when it came to funding, the funding for disability services in those circumstances grew by 1.8 per cent less than inflation. So where were the coalition members during the Howard coalition government on this issue? Where were they? The reality is that they wouldn't commit to a national disability insurance scheme, and they won't even commit to that now. So the member for Dawson can come in here with his motion, but we've seen that the uh, you've seen the shadow treasurers describing the, million, the billion dollars that we put on the table in this budget as a cruel hoax when we put it on for national disability insurance scheme. And we've seen the Leader of the Opposition say it's an aspiration. 
We've seen Campbell Newman before the last election in Queensland, in Queensland, where the, where the member for Dawson comes from, committing himself. We had the, the shadow member, shadow disability services minister, Tracy Davis, committing herself hand on heart. We see LNP websites talking all about this. But what have they done when they came here? When they came into government, when they came into government, they couldn't even come up with $20 million, $20 million for a launch site. A one-and-a-half-page letter, not a detailed proposal from the other states and territories, a one-and-a-half-page letter, $20 million over four years, $62.50 for every person with a disability in Queensland. That, and they couldn't even come up with that dollars for a launch site. In their submission, they didn't even mention Gympie, but in the press conference he mentions Gympie. My area of Ipswich and the South East Queensland area deserves a national disability launch site. We'll have 20,000 Australians in the next couple of years covered by a national disability insurance scheme. We've seen LNP governments, coalition governments in Victoria and in New South Wales. We've seen Labor governments in the ACT, Tasmania and Victoria come to the party on this. Come to the party. But where are the LNP members in Queensland putting pressure on Campbell Newman? Where are the LNP members on the back bench there putting pressure on the shadow treasurer and the opposition leader. They've had more positions on this, on this area than you can find in the karma sutra of the coalition on this particular issue. They've had positions everywhere, but they can't put a dollar on the table. This is a great initiative devised, implemented by Labor government. Those opposite can talk the talk, but they've never walked the walk on this issue. Not a word from the member for Dawson in relation to Campbell Newman and the cutbacks for disability in Queensland. Not a word. Organisations like Erasi have their Dawson. funding slashed in my electorate by the Campbell Newman government. And they provide disability services. So don't come in here, don't come into this place and with this, these sort of motions and tell us you're in favour of national disability insurance scheme. When your comrades and colleagues back in Queensland are gutting disability services back in Queensland, and you're saying nothing about it, you're saying nothing about it in Queensland. That's the reality. So don't come in here with those sort of words and say that. We've seen 80,000 Queenslanders, 80,000 Queenslanders miss out, miss out. The coalition's policy in this place is to delay, and this is a recipe for delay. This motion. Look, we've already got, we've already got, treasurers and disability ministers in LNP states and Labor states at the COAG Select Committee. There's already there, but I don't know what the member for Dawson thinks. Governments pass, pass budget bills. They pass bills in relation to this. They implement policies. Committees do not. And this is a recipe for delay. From paragraph four onwards, it's a recipe for delay. It's a political strategy. And don't ha don't come into this place and say it's not a political strategy from the LNP. It is. It very well is. That's exactly what it is. Now, Queensland, Queensland pays per capita, and both sides of politics are at fault in this, $5,830 per capita. Victoria, Victoria $8,378 per capita. So the member for Dawson should get on to his LNP mates and Campbell Newman and Tracy Davis and increase the funding for disability services in Queensland. That's what he should be doing, increasing the funding. Don't come in here and sell us that somehow we, we should be following their dictates. They've got form in relation to this. Now, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is an idea whose time has come because it will give people with disability greater control and greater control in their decision making and, their, and what they decide to do. It will help people develop their skill, talent and ability. It will, mean, it will mean that people with disability, if they could fulfil their potential, and this is what, this is what the Productivity Commission reports, we could, get, we could see an added to our GDP of about $32.5 billion by 2050. If we could get everyone to realise their potential, get those jobs that they want, build their pride and self-esteem and in, get involved with the workplace. That's what it is. Greater financial security, greater opportunity and greater development, economic development. But sadly, sadly, those opposite want to delay a national disability insurance scheme by a year. A year. That's their policy. That's their policy, delay it by a year. We've brought it forward, the productivity recommendations, a year by putting a billion dollars on the table in this budget. We've done that. We showed we're serious about disability reform. That's what we've done. We've shown we are. We haven't turned our back on people with disability like the LNP government in Queensland have. 
nor the Howard government did for only 12 years when it came to that sort of funding. We haven't ignored the thousands of people who are crying out for it. People like Peter and Linda Tully in my area, who had strong evidence. Peter Tully said when he saw what Campbell Newman was doing to Queensland, he wanted to scream. He wanted to scream. He wanted to scream. We had people, we had Senator Jan McLucas in a forum at Ipswich Special School just a couple of weeks ago. Fran Vickery was there, a great advocate for disability reform in Queensland. She was there. We had dozens and dozens of people. Dozens. Did we have anyone there saying that the cutbacks that Campbell Newman's making and the coalition's policy in relation to this was right? No one. We had disability advocates from all over Ipswich. But everyone was critical of the coalition and the coalition government in Queensland on this issue because they have had no consistency on this issue. They will not back us on this issue. They will not back us. Even now, this motion is just a typical example of delay. Inaction, inertia, idleness. That's all the coalitions had on disability reform for such a long period of time, turning their backs on Queenslanders as well. They say they want it, but they don't show. If they wanted it, where would the money come from? What would you do? Instead, Campbell Newman comes up with the idea we should have some sort of Medicare levy. But this is a bloke. This is a bloke, and he's a friend of the LNP member for Dawson. This is a bloke that voted against, including the, all the LNP members in Queensland, the flood recovery money that we raised to a flood levy to re rebuild Queensland after the cyclones and the floods in South East Queensland across the whole of the state. Campbell Newman wants us to raise taxes, and this bloke is silent on the issue as well. Campbell Newman wants us to raise taxes for a national disability insurance scheme with a levy. But he wouldn't support a flood levy to actually rebuild Queensland. And all the LNP members from Queensland on this issue of the cutbacks to disability services in Queensland are silent. They've gone to dust and they've gone into hiding. And I guarantee anyone that comes in here won't praise Campbell Newman and what they've done in Queensland. I guarantee no one will get up there and say how wonderful they are. I guarantee that's the case. That's the reality of the, what they've done. They're brutal and heartless and callous what they've done in relation to disability funding in my home state. That's, that's the reality of the LNP hierarchy and government in Queensland. It's a breach of faith. And they come in here, they come in here and talk to us about, about having one policy before an election and having one policy after. They hand on heart said that they would support a national disability insurance scheme and they've broken it. They've broken their faith. Go back to Campbell Newman, member for Dawson, I say, Deputy Speaker, and tell him what to do. Tell him that Queenslanders want it done. Queenslanders want it done to make sure that we do it. It's wrong priorities. Ed Miliband, the opposition leader in, in uh, the UK, in a speech, one of the best speeches I've heard for a long time in relation to the budget and reply, described, said this, oh, said this of the UK Conservative government. Wrong choices, wrong priorities wrong values, out of touch, same old Tories. It's the same thing. Wrong choices, wrong priorities, wrong values, out of touch, same old coalition. That's their record. That's what they have done in the past. They won't do it in the future. They won't come to the party on national disability insurance scheme. And once again, by this very motion, they show they want to delay to a policy which will make a difference in the lives, not just of Queenslanders, but 400,000 Australians and their carers and their families. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The second of the motion, the member for Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support this motion by my good friend, the member for Dawson, and I congratulate on him for it, for I know it's an issue dear to his heart. However, before I start, I must comment that it is most disappointing to hear that contribution by the member for Blair. Yeah. We want this issue to be bipartisanship with every member of this House working forwards to delivering a national disability insurance scheme. That contribution shows exactly why we should support this motion. Now, I'd first like to go through this motion, Mr Deputy Speaker. It recognises that the proposal for the NDS is a once-in-a-lifetime generation landmark reform that has the potential to deliver better quality life outcomes for Australians with disabilities. It also recognises that the scheduled implementation for the NDIS, as proposed by the Productivity Commission, will actually take seven years to deliver and overspanning the life of three parliaments. And it recognises that the NDS is a reform that will involve the cooperation of the states and the territory governments and the disability support sector and for people with disabilities and their families. 
And it notes, unlike we saw the member for Blair's recent comments, that this has bipartisan and cross-party support for its implementation and delivery. And it also declares that the support for the policy of the stability of the NDS is most important. For over the lives of these three parliaments, the full scheme's implementation over these seven years, we need stability. We need to have bipartisanship going through for those next three parliaments for those next seven years. Therefore, this motion resolves to immediately establish a joint select committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which will a oversee the implementation of the NDIS, b be subject to the terms of reference to be agreed upon by the Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader and ratified by the entire House, c compromise of four government members or senators, four opposition members or senators, one Greens member and one non-aligned member and d be jointly chaired by one government member and one opposition member and remain the most important point the last point remain in existence until the full implementation of the nds is achieved mr deputy speaker this is a motion well worth supporting but mr deputy speaker this motion is a test it's a test to see whether this government is truly concerned about a better deal for the disabled or whether it's just coming in here to play politics with the most vulnerable members of our society. Mm -hmm. Now, most importantly, it's the Productivity Commission's own timetable that said the implementation of the NDIS will occur over the life of three parliaments. So if we stand here, of members of this current parliament, and we are truly concerned with the welfare and the opportunities of the disabled, it is our duty to support this motion. For the importance of this motion is that should there be a change of government at the next election, the progress of the NDIS can continue smoothly. For what this motion actually does, it also commits the current opposition that should we form the next government after the next election, the delivery of the NDS will remain a bipartisan issue. Further, should the current opposition form the government after the next election, this motion commits that government to maintaining a bipartisan committee containing four coalition members, four Labor members, one Greens member and one, one non-aligned member. So this motion will ensure that all parties are honest about the delivery of the NDIS for those with significant disabilities. Now, just to start with, Mr Deputy Speaker, I hate to say this, but the Productivity Commission actually called for $3.9 billion to be allocated on the trials over the forward estimates. Yet, while the government talks this up, they've only delivered $1 billion. So from day one, this parliament is shortchanging our disabled by 75 per cent. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are three major issues that the committee, this bipartisan committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme needs to consider. Firstly, what services are needed to be provided and to whom they will be provided to? Secondly, how those services will be delivered. Because getting that framework, although it's very important, it's only one thing. And we need to be very careful that the NDIS is not captured by bureaucracies and the actual funding that we're putting forward goes to the resources to provide for those most needed. Yeah, yeah. And thirdly, and most importantly, the question of how we actually fund the NDIS. If we can have all the goodwill in the world, we can tour the countryside talking up the NDIS. We can take the applause from the disabled groups. We can design the most efficient and effective scheme to provide those services. But unless we determine how the NDIS can be paid for on a sustainable basis, unless we can clearly state how that extra $7 billion will be funded, the NDIS will remain nothing but a mirage, a cruel hoax upon the disabled. And that's why it's important, Mr Deputy Speaker, why it's important that government members support this motion so we show the disabled, we send them the message that this is truly bipartisan. Now, the method of funding the NDIS, it must be sustainable. It can't be funded on deficit spending. Without criticising this government, we've had the four largest budget deficits in our nation's history. We've gone from a $20 billion surplus, net zero debt, 
and $60 billion in the future fund. But at the end of the last financial year, we've borrowed $120 million every day, and now our level of national debt is north than $140 billion. And because of that debt that we've accumulated next year, before we find one cent for the disabled, we in this parliament have to come up with close to $7 billion in interest payments that will mainly go to foreigners overseas, the equivalent of $300 for every man, woman and child, or $1,200 for a family of four. That is the interest payments that we have to come up with. And we have to come up with that $7 billion year after year after year forever until we start paying back that $140 million that we've borrowed. That is the reason why we cannot fund the NDS out of further deficit spending. The truth is there are only two ways that we can fund the NDIS. We must cut the waste. We must eliminate many of the indulgent feel-good schemes. And we must do it by making sure our economy is running on all cylinders and by lifting our productivity. And we cannot do that by introducing new taxes that raise the cost of doing business in Australia and making Australian industry uncompetitive. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this motion calls for a bipartisan committee. And I'd like to put my name forward as a member of that committee, for as they say, I have skin in the game. I know how desperately we need an NDIS because it affects me directly. For my son Trent was born 16 years ago with Down syndrome and autism. He has no speech. My wife and I will need to care for him our entire lives. This has made me appreciate how each individual has their real value and how that dignity, the dignity of every individual must be respected. But most importantly, it's awakened me to the fact that as a nation we need to do more, so much more for our children with disabilities and for their carers. It's made me personally aware of the unsung group of carers across Australia, what we may well call our neglected people. I personally understand that parents caring for a physically or intellectually disabled child it becomes a lifetime's task. I understand for most carers there are no days off, there is no sick pay, there is no holiday pay, there is no superannuation. And when carers grow old, they do so with the worry what will happen to their child when they are too old or too frail to nurse them. Many parents that I know have, have kids with severe disabilities or on medication for depression. Divorce rates are high. And studies show that single mums with kids with severe disabilities have the same stress levels as soldiers in combat. Mr Deputy Speaker, we are a wealthy and compassionate country. The time has come for us to find a way, a bipartisan way, without any of the old excuses, to provide a generous and practical response for the need for people with severe disabilities and their carers. Madam Deputy Speaker, to the members of the government, many who I know that genuinely want to see this NDIS delivered over the term of these three parliaments over these seven years, I call on you to show goodwill and to support this motion. Let's refocus on getting this done rather than scoring political points off each other. This also, by showing supporting this motion, it will be a great boost to our disabled people. It will show we really want to get this done. I hope, as members of the government, you'll support this motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Uh, call on the member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And Deputy Speaker, can I say um, that I'm very disappointed? Very disappointed, but perhaps uh, it's not surprising that we see the opposition, uh, the Liberal Party, and the Nationals here today trying to delay one of the greatest programs that will do the most that any other program has ever done for the disability sector, for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, after all, they spent 12 long years, 12 long years in government doing absolutely nothing and, in fact, um, having cuts, in fact, cutting from that sector without a single program. And now, Deputy Speaker, Labor is getting on with that job. We are getting on with the very important job to give people with disabilities the services that they need. Uh, they just, those opposite are continuing in the same ilk that they have continued with every other policy in this House, and that is to oppose, to say no and to be destructive. 
We here have a plan which will do magnificent things for people with disabilities. We know that they are that these programs are needed, and again they're trying their delaying tactics, saying one thing when they're out there in front of the cameras and doing something completely so, different when they the are here for in this parliament. The member for Hindmarsh will resume his seat. The member for Dawson. Of order to relevance, there's nothing in the motion about delaying the NDIS, so I ask the member refer to the motion in front of us. Uh, the member for Dawson will resume his seat. The member for Hindmarsh. When uh, you ask for an inquiry or a committee, to me that is delaying. That is stopping the process, doing something else instead of getting on with that program. Um, so, Deputy Speaker, um, what I want to say is that Labor is now getting on with the job, giving people with disabilities the services that they need, and not just saying no like the opposition has been doing. Uh, Deputy Speaker, support for disability is a human right. It's not a privilege. It's not something that, we, uh, that governments bestow um, you know, on the whimsy wheel of governments or political parties. It's an entitlement for all Australians. Deputy Speaker, but for, as I said, 12 long years, the Howard government, Australians with disability, disabilities were bitterly disappointed again and again. Uh, while the Liberal Party was in government, funding for disabilities actually went backward. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 we say what, the way it is, uh, and I'll say it again. Whilst the Liberal Party was in government, funding for disabilities actually went backwards. But uh, they actually took support away from people already, already struggling to get a fair go. And as I said, this is not a privilege. Uh, this support is, is for the most vulnerable people in our communities. Deputy Speaker, uh, I can't count the amount of times people uh, have come into my office and, in fact, um, I take it your office and other members of parliament seeking assistance and getting assistance, uh, something as basic as a wheelchair. And of course we know that getting access to essential services is too often a difficult thing for people uh, with uh, disabilities. We see it every day. And that's why we on this side of the chamber, on this side of the chamber, are getting on with the job and we're working towards a future where all Australian children and adults with disabilities uh, lead lives uh, of dignity and opportunity. Uh, we're delivering, Deputy Speaker, the first stage of a national disability insurance scheme. Uh, and if those opposite don't want to help, they should get right out of the way. Uh, and uh, the time for playing politics with the lives of Australian people living with disabilities is over. We've seen them play politics with lots of other issues that other governments of all persuasions wouldn't touch to play political games, and yet here we see them uh, going on to another sector now trying to play politics with something extremely important, something that should have been done many, many years ago, and now they're try trying their delaying tactics. Uh, it's now one year, Deputy Speaker, since the government released the Productivity Commission's report into disability care and support. The Productivity Commission's the uh, recommend, uh, Commission recommended that an NDIS be established to end that cruel lottery of disability care. Uh, right now in Australia, the type and level of support you get depends on how you got your disability. Uh, and that is wrong. Uh, your access to service shouldn't depend on whether you were born with a disability or whether you acquired it. And, Deputy Speaker, each of us here is only touch wood and, God forbid, uh, one accident away uh, 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 for uh, injury, one accident or injury away from needing the NDIS, whether it be a work, a work accident, whether it be a car accident, whether it be a sporting accident. It can happen to absolutely anyone, and we on this side of the room know that. Deputy Speaker, um, it doesn't matter whether you live in, in the regions, in the country, in rural areas, if you're a city dweller in the inner, inner cities like my electorate, or whether you're in the outer suburbs, uh, it doesn't matter what your background is. We know that uh, all of us are only one accident or injury away from needing an NDIS. Deputy Speaker, we've known that for too long. Where, where you live, not what you need, has been the determining factor for what help you get. And, uh, whether we're talking about education or health care or disability support, that's something that I believe deeply in, Deputy Speaker, and we do on this side. Uh, and we know that your postcode should not, determine, should not determine your chance of success in life. So while the uh, opposition dithers and delays, we're getting on with all sorts of reform. The NDIS, education, 
health care that we will give all Australians a fair go, uh, and it's uh, what our country is all about. Deputy Speaker, the Australian government is moving fast to make things happen. Just one year after the Productivity Commission's uh, report was released, we are launching the NDIS. Uh, this is a life-changing reform for thousands of Australians with disabilities, their families, uh, their carers. Uh, when the NDIS starts, people with disability will get much more choice over the standard uh, and the quality of care uh, that they can receive. Deputy Speaker, Premier Jay Weatherall in South Australia has been a huge supporter uh, of the NDIS. Uh, unlike many of the, his Liberal state premiers, he knew that this is a hugely important reform to people in his state. And, uh, I was very uh, pleased to see him jump on board as the first Premier to support uh, uh, the NDIS, unlike uh, uh, others in Queensland and New South Wales and uh, uh, other places in Victoria where they dilly-dallied again with this very, very important issue. Um, so when the chance for an NDIS trial in South Australia uh, appeared, he grabbed it with both hands and also put in $20 million for a small state on the table as well. Uh, and as I said, unlike the uh, uh, Queensland uh, government, uh, the Victorian government, New South Wales government, who dilly-dallied with this very, very important uh, reform. So, uh, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank him for his leadership and his insight, unlike his Liberal counterparts uh, who have fought the NDIS all the way. Uh, he knows that this is real and it's an urgent issue that we should deal with. Um, and uh, also, Deputy Speaker, he is a former disability minister, um, and uh, I know that he was absolutely committed to the disability sector and did a uh, very good job when he was Minister for Disabilities in South Australia. Deputy Speaker, in my electorate of Hindmarsh, uh, disability services is a huge itch issue. Um, that's partly because of the demographic. Uh, one in four people in Hindmarsh are over the age of 65, and as I've said, it makes it one of the oldest seats in the country. I always like to say it's one of the wisest seats in the country, because with age comes wisdom. But, Deputy Speaker, recently many of you would have seen the article in The Australian, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, an article by Bernard Salt, um, who recently wrote uh, uh, this article pinpointing, actually pinpointing the demographics and the areas uh, um, in Australia with the highest uh, concentration and rates of people with disabilities. Uh, two suburbs in my electorate made it onto that top list. Uh, one was Morfordville, where 16 per cent of all residents in Morfordville have a disability, and the other was North Plimpton uh, in my electorate, uh, where 15 per cent of people have a disability. Deputy Speaker, the NDIS trial in South Australia will help approximately 4,000 600 people starting next year, that's starting next year immediately, uh, to access better services and to improve their lives. Uh, in mid-2013, the trial will launch um, for children aged between uh, uh, birth and five years, and from 2014, the age limit will extend to 14 years. Uh, these are real reforms taking place next year and beyond, and we can't afford to risk delays through this particular motion that the member has put opposite. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Deputy Speaker, I was at Kilparan School in my electorate. Um, it's a school for children with vision impairment and uh, also uh, a, a severe disabilities. And we met some of those children who will be among the first, the first in the country, uh, to get that individual support that they uh, require um, so desperately Order. through the uh, National Disability the Insurance members. Scheme. Time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Sorry, I um, call the member for Parks. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There has been a change in the list. I apologise. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to support this motion from the member for Dawson. I've got to say from the outset, I'm a little disappointed uh, from my colleagues on the other side of the chamber. They uh, seem to have misread uh, the intention of this motion. and. Uh, uh, the member for Dawson uh, and the member for Hughes, who moved and seconded this motion, uh, have done so uh, not only for the best of reasons, but with people who have a, uh, a deep and um, understanding of, of this particular issue. And it's uh, particularly disappointing. Uh, uh, the member for uh, Blair's contribution was, was uh, one of the most appalling uh, 
contributions I've seen in this place, and, uh, and the member for Hindmarsh, much of what he said I agreed with, but uh, uh, why he's uh, coming from, uh, from the particular angle he does on the political side uh, I find very disappointing. Um, just, just a point of clarification, Madam Deputy Speaker. The reasons that uh, some of the premiers uh, have concerns uh, and, and didn't rush into agreement. Uh, it wasn't the National Disability Insurance Scheme that was, at, uh, uh, that was the issue. It was a trial that was being proposed, uh, a trial that uh, uh, has uh, no guarantee of a flow through uh, to, to be the scheme, uh, and a trial um, that, that was being asked to, uh, to, to be funded by, uh, by the, the state premiers. And, uh, they had every reason to to show some concern with what was being proposed. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is not something that's filling up a news cycle. This is a, a, a scheme that's going to take three political terms to, to implement. Uh, you sp speak to the people from the Disability Australia and they'll say they know that there's not a quick, quick fix to this. This is something that will take three terms and there's no need uh, to, for political speeches at this stage. Uh, because this is a long term uh, and, and it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, a big reform and it will require a lot of effort. Um, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is, is significant and necessary reform. It has the potential to transform people's lives and we, the parliament, have the opportunity to be a part of this. Meeting the needs of Australians with disabilities should be core government business. Only bipartisanship will ensure the NDIS proceeds smoothly. This has to survive three parliamentary cycles, as I said before, uh, at least to reach full implementation. As a society, we should be able to properly support people with a disability and their carers. Many people with disabilities face significant challenges in fully participating in work, family and community, and are some of the most vulnerable in our society. There, sh there should be adequate support uh, for both people with disability and their carers. And I might add, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in a rural electorate such as mine, uh, many of these issues when you have a disability, whether it's one that uh, you were born with or one that you acquired, uh, becomes much more dramatic because of the distances involved, but also the core critical mass of people that may have a similar disability when it comes to forming group homes uh, and, uh, and specific care, because quite often people with a disability will be the only person in that particular community with that level of disability, and it's very difficult to provide services. Unfortunately, the current support for Australians with a disability is a frayed patchwork characterised by piecemeal programs, inconsistent eligibility criteria and a lack of coordination. This is why, I, uh, why the NDIS is imperative. I 100 per cent support the introduction of a national disability insurance scheme. Uh, this is important for all Australians. The National Disability Insurance Scheme will provide insurance to cover for all Australians in the event of significant disability and will revolutionise the way people with a disability, their families and their carers are supported in this country. The proposed NDIS aims to give everyone with a serious disability comparable treatment and assistance that currently, that, uh, uh, to that currently available for people injured at work or on the roads. And, uh, and there's the old saying, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, if someone has a, uh, a serious accident uh, on the weekend, uh, uh, you should really try and get them into a car and hit a tree because if they have a car accident, there is a whole uh, different range of, uh, of financial uh, uh, help available. And there's this two uh, 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 or multi pronged approach to the way we handle people with disabilities uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, an NDIS is expensive, but the cost is merely a function of the unmet need of people with a disability. The Productivity Commission quantified this unmet need as being around $6.5 billion per annum. That is what would be required to eliminate the waiting Order. list. The member's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Shortland. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I suspect there's nobody in this parliament that has had a, a strong work experience as I have working with people with disability, because before entering into politics for many, many years, I worked with people with disabilities. And I know, I know they don't want another committee set up. They don't want to have the process slowed down either further. They want some action. They want some results. The NDIS is a groundbreaking scheme 
that has been welcomed by people with disabilities, parents, carers, advocacy groups and the community as a whole. It's a tragedy that the needs of people with disability have been ignored for so long and it has taken the Rudd-Gillard government to finally recognise that people with disabilities have a right to be treated with dignity and to be provided with opportunity rather than to be not denied not only opportunity but in many cases basic human rights. But that is about to change with the implementation of the NDIS, something that needs to happen now, something that doesn't need to be delayed as this motion seeks to do. And this government is determined to deliver to people with disabilities. The Productivity Commission recommended that the NDIS be established and that key components of the scheme be an entitlement to services and a choice about who should deliver those services and the type of services that are required and entitlement. And that replaces an ad hoc system that's based on chance. If you are lucky enough to get a quality service, or you you, you can rejoice. If you're not, you get nothing. This is not good enough and this cannot be allowed to continue. This cannot be delayed, the implementation of the NDIS. And the member for Dawson should be ashamed of himself trying to slow down, slow down the progress of the NDIS. This is why it is imperative that the NDIS proceeds as soon as possible. That is why the NDS trials are important and must proceed. People with disability cannot and should not wait any longer. Under the Liberal Party, uh, when they were in power, the, Liberal, uh, the people with disabilities waited for 12 long years. In the past, under, under Labor governments, there were no action, but now, now, the Rudd and Gillard government have recognised that uh, people with disabilities have rights, they can't be ignored, and I see this as a question of commitment. Uh, the motion seeks, I believe, to delay the NDIS, and uh, the shadow treasurer at the press club was not even prepared to commit to pay for the implementation. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm particularly excited um, about the pilots that have been undertaken. Um, one of those pilots is in the Hunter, in an area that I worked for many, many years in the area of disability. And I know the challenges that are faced by people with disabilities. And this is fantastic news for those people, their families, their carers, for people like Tracy who comes and volunteers in my office, for people like Crystal that comes and volunteer in my office. I spoke about them the other night. The NDIS will provide people with disability, their families and carers in the hunt of the support and care they need, something that they've had to struggle for in the past. I'm really excited and pleased about the, the pilot taking place in the hunter, and I know in the hunter that we will, we will do a really good job. Now, the NDIS launch in the Hunter will cover about 10,000 people with significant and permanent disabilities every year. That's 10,000 people's lives who will be changed. Under the NDIS, these people will, for the first time, be assessed to receive individualised care and support packages, have the power to make decisions about their care and support, and uh, they will be assisted by local coordinators to help manage and deliver their support, access a system that will be easy to navigate and that will deliver them to mainstream services. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is groundbreaking legislation. We cannot, we cannot allow it to be delayed and politicised by uh, a joint select committee. People with disability deserve to be treated the same way as everybody else, and the NDIS Order. is a step in the right the direction. The member's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Longman. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And what a stark contrast we've seen in the chamber today. Madam Deputy Speaker, improving disability policy was one of my primary motivations in going into politics. After growing up alongside a close mate of mine who suffers from spinal muscular atrophy, I have witnessed firsthand the many obstacles and obstructions of an overly bureaucratic 
disability system that all too often fails to recognise need. As Australians, we like to believe that we are an easygoing, accepting and all-inclusive. But in reality, many in our midst who suffer from congenital or acquired conditions are not fully included in our society. They are offered only minimal assistance, and our system all too often simply does not make allowance for those who require additional or specific help. Friends and families are the safety net for people with disabilities. They are the carers, the sponsors and the security. But in a country such as ours, which self sets itself up as a world leader in many areas, it is our responsibility also to lead others in areas of social conscience. This is what the National Disability Insurance Scheme is all about, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is about ensuring that every Australian has the best possible opportunities for the future, regardless of the obstacles they face. It is about ensuring that everyone with a disability will have the support they need. Madam Deputy Speaker, it would seem that members on both sides of this place agree that the National Disability Insurance Scheme is not only an important concept, but an essential tool for the future of our nation. With cross-party support on this issue, I have been absolutely astounded and deeply disappointed to watch as the NDIS has been made into a political football. Let me put my view bluntly. Over the past month, the Prime Minister and Labor have prioritised party politics over real action on disability reform. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be made more evident than the contribution by the member for Blair earlier today. It has been disappointing to see that in an effort to pass the buck, the Prime Minister has cast aside the Productivity Commission's blueprint for the NDIS in favour of a political blame game. The Productivity Commission's final report was very clear about how a national disability insurance scheme should be implemented and where the funding should come from. But regardless of this, we are now seeing a situation where the Prime Minister is trying to strong-arm state governments into holding up her federal government's responsibilities. In the recent negotiations with state governments, the Prime Minister failed to concede the important contribution that states have made this far in the provision of disability services. Instead of recognising this contribution and building on it, as the Productivity Commission advises, the Prime Minister is trying to force state governments into sponsoring the Labor government's funding shortfall. The Productivity Commission's final report strongly indicated that the government, the Australian government, should be the sole contributor to a national disability insurance scheme. Yet the, yet the Prime Minister has indicated that she would put only $1 billion towards it. That's a massive $2.9 billion short of what the Productivity Commission recommended. This is a shortfall in Commonwealth funds, not state government funds. When Labor and the Greens found $10 billion of taxpayers' money to hedge in a clean energy finance corporation, I question how this Labor government could not find an extra $2.9 billion that the Productivity Commission recommended the Commonwealth Fund. In Queensland, in the last financial year, the federal government's contribution to disability services was about $255 million. Compare that to $920 million contributed by the Queensland government. Madam Deputy Speaker, in my electorate alone, there are many examples of where the Prime Minister and the Labor government have wasted taxpayers' money. We need only to look as far as school halls and pink bats to know that the op those opposite have not valued taxpayers' money. I don't want to see this incredibly important policy miss out simply because those opposites couldn't rein in their addiction to wasteful spending on failed programs. As I stand in the parliament today, the federal Labor government has not committed to the Productivity Commission's target of a full NDIS by 2018-19 nor has it committed funds, provided plans or given information about what will happen when the haphazard trial finishes and the real NDIS is supposed to be implemented. What is important here, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the National Disability Insurance Scheme comes to fruition within the time frame outlined in the Productivity Commission's report. What this motion suggests, and I support, is that a joint select committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme is established to oversee the implementation of the full rollout. The time frame for the NDIS rollout spans the life cycle of several parliaments. The National Disability Insurance Scheme is more important than a quick political win, and it has the ability to change the future for thousands of Australians and change our direction as a nation. Nothing could be more important in this place. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Reid. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, Labor believes all Australians deserve care and support if they acquire or are born with a disability. We believe that no one should be left behind, 
Deputy Speaker, we believe that accident or disability shouldn't take away the chance for a decent life. And that's why Labor supports the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS. The NDIS. Deputy Speaker, this is good news for people with disability, their families and their carers in our community. The NDIS will give them the support and care they need when they need to help them lead good lives. And I'm proud to be part of a Labor government that is initiating this historic reform. Deputy Speaker, under the NDIS, these people for the first time will be assessed to receive individualised care and support packages. They'll have the power to make decisions about their care and support, including choosing their service provider. They'll be helped by local coordinators to manage and deliver their support. And they'll have access to a system that they can easily understand and that will connect them to other services. This will give people with disability more opportunities to get involved in work, school and community life. Deputy Speaker, the government is providing $1 billion over four years to start rolling out the first stage of the NDIS. State governments are also contributing a modest amount to the costs of the launch to make sure this reform becomes a reality. The coalition, Deputy Speaker, ignored people with a disability and their carers for 12 years and stood by while demand grew for disability services and disability pensioners struggled with the cost of living. Unfortunately, people with disabilities are not high on the Liberal national agenda. Some of their state counterparts had to be shamed into participating in the launches. Deputy Speaker, the former coalition government ignored the inadequacy of the disability support pension and sat on its hands while demand for disability services increased. Under the former coalition government, Federal contributions to disability funding grew at a mere 1.8 per cent a year, less than the rate of inflation. In other words, funding went backwards in real terms. Deputy Speaker, in the policy they took to the last election, the Federal Opposition proposed to assist just 6,000 children with disabilities and their families. But there are 164,000 students with special needs in Australian schools today. The Opposition leader had nothing to say to the other 158,000 students with disabilities. Under the previous coalition government, Deputy Speaker, people with disability had to wait up to a year to get help to prepare for work through disability employment services. And if they did, their access to their pension was reviewed. Deputy Speaker, this discouraged people with disability from benefiting from work and did nothing to support people with disability to work. The numbers of people on the disability support pension kept going up after the coalition's welfare to work changes, Deputy Speaker, which also failed to support the many disability pensioners keen to contribute more actively to their community. The first stage of the NDIS, Deputy Speaker, will benefit more than 20,000 people with disability as well as their families and carers. We will now work closely with the state and territory governments on the detailed planning to implement the scheme. Deputy Speaker, this will include active engagement with local communities. The scheme will involve major changes in the way that we work with people with disability, their families, carers and service providers. And we want to make sure we get this right so that we build a system that is sustainable over time. Deputy Speaker, we are building the NDIS in selected locations, first to ensure the implementation of the scheme is informed by feedback from people with disability, their families and carers, service providers and community organisations. Deputy Speaker, the lessons learned in launching the first stage will tell us when and how to proceed to a full scheme that is comprehensive, robust and responsive to the needs of people with disability in our country. Deputy Speaker, I commend the NDIS to this House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Riverina. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I commend the member for Dawson for calling for the establishment of a joint select committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. As a member of parliament who grew up in a household with disability pensioners as parents, the member for Dawson has formed a strong social justice conscience. He understands as well as anyone in this place how important it is to get the National Disability Insurance Scheme model right. He knows full well what this would mean to ensuring the NDIS proceeds with bipartisan support. There have been times recently when the NDIS has threatened to disintegrate 
into a political football. And we've seen that this morning. This must not be allowed to happen. Certainly, this motion should and must receive the full support of the lower house and be taken up as a way of concurrence motion in the Senate. It is too crucial not to be given wholehearted backing. The NDIS is a good proposal, a national scheme designed to provide insurance cover for all Australians in the event of significant disability. It comes at a cost, but as the first federal parliamentarian in New South Wales to sign up to the NDIS Every Australian Counts campaign, I see this as an investment in our future. Mm -hmm. If we choose to do nothing or delay indefinitely doing something, anything, we will lose a marvellous opportunity and ultimately will cost the nation more in the long run. I know an NDIS has the support of so many people in the Riverina. Wagga Wagga based Courage on Waratah, a marvellous organisation which has provided care, support, training and opportunities for people with an intellectual disability, development delay and their family carers for more than half a century, is right behind an NDIS. Councillor Anne Napoli of Griffith City Council enthusiastically supports an NDIS. Her artistically talented son Patrick, aged 36, has cerebral palsy. Chris and Carol Harmer of Wagga Wagga are a fantastic couple. They have three children, two of whom were born with an extremely rare condition called Phelan McDermott syndrome. Daughter Emily, 19, has never uttered a word, and 15-year-old son Tom is also affected, only more moderately. I spoke to Chris this morning, and he spoke of his high hopes for an NDIS. Narelle Hughes of Coringal and her daughter Sally Dawling, 24, are similarly supportive. Norella spent her life looking after Sally. A mother's love knows no bounds, but even unconditional love sometimes needs help. The NDIS provides a whole life plan and there are people out there in desperate situations and they need this help as soon as possible, Norella said. Another NDIS advocate from the Riverina is Tamora's Patricia Thomas of Tamora, whose son Richard, 47, is disabled. She has formed a special persons and carers group and is president of this tireless band of workers. The NDIS has the backing of both sides of politics. The government has, however, sought most recently to politicise the issue. This is unfortunate. The Liberal National Coalition supports the implementation of the NDIS despite the government's claims to the contrary. Politicising this issue is an affront to many Australians who know how tough it is for families which have a disabled member. The opposition leader wrote to the Prime Minister twice seeking Order. the establishment Order. of a joint it select committee on the NDIS. Noon, in accordance with Standing Order 34, the debate is interrupted. The debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made an order of the day for a later hour. The member will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. Does the honourable member for Dawson wish to move a motion to refer the matter to the Federation Chamber? Well, member for Dawson. Madam Deputy Speaker, I move that the order of the day be referred to the Federation Chamber for debate. I put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Message from the Senate. I have received a message from the Senate returning the Migration Legislation Amendment Regional Processing and Other Measures Bill 2012 without amendment. Chief Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I seek leave to move two motions relating to the operation of the Federation Chamber. Is leave granted? As there is no objection to leave being granted, leave is granted. Chief Government Whip. I thank the House. I move that the Crimes Legislation Amendment, Slavery, Slavery-like Conditions and People Trafficking Bill of 2012 be referred to the Federation Chamber for further consideration. I have a second motion, but you might want to put that one first. I put the question. Speaker. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chief Government Whip. I thank the House. I further move that the Federation Chamber order of the day number one, private members' business relating to marriage amendment bill of 2012, be returned to the House for further consideration. I put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The matter will be set down for consideration at a later hour this day. Member for Morton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, I seek leave to make a statement on the Customs Amendment Smuggled Tobacco Bill 2012 in discharge of the Committee's requirement to provide an advisory report on the bill and to present a copy of my statement. Is leave granted? As there is no objection to leave being granted, leave is granted. Member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. 
Uh, I rise to present this oral statement on behalf of the Committee in Discharge of the Social Policy and Legal Affairs uh, Committee's obligation to report on the Customs Amendment Smuggle Tobacco Bill 2012. On 28 June, the House Selection Committee, uh, in their wisdom, referred this bill to our committee. The Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee was referred the very same bill by the Senate for inquiry. The Senate Committee tabled its report on 14 August 2012. This committee commends the Senate Committee's inquiry into the bill and its report. This committee agrees with the Senate Committee's observation that smuggled tobacco undermines the government's un ongoing efforts to reduce the harm from smoking in Australia. The Senate Committee noted that submissions to its inquiry from both the tobacco industry and anti-smoking organisations were supportive of the bill and recommended that the bill be passed. Given that the Senate Committee has inquired into the bill in consultation with the public and interested stakeholders, this committee does not wish to duplicate their work and considers that there is little value to add by conducting another inquiry into the same bill. As expressed previously, the committee considers it an inefficient use of committee and Department of the House of Representatives resources to conduct concurrent inquiries into identical bills. Member for Page. Sorry, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was waiting. I thought there was someone before me. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's report entitled Report for 2012, Referrals Made 2012 Relating to the proposed integrated fit-out of new lease premises for the Australian Taxation Office at the site known as 913 Whitehorse Box Hill, Victoria, development and construction of housing for defence members and their families at Linfield, New South Wales, and development and construction of housing for defence members and their families at Western Creek ACT, I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is leave granted? As there is no objection to leave being granted, leave is granted. Member for Page. I thank the House. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the fourth report of 2012, addressing referrals made May 2012. This report deals with three inquiries, with a total estimated cost of $277 million. In each case, the committee recommends the House of Representatives agrees to the works proceeding. Madam Deputy Speaker, the first inquiry examined the Australian Taxation Office's proposal for the integrated fit-out of new lease premises at the site known as 913 Whitehorse Road, Box Hill, Victoria. The key objective of the project is to provide an office fit-out that meets at least a 4.5-star National Australian Built Environment Rating Scheme or Neighbours Rating and other Commonwealth lease requirements for the 1,292 ATO staff located in Box Hill. The office accommodation will be located in a proposed building that has been designed to meet a five-star Neighbours Energy Rating and a five-star Green Building Council of Australian Green Star Rating. The ATO has liaised with the developers of this proposed building to incorporate the agency's requirements into the building's design. The building will provide 19,100 square metres of office accommodation and high quality facilities for the ATO. It is close to the existing ATO Box Hill building, which cannot be upgraded to meet the agency's needs. This proposal allows the ATO to update its office accommodation while retaining a presence in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. And they were two of the questions that the committee inquired into when we had the public inquiry there. The committee is satisfied that the ATO office has fully considered all feasible options for the ongoing provision of office accommodation in Box Hill and that the selected option is a practical long-term solution that represents value for money for the Commonwealth. Madam Deputy Speaker, I move to speak to the second inquiry of this report. Defence Housing Australia seeks approval for the proposed development and construction of housing for defence members and their families at Linfield, New South Wales. 
The key objective of the project is to assist in reducing the proportion of defence families residing in private rental accommodation in Sydney to below the target of 15 per cent. The current proportion of families in private rental accommodation in Sydney is 35.9 per cent. Defence Housing Australia plans to develop road and civil infrastructure on a site of approximately 13.8 hectares adjacent to the Lane Cove National Park. Defence Housing Australia then intends to construct 345 dwellings for an integrated residential community for defence and other families with 173 houses for defence use. One of the key issues for this project was a single access road to the development site. The committee was concerned that this road could become obstructed during a bushfire, preventing evacuation from the site. And it is an area surrounded by a national park, but in suburban Sydney. However, the committee was assured by Defence Housing Australia that they are developing and building on the Linfield site within the relevant regulations. Evidence was also given to the committee that the site has been approved by the Rural Fire Service. Madam Deputy Speaker, the third inquiry in this report is another Defence Housing Australia project, the proposed development and construction of housing for defence members and their families at Western Creek ACT. Here, the member for Mallee was the acting chair for this inquiry, and I thank him for um, doing that. The key objective of the project is to maintain the proportion of defence families residing in private rental accommodation in the ACT under the target of 15 per cent. The current proportion of families in private rental accommodation in the ACT is actually 13 per cent. Defence Housing Australia plans to develop road and civil infrastructure for 73 single dwelling lots and three multi-unit sites on a site of approximately 8.3 hectares. Defence Housing Australia then intends to construct 50 dwellings for defence use. One of the key issues for this project was community consultation. The committee received correspondence from several um, stakeholders who raise concerns with Defence Housing Australia's consultation on this project. The committee has subsequently recommended that Defence Housing Australia engage in widespread and uh, active and ongoing consultation with all relevant stakeholders that are likely to be directly or indirectly impacted by any proposed development, irrespective of the stage of the town planning process. The committee suggests that Defence Housing Australia closely monitor feedback in current and future consultation processes and respond immediately to any concerns raised by local stakeholders. And we all know that you can't always satisfy everything that's raised by community members, but there has to be an immediate and engaged response to them. The committee notes that in other projects, Defence Housing Australia has demonstrated effective stakeholder consultation and encourages it to use the lessons learned from this project to develop clear and comprehensive consultation strategies for all future projects. Madam Deputy Speaker, in closing, I want to thank the members of the committee uh, for their very active participation and also um, my deputy, the honourable member for Mallee, and also um, the secretariat that services the Public Works Committee. And there's two of them sitting here, um, Anthony Overs and Fiona Gardner, but the whole committee for the very good work and service they provide to the committee and in turning these reports around in a timely fashion because we have a very busy program and it can be difficult to get through all that work. So I wanted to add those words at the end and I commend the report to the House. Thank you. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day Number 1, Maritime Powers Bill 2012, resumption of debate on the second reading. I understand that it is the wish of the House to debate this Order of the Day concurrently with the Maritime Powers Consequential Amendments Bill 2012. There being no objection, the Chair will allow that course to be followed. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Stirling. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and we are debating this bill about consolidating maritime powers uh, at a time when the frontline men and women of Australian Customs and Border Protection Command uh, and their naval colleagues uh, are operating at absolute breaking point. Uh, both the personnel uh, and the boats in which they operate, um, because of the government's failure to secure our borders, uh, are operating beyond reasonable demands. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I would hope that the House would bear in mind our responsibilities uh, to these men and women in particular, uh, and making sure that this bill doesn't create uh, any further hardships for them. And I want to go to a, a, an issue that may be within this bill uh, later on uh, in my speech. Uh, what we do know, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that uh, we had a system of robust water protection instituted uh, well over a decade ago by the previous government. Uh, and that system has been, um, has been uh, completely degraded um, since the government changed in 2007. Uh, and the consequences for the men and women who protect our borders uh, have been enormous. Um, they've been forced to operate uh, at a completely unsustainable operational tempo. Uh, and if you go and speak to those officers, their frustration about the circumstances in which they've been placed by this government uh, is obvious for everyone to see. We're debating this bill at a time when there is a climate for people smugglers uh, that has been far too friendly. Um, now, clearly, this has been an issue that the parliament has been debating uh, last week, and there was a step taken in the right direction by the government in uh, finally uh, relenting uh, against their opposition to offshore processing on Manus and Nauru. Um, but our great concern in the opposition, and we would like to see these measures work, but we're concerned that they won't, uh, is that this measure that was taken last week just doesn't go far enough. Uh, it only adopts one plank uh, of the three planks of the opposition's policy uh, that we believe very firmly needs to be implemented if we're going to bring the curtain down on what is a very shameful period uh, in Australia's border protection policy, um, where over 22,500 people have arrived illegally, uh, and uh, with all the enormous consequences um, to us as a nation that flow on from that. We also had an issue last week that I think needs uh, to be aired within this debate. Uh, and that is the use of two merchant vessels to pick up asylum seekers who had called for distress. Uh, that distress call was taken by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, uh, and merchant vessels went to the aid of those people. Uh, in the case of one in particular, the MV Parsifal, um, what happened then uh, is deeply disturbing. Uh, the merchant ship uh, rescued this boatload of asylum seekers. Uh, apparently, they were 44 nautical miles from Indonesia. Uh, the minister informed the public on Sky News um, that after this boat went to the aid of these people, um, as, is, you know, as is required uh, under the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, uh, and, to all, uh, and to that boat's credit, um, that, but the captain of the vessel, which was on its way to Singapore, uh, fulfilled his obligations. He picked up the people who had called for distress. Uh, at the request of the Australian authorities. And uh, under normal circumstances, he would be, well, under all circumstances, he is entitled to continue on once he's made, once he's fulfilled his obligations to rescue people. Uh, he is perfectly entitled and he should be able to continue on to his destination or alternatively take the people he's picked up to what is the nearest place of safety, uh, which is understood generally um, to be uh, the nearest port. The captain, uh, as was his right, determined that he was going to continue on his voyage to Singapore. Uh, and then the minister informed us on Sky News um, that the boatload of asylum seekers then threatened violence and became very aggressive, uh, and they insisted that the boat turn around and deliver them to Christmas Island. Uh, the captain uh, then decided that the risk to his crew was too great. Uh, and he acquiesced to the request of those asylum seekers um, to come to Australia. Um, this is completely and utterly unacceptable, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and you really wonder why the government was prepared to acquiesce to a situation where a merchant vessel 
uh, has gone and fulfilled their duty to apparently pick people up when they are in distress, uh, and that people who you think would be grateful for being rescued um, by that passing merchant vessel um, then turn on the captain and the officers of that merchant vessel and insist that they come to Australia. Uh, this is a situation that is completely and utterly out of control. Um, that is exactly the definition of piracy, um, using violence to take a ship from the course from which it's supposed to be going. And it is not acceptable that potential acts of piracy would go unpunished by the Australian government. And it is not acceptable that merchant vessels who do go to the aid of people in distress uh, then have to fear for their own safety from the people who they've picked up uh, who have found themselves apparently uh, in this life-threatening situation. And the, the problem is the government, the Labor Party, never thinks through the consequences of its actions. Uh, this boat was well within the Indonesian search and rescue zone uh, and very close to Indonesia itself. Uh, and it's just because they wanted to come to Australia then the government was prepared to acquiesce to that. And you wonder how far this policy would go. What are the territorial limits of the fact that if people have an intent to come to Australia, the Australian government is prepared to accept that? Um, what about if they had been north of Indonesia? Would have they been allowed to say, well, we're going to come to Australia and the Australian government's going to do nothing about it? Uh, what about if it was a vessel that had left Sri Lanka uh, and was off the coast of India and was picked up by a passing merchant vessel uh, and they insisted that they come to Australia? Uh, would they be allowed to come to Australia in those circumstances? Um, clearly, the government doesn't think through the sorts of decisions that it makes. Uh, well, as interjections uh, from the member for Scullin, uh, and I'm very happy to compare it. I'm very happy to compare it to that situation. Order. Order. He should know better. Uh, yeah, he should know better, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, quite frankly. Uh, and I'm very happy to make the comparison with the incident that the government compares to, which is, uh, which of course happened uh, when the Tampa situation occurred. And I think this is a very relevant precedent for this parliament to look at, um, because what's happened here is the reverse Tampa principle. Uh, we order, cannot order. accept the, the situation can resume his seat for order. If the member for Stirling can resume his seat, if the member for Scullin and the member for Canning can allow the member to be heard in silence, well. I'm asking both members to allow the member for Stirling the right to be heard. Member for Stirling has a call. Well, thank you for your protection, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and quite frankly, I think those interjections are just a great example of the sort of hypocrisy that we see from the Labor Party on this issue. Morning. The absolute hypocrisy we see from the Labor Party on this issue. Uh, and they, they, they've got to think through the consequences of what happened last week. Uh, a merchant vessel goes to the aid of people in distress. Uh, that merchant vessel determines that it's going to continue on its journey to Singapore, yet because of threats of intimidation that the minister announced on Sky News last week, that vessel was diverted from its course. Uh, now, what's, what is that going to mean? For, what are the consequences of that? Uh, clearly, it's going to be a consideration for merchant vessels when they are asked to help to go and pick up people who have called for distress uh, and saying that their safety uh, is in peril. Now, if merchant vessels are going to be diverted from their course and pick people up uh, and then hijacked in this way, um, my concern is that when vessels do receive a distress signal like that, um, they are going to think about their response. Uh, it, also, it, it, I mean, it also could lead into a situation where merchant vessels actually avoid this area. Um, there were two incidents last week where merchant vessels were diverted to apparently pick people up who were in distress. Uh, and it could uh, uh, it could lead to a situation uh, where merchant vessels actually start to avoid this area between Indonesia and Australia. Uh, and clearly that is not a good outcome for Australia and it's not a good outcome um, for people who might find themselves in distress uh, taking this journey. Uh, and I just want to go through what the obligations of a merchant vessel are in these circumstances because I think it's important that the parliament understands them. Uh, in the government's own export uh, expert panel that was uh, released last Monday uh, dealt with this within their report. Uh, and they noted in relation to the Safety of Life at Sea Convention um, that on receiving information that persons are in distress at sea, the master of a ship which is in a position to provide assistance must proceed with all speed to their assistance. This obligation applies regardless of the nationality or status of such persons or the circumstances in which they are found. Where assistance has been provided to persons in distress, 
in a state search, in a state's search and rescue zone, uh, and all of these rescues, of course, have occurred within the Indonesian search and rescue zone. That state has primary responsibility to ensure that coordination and cooperation exist between governments so that survivors are disembarked from the assisting ship and delivered to a place of safety. As a matter of practice, a place of safety could be the nearest convenient port. This will not necessarily be a port in the territory of the state in, which the search, in, in whose search and rescue zone an incident occurs, nor in the territory of the state of the vessel rendering assistance. Now, the captain of the NV Parsifal responded to the broadcast that was issued by the Australian authorities, and he appropriately followed all of his obligations under the Safety of Lice at Sea Convention. Then the captain determined that the, nearest, that, that the nearest convenient port for him, and he's allowed to continue on to his journey once he's for, for, fulfilled those obligations, was Singapore. Um, yet, as I outlined, he's, he, he wasn't allowed to continue on that journey uh, under threats of violence and intimidation from the people who he had rescued. They do need to be, th this incident does need to be investigated by the Australian government. Um, sadly, when the minister announced this on uh, Sky News, apparently the government had actually taken no, uh, no steps to try and investigate these circumstances. Um, they just acquiesced to the fact that this ship had been diverted um, from its course um, because of these threats of intimidation. Uh, and uh, they need to do much better than that, and I understand that belatedly they're now actually investigating the circumstances that uh, this vessel found itself in. They also need to work out what their policy is. I mean, what are the territorial limits of this policy? Is it possible for anyone who's been rescued by a merchant vessel to insist that they come to Australia, um, regardless of where they are rescued? The government really does need to show some resolve in dealing with people smugglers. Uh, and they need to put an end to a situation where other people are dictating our border protection and immigration policies. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I wanted just to turn to some of the specific aspect of this bill, uh, which establishes authorisations under which a maritime officer may exercise enforcement powers in relation to vessels, installations, aircraft, protected land areas and isolated persons on certain grounds. It also provides for the enforcement powers available to maritime officers, including boarding, obtaining information, uh, searching, detaining, seizing and retaining things and moving and detaining persons and creates offences for failures to comply. The bill seeks to consolidate the powers and functions that currently exist within the existing legal framework, chiefly under the Customs Act 1901, the Migration Act 1958, the Fisheries Management Act 1991 and the Torres Strait Fisheries Act 1984. The unique aspects of the maritime environment merit a tailored approach to maritime powers, helping to ensure flexibility in their exercise and to assist maritime officers to deal with quickly changing circumstances and difficult and dangerous situations. It would appear that the powers contained within this bill are primarily based on powers currently available to operational agencies. However, as with most pieces of legislation originating from this government, uh, it doesn't hurt for this parliament to be uh, additionally prudent and thorough to ensure that we're not passing legislation that has been hurriedly put together or has errors within it or uh, has unintended consequences. So, uh, with, it, with that in mind, the bill has been referred to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, uh, and I understand that committee is actually due to bring down its, uh, its report today. Uh, and the opposition will be very keen to scrutinise what it has to say, uh, particularly in relation um, to a particular issue that I'd like to raise uh, in a minute. Uh, now, the Australian Crime Commission has made a submission uh, to that committee. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile having a look at what they have to say. Uh, they specifically say Australia's long and vulnerable coastline provides opportunity for illicit goods to be trafficked into and out of our country via small vessels and light aircraft. As such, the aviation and maritime sectors are highly desirable environments for serious and organised criminal infiltration and exploitation. And despite clear evidence that our maritime and aviation sectors are being exploited by organised crime, uh, this Labor government still continues to slash and burn the budget for Customs and Border Protection. Uh, they also have savaged the budget for the Australian Crime Commission, 
uh, and uh, they have attacked the budget of the Australian Federal Police also. And just recently, the Crime Commission uh, in particular highlighted the damage that Labor's budget cuts have done to their ability to fight crime uh, in their submission to the parliamentary inquiry into the gathering and use of criminal intelligence. Now, since the Labor Party took office, they have slashed $22.2 million in funding and have cut 144 staff from the ACC. Uh, and clearly, this is hindering their ability to do their job effectively, a point that was highlighted by that particular agency in their submission um, to that particular inquiry, where they said for a number of successive years they've been, they've been subjected to very significant cost reduction strategies, particularly in the context of the agency's supplier budget. These reductions adversely affect the ACC's ability to respond to serious and organised crime. Now, clearly, these kind of cuts have a, a very negative effect uh, and, uh, on the ability uh, of our premier law enforcement agencies to do the job that we expect of them. Uh, in particular, the ACC needs to look at organised crime. Uh, and when you're attacking their budget, you are clearly and, and, and attacking their personnel. Uh, you're clearly providing opportunities for organised crime to flourish. Uh, and when you hear the minister talk about his determination to do something about crime in Australia, unfortunately that is just completely and utterly empty words, because the actions of this government since they've come to office have given every encouragement to criminals to pursue um, their uh, evil deeds. Um, and sadly, the cuts that I outlined to the ACC in particular have been particularly bad. Um, but they're not the only crime-finding agency that's been affected by savage labour cuts. Uh, and uh, I, well, I'll just make the point that the ACC made uh, to the inquiry uh, that organised crime groups primarily exploit vulnerabilities in the maritime sector for the purposes of organised theft, the avoidance of duty on illicit goods, and as a primary gateway into Australia for illicit drug importation. So. The ACC has highlighted the damaging effect of Labor's cuts, but they've also highlighted the sorts of vulnerabilities that criminals, and particularly organised criminals, seek to exploit. Uh, now, the agency that we expect to deal with criminal infiltration on our borders is Customs and Border Protection. And they sadly are an agency that, again, has been savaged by the Labor Party since they came to office. Um, initially, the Labor Party ripped $51.8 million uh, out of their budget to inspect cargo when it comes into Australia. Uh, when the government changed uh, in 2007, 60 per cent of air consignments when they came into our country were inspected. Uh, that, uh, the number of consignments is now 75 per cent down than where it was in those times. Uh, that's air cargo consignments in terms of their inspection. Uh, and sea cargo uh, inspections are down 25 per cent because of these savage cuts. And this is occurring at a time when the volume of cargo coming into Australia uh, is increasing. Uh, and uh, what we also know from inquiries that this parliament has conducted is that our airports and our ports are very vulnerable to criminal exploitation. Uh, and there's lots of evidence that organised criminals are exploiting uh, the difficulties that Customs and Border Protection are having because of the Labor Party's savage cuts. Uh, we will reverse those cuts, Madam Deputy Speaker. We don't think that it's a good idea um, when organised criminals are clearly infiltrating these sorts, uh, we're clearly infiltrating our ports and our airports, uh, when parliamentary committees have actually acknowledged that, uh, as have law enforcement agencies. Uh, we don't think it's a very good idea. In fact, we think it's an incredibly stupid thing to do, uh, is to cut funding to the agency that's responsible for policing our ports and our airports. So we will reverse that cut when we come into office if we get the chance to govern again. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've highlighted earlier in my speech that I wanted to raise a particular issue um, that we have concerns with about this bill, and one that I hope that the Senate Committee in particular uh, has had a long look at in their report. Uh, and it has come to our attention um, that there is a potential issue in the bill that may cause problems with the interception of illegal boat arrivals, uh, including those not in our waters. Uh, and this may have implications for maritime authorities fulfilling their obligations under the international law of the sea. In the bill's explanatory memorandum, it gives details of this obligation, uh, and I believe that it's worth quoting in full. 
Australia has implied non-refoulement obligations under Articles 6 and 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and under the Second Optional Protocol to the Covenant. This comprises the obligation not to remove a person to a country where there is a real risk that the person would face a death penalty, arbitrary deprivation of life, torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Such a risk must be a necessary and foreseeable consequence of the person's removal. Proposed section 72 of the bill uh, may engage Australia's non refoulement obligations. Section 72.4 of the bill provides that a maritime officer may detain a person and take the person or cause the person to be taken to a place uh, in or outside the migration zone, including a place outside Australia. Uh, the EM then goes on to say, in circumstances where the covenant against torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and or the second optional protocol to the International Covenant apply, obligations of non-refoulement may, may be engaged and a person may be eligible to apply for a protection visa under Section 32AA of the Migration Act 1958. In such circumstances, in order to ensure that a maritime officer who has detained a person aboard a vessel acts in accordance with Australia's obligations, procedures relating to the consideration of refoulement risks would need to be in place. We are concerned within the opposition that this section of the bill could potentially place a considerable burden uh, on our maritime officers who are already uh, finding the, uh, the um, the circumstances in which they operate incredibly challenging. Uh, and uh, I hope that it's been thoroughly investigated by the Senate committee um, before it hands down its report. And obviously we will look very closely at what they have to say about it. Um, but given what uh, has been outlined by me earlier in my speech about events last week in relation um, to merchant vessels picking up people who have called uh, that they are in distress, uh, it is vitally important that this section is clarified to ensure that our border protection officers uh, are able to do their tasks effectively uh, and without concern that they are being legally hampered um, by sections that are contained within this bill. Madam Deputy Speaker, we in the opposition will all, uh, sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker now, uh, we in the opposition will always side with our maritime officers in the very difficult job that they're being tasked to do in protecting our borders. Um, they are operating at a tempo that has never uh, occurred in the history of our country before. Um, they are operating on vessels that are, not being, uh, that, are, that are just not keeping up with the pace that they are being required to operate. Uh, vessels that we've had reports of that go out to sea when they, should, when they shouldn't. Um, because they are required to do that just by the sheer volume of illegal arrivals that has been unleashed by Labor's border protection failures. Um, but the officers on these boats perform arduous tasks at sea, uh, and they've been asked to perform duties um, that would really generally be outside their normal remit, uh, and they are being pushed to breaking point by these failed policies. Um, but we strongly support the work they do, and we believe that this parliament should do everything we can to help them uh, we certainly shouldn't be doing anything extra to hinder them, uh, and my concern is there may be parts of this bill that do do that. The government needs to take a very strong stance backing up our maritime officers, um, particularly if they're going to face circumstances where they are being threatened uh, at sea or intimidated at sea. Uh, and clearly, uh, as we take on people smugglers, and people smugglers are vicious criminals. They don't care anything about the. Uh, they don't care anything about the human cargo that they transport down here, but it is completely naive for us to think that they are just going to give up and go home uh, without testing the resolve of the Australian government. Uh, and we need to ensure that there's a legal framework that protects our officers who are going to be called upon to deal with those consequences, um, because they do deal with very difficult situations. Uh, and the opposition will always back up their right to do their work. Um, in the most effective and safe way that they can. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, pending the report of the Senate Committee, the opposition is not going to oppose uh, passage of this bill through the parliament, but we will be very interested in what the Senate Committee reports, 
uh, and we will certainly ensure that there's nothing within this bill that's going to hinder the work of the uh, very brave men and women we have protecting our borders. Uh, and as I said, though, the opposition won't be uh, op uh, opposing passage of this bill through the parliament uh, until those issues have been fully investigated by the committee. I thank the member for selling. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The member for Parramatta. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, uh, in contrast to the previous speaker, I am actually going to speak on the bill. Um, I, I would assume, um, as he didn't have much to say about the Maritime Powers Bill 2012 or the Maritime Powers Consequential Amendments Bill 2012, apart from that one section 72, um, that he, he essentially supports the, the rest of the bill, um, given their propensity to find criticism anywhere they can. I would assume that if they had some other problems with this bill, um, they would have said so. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time actually talking about the bill itself, because it is an important bill. Um, a very important bill. The Maritime Powers Bill 2012 consolidates and harmonises the Commonwealth's existing maritime enforcement regimes, which are presently spread across numerous pieces of legislation. In fact, they're spread across 35 pieces of legislation. So when the member for Stirling talks about providing certainty for our officers in the carrying out of their duty, the um, amalgamating of those, all those different places where they have to go um, into one um, bill, amalgamating 35 different places into one, is incredibly important. It provides a single framework for use by our on-water enforcement agencies such as Customs and the Navy, and it will be used to enforce a diverse range of Australia's maritime laws, including in relation to fishing, customs, migration, environment and quarantine, quarantine, as well as international agreements and decisions in particular circumstances. It will provide clarity for on-water enforcement agencies in relation to the powers that they are acting under and the procedures that they are to follow. Um, the Maritime Powers Consequential Amendments Bill um, is a technical bill, really. It just repeals the duplicate provisions in other acts. So it's an important um, piece of legislation. It consolidates and harmonises the existing maritime enforcement regime, provides that single framework, as I said, and it, it will um, apply to a range of Australia's maritime laws, including illegal fishing, customs and migration. I do want to um, respond in part to um, some of the things that the member for Stirling said, and in particular um, the use of his word illegal when referring to boat arrivals. I know there will be many people out there in the community and some journalists that I've seen in the last few days who have been pulling members of the opposition up for using the word illegal when talking about boat arrivals. The member for Stirling said there had been some 20,000 illegal arrivals. They are, of course, not illegal. We do both sides use the word irregular from time to time, but it, um, it, it is, of course, illegal. That, uh, and I guess the, the main concern I have when I keep hearing that word illegal being used is that it gives an impression um, of some sort of incredibly bad behaviour by a person who seeks to come here by boat. Um, and I just want to put on the record, um, Deputy Speaker, that um, there are many people in our community, and I am one of them, um, who understand that if I was faced with crossing a border into Pakistan along with 1.8 million um, refugees, and, and I thought I would be there with my family for decades, um, and I was offered an opportunity. I think, like many people in this House, we might find ourselves saying yes to that opportunity. This is not something that these people are doing that is wrong. They have fled persecution. They're doing the best they can for their family, and they're trying to find a path to safety in whatever way they can. The issue for me is not whether they're doing the right thing or not, because you know, heaven forbid most of us have never been in those circumstances and we have to respect people for doing what they can for their families. The issue for me is that when 20,000 people try and get to Australia by boat, a large number of them drown. Uh, there's an estimated one in 20 um, will drown on the way. And whether people are drowning trying to get to Australia or, as they do on their way to Europe, suffocating in the bottom of containers or whether they're crossing snowy mountains um, through the Asia region, um, whatever the reason for their deaths on the way, we as a nation have an obligation to try and find a way to stop um, those deaths. And so my concern with the boat arrivals is not 
um, with the behaviour of the people concerned. As I said, I, would, I, I just might be one of them myself if I was in those circumstances. Um, and I'm sure some of the members opposite would as well. And I know people in Australia who have come by boat um, who have made the most fabulous citizens um, and work, have worked incredibly hard. So again, um, I think we need to be very careful um, if we uh, place um, value judgments on the behaviour of people who are doing the best they can into, under appalling circumstances. It is good to see the opposition um, at this point uh, accepting a level of compromise in the last week when they supported um, the um, amendments that went through the House. Um, we on this side, of course, offered um, to reopen Nauru and Manus Island quite some time ago. Um, but again, it's, it's good to see the opposition um, willing to compromise at least a little bit um, in the recent support um, of that bill. I'd also want to um, talk about the comments the member for Stirling made um, about uh, the behaviour of asylum seekers, as he put it, um, on the ocean. Um, the report of the uh, expert panel that we saw last week um, made it really clear that circumstances have changed substantially since towbacks were last used. And I know the member for Stirling um, you know, was, was around, I think he came in the same time as I did in 2004, so he wasn't a member of parliament um, during the um, mass arrivals uh, at the turn of that decade. Um, but he certainly has been in parliament long enough to hear um, much of the debate. But the circumstances have changed in the last decade. Um, since the, the limited number of turnbacks happened over a decade ago, and I think there was only about seven, the first couple worked, and then the, the um, people on the boat worked out very quickly that they could scuttle the boat. So even a decade ago, um, the use of that policy lasted a few days at the best before um, people started to risk their lives and the risks of our Navy personnel um, in desperate attempts um, to get to Australia. But also the legal context has changed. The attitudes of many regional governments have, have evolved, raising the potential cost in terms of bilateral cooperation generally and coordination on people smuggling activities in particular. And, and of course the preemptive tactics of people smugglers have adapted quite substantially. Irregular vessels, not illegal vessels, irregular vessels carrying asylum seekers can often be quickly disabled or rendered unsafe to foil any attempted turnbacks and to create a safety of life at sea situation. This, this, provides, um, this uh, introduces potential dangers for asylum seekers and we've seen some of the dreadful um, uh, outcomes. Um, and of course for Australian personnel, um, and, so, and the effect in the turnbacks um, is significantly diminished. The panel, the expert panel, was also of a strong view that there's a range of conditions that need to be fulfilled for safe and lawful turnback of boats carrying asylum seekers, and they were quite, quite clear on this. And they don't believe that those cur um, conditions currently exist um, at all. They don't believe that those conditions exist. They made it perfectly clear that towbacks could not be attempted without the agreement of Indonesia, and that agreement does not exist. The report finds that the conditions required for effective, lawful and safe turnbacks of irregular vessels headed for Australia with asylum seekers on board are not currently met in regard to turnbacks to Indonesia. There have been a number of people who have made comments on this. The Indonesian Foreign Minister um, uh, on 15th of March 2012, now from that kind of mindset, and naturally it would be impossible and not advisable even to simply shift the nature of the challenge from one end of the continuum to the other. Um, simply pushing boats back to where they came from would be a backward step. The general concept of pushing boats back and forth would be an aberration to the general consensus that had been established since 2003, that also from the Indonesian Foreign Minister, and from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees on, in February 2012, we have clearly opposed pushbacks in the Italian case in the Mediterranean in the recent past before the Libyan crisis, and we think that it is clearly a violation in relation to the 51 Convention. But remember, too, that you know, whether one believes that you know, one can do it in relation to the country that you're pushing the boat back to or not, 
um, we do have a situation now where even a decade ago, within the turning back of half a dozen boats, the people involved in the smuggling had already worked out that scuttling a boat and putting the lives of asylum seekers and Australia's um, Navy um, at risk um, was, a, uh, was the way to go, and we would no doubt um, see more of that. The member for Stirling has already talked about um, attempts uh, in uh, recent weeks um, to scuttle boats, at least a suspected attempts to scuttle boats, as is clearly now part of the arsenal um, of people smugglers. Um, this is an, an issue which, you know, unfortunately, uh, still remains sort of mired in a lot of political rhetoric, um, and we've heard a little bit um, of it again today. Um, that, that's a, a great shame. I mean, it really is a great shame. I think people will look back at the decades since the Tampa and the level of rhetoric um, around um, some very desperate people um, with some shame. And I hope the time when we look back on this decade um, with shame comes very quickly. Uh, it is certainly time um, for it to stop. We have an incredibly important um, refugee uh, program. We currently take around 14,000 um, people. We're one of the few countries in the world that take people from camps. Only the United States and Canada currently take more than we do from third countries. And after us, most the, the other nine or so countries that do take people from camps um, from third countries take anywhere between a few hundred and about 1,200. So the big chances for resettlement from a third country, if you're in a camp, is the US, Canada and Australia. Every time um, a person arrives by boat, um, a person who might get to Australia through another path does not. Um, it's, I know there are some who, I guess because a person on a boat asks us for help in a different way, prioritise prioritize that request for help um, over other forms of requests for help. Um, I don't. I believe, as the bottom line, the role for Australia is to take as many refugees as we can, um, as, as effectively as we can, um, and I believe the way for us to do that um, is to do it through the UNHCR process, through regional processing frameworks um, and um, from uh, third countries. And I suspect that those on the other side also agree with that. Um, I suspect that we also have common ground in that we, over time, would, would like to see the number of asylum seekers that we accept increase. There may be debate about what the time frame might be. We on this side are uh, accepting the recommendations of the expert panel that we go to 20,000 straight away and 27,000 within five years. But again, whether we have agreement on the when, I have no doubt that there are many on the other side of this House that believe that our refugee um, program is incredibly important and we could, um, as a fairly wealthy and generous nation relative to so many of our neighbours, play a much, much stronger role. Um, in uh, working with the UNHCR to take um, a greater number from third countries. So we do actually have, I think, um, quite a considerable um, uh, area of common ground. Uh, it's a shame, I think, in talking about what is an intractable problem, a problem the world refugee problem has no answer. Um, it certainly doesn't have an answer that Australia can come up with today. We, um, if we took 49.5 million asylum seekers today, there'd still be a hell of a lot um, waiting for safety, and so you know it's not a it's not a problem that we can solve. Um, we can only play our part. Um, I would uh, urge the member for Stirling um, in in uh, future, and I would urge the follow the speakers that follow him, because I, I suspect that neither of the two speakers that follow are actually going to talk much about the bill. I suspect they will. Oh, I'm I'm told I'm, if I'm judging you incorrectly, I apologise. Um, but I would urge you know, people on both sides of this House to um, enter into a very constructive debate about what is an intractable problem, to cease, even by inference, you know, making any um, uh, allegations of improper behaviour um, against people who are doing the best they can uh, to find safety for their families, um, and look at Australia's role in a larger context and find a way through for us um, to uh, play the role that we can do in providing safe haven for people from third countries and working with our neighbours um, to improve the safety of those 
um, that are in transit countries. Again, I know we agree on this and I would hope that our rhetoric can settle somewhat and we can have a much more constructive debate. But after that, I'll just return very quickly to the bill, which I did speak on initially, um, so I have actually done better than the previous speaker, um, and just commend the bill to the House. You know, 35 pieces of legislation covering the activities of our law enforcement officers on the sea um, is a little bit silly, to say the least. Um, this bill is, uh, has been a long time coming. There's been extensive consultation, and I commend it to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The member for Cook. Thank you, Mr. Deputy P Speaker. I rise to speak on the Maritime Powers and Consequential Amendments bills. The purpose of these bills is set out to set out a common framework to consolidate the powers of our Commonwealth Maritime Enforcement Agencies and their staff. There are a number of key agencies who work in this space and their operational parameters have historically been set out across a range of different bills that govern and determine their specific powers and responsibilities. These different powers are contained in over 35 separate Commonwealth Acts, including four pieces of legislation, the Migration Act, uh, to the Customs Act, the Fisheries Management Act and the Torres Strait Fisheries Act. And the government has said the purpose of these bills before the House today is to attempt to consolidate those powers and draw them all together into one document, one single maritime enforcement law. Yet the rhetoric in these bills about best supporting our frontline officers is fundamentally, I believe, undermined by Labor's actions in recent times and over the last four years in particular, which speak far louder than the words that are written in these bills. In particular, I'll note and return to the government's failure just in the, in the course of the past week uh, in how they dealt with the MV Passable, which my colleague made reference to. Uh, also, we have the situation where the government is effectively not protecting our borders and infest, uh, enforcing, enforcing our legal rights uh, on our borders and instead has been operating a water taxi service now for some time. Uh, the coalition has demonstrated the set of conviction and belief in secure border protection policies that this government uh, can only hint at. Uh, this is a government that lacks the will to deal with this issue, despite the bills that before us today and even despite the bills that before us last week. The simple fact is they've been dragged kicking and screaming to the measures they agreed to last week. And uh, if they don't believe in these measures, which over a decade they said they didn't, then I don't think Australians can have a high level of trust in their ability to act on these matters in the future. In principle, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have serious concerns about unnecessarily rewriting legislation that appears on the face of it to be working. Uh, I'm also very aware of the dangers of inadvertently creating fresh loopholes that would potentially prevent or inhibit our agencies and their ability to protect Australia's border security. I understand that as part of the process of drafting this legislation, Customs and the Department of Defence and the Australian Crime Commission have each been consulted. And I understand that the acting Chief of Navy, Rear Admiral Jones, said on behalf of the Department of Defence, noted in his submission to the committee that the department strongly supports the bills which simplify on water maritime enforcement operations and streamline training and doctorate development within defence. In their view, uh, there will also be less likelihood of misapplication of power and more coherent and comprehensive legislation. In addition, any future amendments will be far less complex as there is only one department responsible for the legislation. The Fisheries Management Authority stated that they were satisfied that the proposed changes are not going to cause operational disruption or curtail the authority's powers or ability to perform in cooperation with other agencies. Uh, I note, however, that my own portfolio in shadow that the Department of Immigration has not yet made a submission uh, to this process, and I am puzzled as to why, given um, that of their responsibilities under the Migration Act and the significant implications uh, for uh, the operations of this bill uh, for matters that relate to them, and I would hope that we would get some comment or some input from them on these issues. The Australian Crime Commission said in their submission they will continue to have access to maritime powers outlined as outlined in the Powers Bill, and that there was no change to the Australian Crime Commission's access to these powers. The Australian Customs and Border Protection Service has stated that as Australia's primary civil maritime law enforcement agency, Customs and Border Protection has been heavily involved in the development of both of these bills. Now, I hope they're right, Mr Deputy Speaker. I hope they're right. And it is for the government to guarantee that they are right and that this bill, these set of bills will not create unintended consequences that restrict the options available to a sovereign government to protect our borders. 
in particular to deter illegal entry or otherwise impede the ability of our agencies to do their job, whether it be managing and responding to the threat of people smuggling or illegal movements of people or goods across our borders. Now, I make specific reference to the phrase, to the term, illegal entry, because there still seems to be some confusion about what this means. And I will refer to the United Nations Convention against Transnational Organised Crime in the Protocol Against the Smuggling of Migrants by Land, Sea and Air. Article 3 states the following. Paragraph A. Smuggling of migrants shall mean the procurement, in order to obtain directly or indirectly, a financial or other material benefit of the illegal entry, the UN's word, illegal entry of a person into a state party into a state party of which the person is not a national or a permanent resident. And paragraph B, illegal entry shall mean crossing borders without complying with the necessary requirements for legal entry into the receiving state. Now, Article 31 of the Refugee Convention also makes specific reference to illegal entry, the UN's word to describe the nature of a person's arrival in a country, regardless of whether they at some time might make an asylum claim or indeed um, prove to be refugees. It is not illegal to make a claim for asylum. The Coalition has never said that. That is not in dispute. It never has been. But if you cross our borders without complying with the necessary requirements for legal entry into the receiving state, that is an illegal entry, and we will refer to it as such and we won't be intimidated by those who would seek to have us do otherwise. And your claim does not change the nature of your arrival. People arrive in this country legally and illegally, and in the former case we have a greater capacity to control and decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. This remains our policy. This is coalition policy always has been, we believe in it, and we can be trusted to act on it, unlike those who sit opposite. The bill sets out a system of authorisations under which a maritime officer can exercise enforcement powers in relation to vessels, aircraft, installations, protected land areas and persons. The government has said these bills are not proposing new powers. Rather, the powers contained in the bills are based predominantly on powers that are currently available to and exercised by the agencies that operate in these areas. The bill does not seem on the face of it to propose changes to operational roles or responsibilities, nor does it appear to, to be reprioritising or reallocating funding. Um, with, where existing powers overlap, these bills are said to remove duplication. However, we are talking about consolidating, consolidating a very diverse range of laws, and further scrutiny is essential to ensure there are no unintended consequences arriving from this attempt at simplification. The bill has been referred to the House of Representatives Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, and it is also before the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, who are due to hand down their report later this month. The coalition is not opposing these bills at present. However, we await the Senate committee report with great interest in the clarification and further details this will hopefully provide. Of particular concern to me is the language surrounding the burden of responsibility for maritime officials working in situations where Australia's non refoulement obligations may come into play, which was referred to by my colleague. Of particular concern to me uh, is that are these ob obligations outlined in the Maritime Powers Bill explanatory memorandum in relation to section 72 uh, open bracket 4 close bracket which states that a maritime officer may detain a person and take the person or cause the person to be taken to a place in or outside the migration zone including a place outside Australia. The explanatory memorandum goes on to say that in relation to circumstances where these obligations may be triggered, in order to ensure that a maritime officer who has detained a person aboard a vessel acts in accordance with Australia's non refoulement obligations, procedures relating to the consideration of refoulement risks would need to be in place. It is important we have a clear understanding of what these obligations presently are and that in this bill we are not seeking to add to these obligations, particularly on the high seas or in our contiguous zone. The guidelines on the treatment of persons rescued by, at sea, published by the International Maritime Organisation, which also bears the, the logo of the UNHCR, uh, following amendments to the SOLAS and SAR conventions, are explicit 
in stating that any operations and procedures such as screening and status assessment of rescued persons that go beyond rendering assistance to persons in distress should not be allowed to hinder the provision of such assistance or unduly delay disembarkation embarkation of survivors from the assisting ships. Now, the government needs to ensure this bill does not create more, difficulties, more difficulties or seek to add or further condition the action of maritime officers as they try to do their jobs, including the interception of illegal boats both inside and out of Australian territorial waters. In addition to finding uh, that turning boats back, because this is what it predominantly relates to, Madam, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, is that the Houston report found that turning boats back, and I quote, can be operationally achieved and can constitute an effective disincentive. And I note at page 126 of that report it states that the following principles for implementing turnbacks are based on international and domestic legal considerations, as well as di diplomatic and operational considerations. Now, the first of those, they say, is that the state to which the vessel is to be returned would need to consent to such a return. Now, one thing those opposite fail to acknowledge in the report is that the report notes that this consent may be provided by acquiescence. Acquiescence. Acquiescence is a very specific term which those opposite uh, would be familiar with, and, and the drafters of the Houston report were very careful to make sure they put that term in there. This is exactly as occurred when the policies of turn back, turning back boats were implemented on the last occasion by the Howard government. It also does not make reference to the situation where an Indonesian flag vessel re -enters, or enters Indonesian waters under its own steam, carrying passengers returning to Indonesia or situations of search and rescue uh, where a boat is in distress. Now, turning a vessel around was a second condition outside Australia's territorial sea or contiguous zone, or steaming a vessel or a vessel intercepted and turned around in Australia's territorial sea or contiguous zone back through international waters could only be done under international law with the approval of the state in which the vessel is registered, the flag state. Now, these provisions, I note, are set out in Article 8, Paragraph 2 of the Protocol Against the Smuggling of Migrants by Land, Sea and Air. This does not address the situation of a flagless vessel, though, which is how the majority of cases first present at sea and provide legal basis for interception. Paragraph 7 of that same protocol states a state party that has reasonable grounds to suspect that a vessel is engaged in the smuggling of migrants by sea and is without nationality or may be assimilated to a vessel without nationality may board and search the vessel. If evidence confirming the suspicion is found, that state party shall take appropriate measures in accordance with the relevant domestic and international law. Thirdly, a decision to turn around a vessel, the Houston report states, would need to be made in accordance with Australian domestic law and international law, including non refoulement obligations, and consider any legal responsibility Australia or operational personnel would have for the consequences to the individuals on board that that, that vessel was to be turned around. There is certainly no clear obligation legal obligation arising from Australia's signatory status to the Refugee Convention under Article 33, which would prevent them doing this in extraterritorial waters. The US Supreme Court held in Sale v Haitian Centres Council that high seas interception by the US Coast Guard's high sea interception and return of Haitian asylum seekers did not contravene Article 33. This argument is strengthened by the position that non refoulement has increasingly become an established principle of customary international law. In addition, Indonesia is a signatory to numerous other conventions that also deal with non refoulement including the Convention Against Torture, and they are also signatories to the Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Turning around a vessel would need to be conducted consistently with Australia's obligations is the fourth criteria set out by the Houston panel under the Solace Convention, particularly in relation to those on board the vessel, mindful also of the safety of those Australian officials or Defence Force personnel involved in any such operation. The guidelines on the treatment of persons rescued at sea I referred to earlier state that the government responsible for the search and rescue region in which survivors were recovered is responsible for providing a place of safety or ensuring that such a place of safety is provided. The safety of Defence Force personnel is managed by the chain of command, which has always been the coalition's policy. Now, on this last point, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have the situation now where vessels in distress are being rescued by what has become a water taxi service, which has every legal, every legal right 
to return people to the closest place of practicable safety, but it is not doing so under this government. And so we have had this situation where the distress calls are now forcing a water taxi service to take asylum seekers, forcing their, their claims on the, on the Australian continent uh, by going down that path. And as my colleague mentioned prior to me, we have also had the situation where now with the Parsifal we have the situation where they are using intimidation through threats to their own safety and potentially later uh, to the crew themselves to force the hand of these vessels. Now, we have a clear difference in attitude here, Mr Deputy Speaker, between the government and the coalition. The government has been dragged kicking and screaming to deal with these issues of enforcing our, our rights and our sovereignty at sea on our borders. The coalition has always believed in it. We believe we need strong laws, and we also believe you need to have a government that's prepared to use those strong laws and use every option available to them to protect our borders. This government has not got that track record, and they do not have that trust of the Australian people. Hey, hey. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The member for Scullin. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, regrettably I find as I get towards the end of my parliamentary career, career that I'm getting a bit thin-skinned and I'm easily provoked into debates. But can I say that on this occasion it isn't the member for Cook that has provoked me, and whilst I disagree with much of what he has said today in his 15-minute contribution, except for some slight digressions into emotive type of late language, and I say that they are slight, it is not because of him on this occasion. But the member for Stirling, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, did, in talking about the Parsifal, actually infuriate me a little, because I find that the attitude of those opposite is actually in contrast to the attitude of the coalition when in government when they were dealing with the sister ship of the Parsifal, the Tampa. Because I think that if we're going to be consistent, we should be consistent about the application of international maritime law, which is much of what the case when the member for Stirling, after 21 minutes, finally got around to the, to the pieces of legislation before us, started to talk about. And the um, honourable member for Cook, in talking about uh, refoulement, was, of course, talking about those same sections of the Principal Act that we're. To, a principal bill that we're debating today. And I don't mind that if we're going to have debates that are around those issues. And in fact, I'm very pleased that in this case these pieces of legislation uh, were brought in before, I think, were brought in before the requirement for compatibility statements about uh, human rights issues. And the fact that the parliament is discussing them in some manner, I'm, I'm pleased to see. It may be that we have different conclusions about that, Mr Deputy Speaker. But that's appropriate that the parliament look at it. But as I said, I think let's go back to the start of the slippery slope about these issues. And that slippery slope was back 11 years ago, August 2001, when a vessel sinking um, in waters that I think were under Indonesian uh, search and rescue was put out a distress call and a merchant ship, the MV Tampa, actually went to uh, its aid. Having taken those people, the 400 or, uh, plus uh, asylum seekers that were on board the distress ship, the captain of the MV Tampa took them aboard and then decided that the most appropriate place for him to take them was the closest land point being Christmas Island. A decision clearly that he could make legitimately under his understanding of the application of international maritime law. And of course, what happened? He was refused permission to land. Then, with a policy written on the back of a postage stamp, Finally, Nauru was found as a solution. Now we've heard over the last couple of weeks the brilliance, the brilliance of the ministers in charge, the brilliance for them to discover Nauru as some solution to a problem that they believe they had. And yet, if you go through writings about these decisions since that time, you see people like the then foreign minister, Alexander Downer admitting that there was no great science 
to the fact that they picked Nauru. It just happened to come into their heads. So they decided it was an island. They could take them there, out of sight, out of mind. And yet, on this piece of legislation, in contrast to the way in which the coalition clearly admit they made these decisions, without consultation, without talking about people that they had to put them in place, at least the member for Cook had the decency to put on the record the comments of several government agencies, from Navy through to Customs, who had all been part of the way in which we put in place these pieces of legislation, agreeing that their comments had been considered, agreeing that they felt in the consolidation of this law, was a, uh, of all the regulations and law that had preceded these pieces of proposed legislation, that they accepted them. But regrettably, the member, of Cook, member for Cook on the substantive issue goes on to say, but we can't be sure. We can't be sure. Somehow the government has fiddled with it or something like that. Well, I'm sorry. Executive government is about that. It's the ministers up down there in the south wing actually working with their departments. And fortunately, fortunately, on the public record, it would appear that whilst all those agencies in, these, in the case of these particular maritime powers legislation, coming out of all the different silos of government, actually came together. There is no evidence, no evidence indeed, that this has only been one agency imposing on others. This is a whole of government approach. This is something that should be celebrated. Now, as a parliamentarian, I'm happy for the Senate committee to have a look at it. I'm happy for them to look at the things that have been raised by the two opposition front benches in this debate. But don't use the fact that they're proposing that we look at these things as the criticism that, some, that, that, that the system has failed. That's the proper way that the parliament should look at proposals put by executive government. Now, I'm confident that they'll stack up. But even if they don't stack up, if they're properly reacted to, that is appropriate. And it is not something that we should come in here merely mouth deciding that we're going to score points. Score points on every issue. Now, if indeed, with the vessel last week, the Parsifal, people on that vessel have acted illegally in threatening the master of the vessel, well, let, let this parliament allow the appropriate investigations to go on and the appropriate action to take place. But that doesn't change that government has to, time to time, make decisions about destinations in these circumstances. Because, Mr Deputy Speaker, I keep going back, that's exactly what an Australian government did in the case of the Tampa. It just happens that the coalition now in opposition forget that. Forget that. Now, I think that the fact that this piece of legislation is an attempt to give certainty to all those agencies that are going to have to be making pretty hard decisions in real time, out in dangerous situations, it's appropriate that we look at these pieces of legislation in that manner. And when last week's debate is raised, I just want those that sit opposite Mr Deputy Speaker to think about their contributions to that debate. Their contributions fell for the mistake of a party that goes out of government at a point in time and then thinks that the world doesn't change from that point in time, that their policies of that point in time are then always contemporary, a failure to look at the situation in a contemporary manner and then develop, modify, tweak policies so that they suit the situation 
five years on in 2012. But there was a significant, a significant contribution, and it is actually to do with issues that are raised in these pieces of legislation on maritime powers. There was one significant contribution from a member opposite, and that was the member for Kuyong. Now, the member for Kuyong actually mentioned regional cooperation. That was pretty good. Because what was the Houston Committee on about? The context, the whole package includes regional cooperation, regional cooperation and the processing of asylum seekers. Now, I disagreed with the member for Kuyong in his analysis that this government hasn't pursued regional cooperation with appropriate vigour. I think he's wrong on that point. But he was the only one that reminded the House, like I have on other occasions, that the process, regional cooperation process under the Bali process commenced with the coalition government. It was one of their better moves. But it does not suit the narrative. It does not suit their political narrative because suddenly regional cooperation with countries like Indonesia or Malaysia or any of the 40 plus countries that are in the Bali process somehow wouldn't be hairy chested enough. It doesn't show them as tough. It would show them as being sensible. It would show them as understanding that this is an issue that will not go away. And this is an issue where our response has to range from dealing with the misery of those that have died at sea through to those that have done in a measured way, have proceeded in a measured way through the assessment of their claims for refuge as international asylum seekers, because that is the breadth of the issues that confront us. Now, as I said, I was happy that uh, the member for Cook was measured. I disagree with the emphasis that he places on the word illegal. Now, he made a response to issues raised by the member for Parramatta in this debate. I believe that it was appropriate that the member for Parramatta raise those issues. But let's look at the Houston report. Again, applicable to these pieces of legislation, they talked about IMAs, illegal maritime arrivals. You know, we have to have a language when we're dealing with these things. It would be better if we kept it simple and we kept it understandable. So we have IMAs. Um, we have civs, suspected illegal entry vessels. I think I've got that right. And that's become part of our nomenclature. That can then be interpreted by those that uh, feel that they have the uh, compassionate progressive end of the spectrum in the debate as being nasty, pejorative uh, terms. Those hardliners see, well, that's what they really are, you know, and they make an interpretation that it's all about the eye, illegal. But significantly, the member for Cook agreed that the people on those vessels, even if they called sieves, even if they are IMAs, have every right under the international agreements that this government has entered into that I understand the whole of the parliament agree that we are participants and should be participants to the fullest, that those people then can then seek asylum. Why is it that once the, the people themselves get to that point, we can't just simply talk about them as asylum seekers, which at that point in time they are? No emotion in that, a simple statement of fact. 
because at that time, as the member for Cook acknowledged, they have a legal right to seek asylum. It may be down the track that when they're not decided, they're not, the applications aren't decided that they are refugees, that they return to illegal inverted commas, but that's a different matter. But in the debate where we've got to have the emotion, we place great value, great weight on these terms. And that does not the help the debate in this place. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I know that I should not be so thin-skinned. I know that I should not be provoked. But I think if we're going to have these debates, let's talk about the whole couple of decades on these issues. Let's celebrate that a government is trying to bring all the agencies together so that they actually understand what each other is doing and what's expected of them and that we are all working in the national interest. That disappoints me that from time to time the debates in this place are not con conducted in the national interest. I thank the member for Scullin. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's a privilege to follow the member for Cook and Stirling in relation to these bills. And indeed, it's been interesting listening to the debate uh, from members opposite in relation to these bills, maritime powers, in the context of the MV Parsifal and what has been happening in recent weeks uh, in relation to border protection measures from the government. And it almost feels that uh, the member for Parramatta and the member for Scullin really do have an issue to take up, and that is an issue with their own government, Mr Deputy Speaker. The people they are really uh, holding concern with happen to be the people uh, running the country, and the proposals they disagree with are their own government's proposals. And if ever you wanted an example of the contortions of this government in relation to border protection and maritime powers, I think this issue really has revealed it here today in this chamber. The debate has seen the member for Parramatta lament uh, what has happened in relation to the MV Parsifal, not the fact that some illegal activity may have occurred, but that we as an opposition are pointing out that the government has met this serious situation with absolute weakness. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am, as the member for Scullin says, a hardliner on border protection, and I make no apologies for it. I make no apologies for it, Mr Deputy Speaker, because it saves lives, it saves money, and it produces a better result for Australians, for Australian taxpayers and for people seeking asylum in Australia today. It's better to be tough on border protection, and I'm a strong advocate for it. And I've stood in this place before and said it's OK to be soft and humanitarian on border protection as well. Uh, as the Greens are, and I don't agree with the member for Melbourne, but he's principled. But what I do accuse the government of is straddling both sides of the fence and achieving absolutely nothing. In fact, the member for Scullin said that we have to look at things the way they are, not the way you want them to be. You have to accept that time has moved on. We have accepted, Mr Deputy Speaker, that time has moved on. We have noted that it's not the same as 2007 when you had a highly successful, strong government with the strength of conviction and will to run a border protection system and have clear definitions of maritime powers. Uh, what we have since 2007 and what we saw, of course, was an unravelling of border protection measure after border protection measure, a change in the circumstance brought about by this government, bit by bit, till we got to the point this year where we had to and were forced to, as a parliament, return to the system which produced the best results, not with an acknowledgement from the government that, gee, we got that wrong all along, oh my gosh, that was a terrible thing, but to somehow stand here as the member for Parramatta did and say, look, I don't like the word illegal, Mr Deputy Speaker. Contrast her very emotive speech, the word illegal is somehow uh, unpalatable for this parliament, with the factual presentation of the member for Cook, quoting sections of the refugee conventions referring to illegal entries, uh, specifying what an illegal entry represents. Let's name it for what it is. If people come here illegally, they should be named as coming here illegally. But the government, of course, worried about the semantics and the language and, oh, gee, don't say that. That's a bit nasty. Oh, my gosh, you're too tough. This is the contortions that we see inside this government that produce bad policy. Bad policy costs people's lives. Bad policy costs money. Bad policy has serious consequences. So the member for Scullin says, well, why are, we, why are we raising issues with these bills before us today? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am suspicious of the government's motives in presenting the Maritime Powers Bill 2012. I am concerned about the detail. The details matter. 
The government has failed on getting the details right in so many pieces of legislation before this chamber in recent times that, of course, each member is right to get up here and raise concerns. And what concerns have we raised? Well, the member for Cook and the member for Stirling have eloquently expressed our concerns with reformment. Um, we have referred the bill, of course, to the relevant Senate committee uh, to consider it. But, of course, we're suspicious about why we have a bill consolidating maritime powers has appeared at the same time that we have such a demonstration of weakness in relation to the MV Parsifal. Uh, we know, of course, that the merchant ship, the MV Parsifal, rescued a boatload of asylum seekers um, and was then subjected to threats of violence and intimidation from the asylum seekers they had rescued. Uh, we know that the captain had become concerned for the safety of his own crew. And even though he had determined under the relevant provisions um, of uh, rescues at sea that Singapore was the relevant port to take the ship to, because of the concerns and because of the dramas created by those he had rescued, he had to turn to Australia. I found, Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Stirling's points in relation to this, I think, uh, very important. Where does this end? Uh, why, are, why is the government consolidating maritime powers and consequential amendments in relation to this when we have no comprehensive way of addressing what occurred? Where, when is a boat going to be considered to be doing the right thing or the wrong thing? When are people on board those boats, these asylum seekers, threatening the safety of crew considered to be doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And the member for Parramatta seemed to think, well, don't you dare raise what people do on these boats. They have a right to do it. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't believe that principle can be extended to what is going on on our seas and in our border protection system. Uh, people do have a responsibility to behave humanely, especially when the ship's captain is rescuing them from distress, as they are obliged to. I don't believe it's then right for anybody to turn around and engage in illegal behaviour. For the member to Parramatta to suggest, well, they're desperate, and if I was in that situation, I could see myself acting in a way that would be different from uh, the way we are here. I don't think it's a powerful or persuasive argument. In fact, I find it to be an argument for a stronger system and stronger bills and stronger legislation. I guess, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the opposition has a concern that this bill is being raised to make it look like the government is doing something. Of course, they seem to count uh, that the number of bills they pass through this parliament uh, as action. Uh, the Leader of the House is fond of saying, well, we've passed this many bills or that many bills as if more laws is better or the more numerous the laws, the better our society is governed. Uh, but the quality of the bill, the quality of what is in it, uh, is absolutely paramount. And it is not simply the case that the more uh, bills you pass, the better it is. Consolidating the framework for the exercise of the Commonwealth's maritime enforcement powers could be seen as a good objective. Uh, it is something generally I support, consolidation uh, of bills and frameworks. Uh, however, you know, there has to be an examination of what the government is proposing here and whether anybody's obligations under these bills will change. Uh, the Customs Act 1901, the Migration Act 1958, the Fisheries Management Act 1991 and the Torres State Fisheries Act 1984. Um, all of these need to be examined in the context of what is going on. We do not want the government to be, um, I, I think, uh, making a mistake or having unintended consequences from a consolidation bill at a time when this is such a grave concern. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I have risen in this place before to express my very uh, serious concerns with the government's management of our borders. And, and the Maritime Powers Bill, I think, gives us another opportunity to highlight um, what is going on uh, in relation to the government's failure of, of protecting our borders. Um, I do think that um, uh, the member for Cook made another valid point about the submissions and that the Department of Immigration has not yet made a submission. Uh, and that's why, of course, we referred the bill to the relevant House Committee and the Senate Committee. Uh, and um, it would also appear, of course, that the Australian Crime Commission submission uh, to the Senate inquiry into this bill uh, made a point of noting um, how difficult it is uh, to uh, uh, manage Australia's long and vulnerable coastlines. And in relation to that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would simply add uh, that as a member from a Sydney um, uh, electorate uh, who has recently been subject subjected to an increased range of shooting crimes and gun crimes in relation to this, I accept the member for Stirling's points that uh, a cuts to border protection and cuts to customs screening of vessels has led to bad outcomes. Uh, and especially for people in Sydney who are the victim of more uh, illegal gun crime. 
Uh, it is counterintuitive, of course, for the government to be talking about maritime powers when they have been making cuts to customs and border protection screening on our nation's borders uh, at a, to the tune of 58.1 million um, when greater volumes of cargo are hitting our borders every single day. Uh, when the Howard government left office, Mr Deputy Speaker, there were 60 per cent of air cargo consignments being inspected, um, which Labor has cut by about three quarters. Uh, meaning there is a much greater chance of illicit uh, goods being shipped into Australia. And I think this has been a very real impact um, in Sydney and in the Sydney Basin. Sea cargo inspections, of course, have been reduced by 25 per cent at a time when the Australian Crime Commission, in its submission, openly acknowledged that organised criminal gangs are taking advantage of the lax conditions at wharves and exploiting, exploiting weaknesses in the system. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't intend to go on much further in relation to this bill other than to say, listening to the member for Parramatta and the member for Scullin, they really have serious issues with their own government and their own government's policy, and it is to that government that they should turn uh, with their concerns. If they have concerns about the word illegal, um, they should really look at the sections of the refugee conventions that the member for Cook raised to understand that people are entering Australia illegally that the people smugglers are running an illegal operation, that people removing all their documents or paying money to people smugglers are acting illegally, that people threatening the captain of a ship to turn around and move to another port are acting illegally. Anyone doing that is acting illegally. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I make no apology for being tough on such people who are acting illegally. Of course people have the right to seek asylum in Australia, uh, and of course there are circumstances where that may happen. But we must devise a system which is strong on our borders and border protection so that people don't make a risky journey and so that we don't have these incidents at sea like the MV Parsifal. Uh, and for the government members to stand here in this House today and lament uh, the situation on behalf of people who may well be acting inappropriately or illegally on these boats, I think is unacceptable. Order. The <coughs> question is that this bill be never at a second time. I call the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much. And can I thank honourable members for their contribution to the debate? Uh, the Maritime Powers Bill 2012 and the Maritime Powers Consequential Amendments Bill 2012 provide a simpler approach to maritime enforcement through streamlining the operational framework for our on-water enforcement agencies. Uh, the maritime domain poses particular challenges to the effective enforcement of laws. Enforcement operations in maritime areas frequently occur in remote locations isolated from the support normally available to land-based operations and constrained by the practicalities of sea-based work. Under the current legislative framework, operational agencies use powers contained in at least 35 separate Commonwealth Acts, and this structure is inefficient and can lead to operational difficulties for the primary on-water enforcement agencies. The Maritime Powers Bill provides a smarter and simpler approach to maritime enforcement through a single maritime enforcement law. This single law consolidates and harmonises the Commonwealth's existing maritime enforcement regime. The powers contained in this bill are modelled on powers currently available to operational agencies. And the bill establishes a system of authorisations under which a maritime officer may exercise enforcement powers in the maritime domain. In addition, to providing the necessary operational flexibility, this system of authorisations includes a range of safeguards to make sure maritime enforcement powers are authorised and exercised appropriately and for a proper purpose. The key safeguard is the requirement for the exercise of powers to be authorised on specific grounds by a senior maritime officer or member of the Australian Federal Police. This provides clarity around who must make decisions to take enforcement action and ensures appropriate oversight in relation to the exercise of powers. The types of authorisations available under the bill will cover a wide range of enforcement situations, which arise in the maritime environment, including fishing, customs and migration matters. Enforcement powers under the bill will be exercised by officers of the Australian Defence Force, the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service, the Australian Federal Police and other persons appointed to conduct enforcement and monitoring activities in the maritime environment. The Maritime Powers Consequential Amendments Bill repeals maritime enforcement powers in a number of other acts where they overlap for the powers in the Maritime Powers Bill. I want to turn to some of the specific comments raised in the debate. 
The member for Stirling's statements about cuts to customs are frankly pretty rich, coming from a party that needs to make $70 billion worth of cuts and plans to sack some 12,000 public servants if they win the next election. That's what the Shadow Treasurer has said earlier this year, and for a start, he said for a start 12,000 public servants in Canberra will be made redundant over a two-year period immediately upon us being elected. The Shadow Minister has also refused to rule out cuts to customs. When he was order. quizzed about this— I'll let your secretary resume seat. The member for Fadden on a point of order. Oh, on relevance, Mr Deputy Speaker, yeah. the parliamentary secretary is wrapping up a bill on, uh, on maritime issues. How that strays into comments made by a Shadow Minister prior to a last election, I think, is simply beyond the House. I thank the member for Fadden. Uh, the parliamentary secretary has the call and she will be, uh, as she would understand, uh, relevant to the bill that she is summing up. And certainly, uh, as the member for Stirling raised the issues to cuts to custom, I am being relevant to the bill and to the debate. Uh, obviously, when quizzed, the shadow minister said it was impossible for him to give any guarantee around that. So to attack the government in this debate on cuts, I think, is uh, fairly rich. And in fact, uh, what we have seen is that we have spent more than a billion dollars a year on customs and border protection, and it is getting results. Last year, we seized uh, more heroin, cocaine and amphetamines than ever before. And earlier this month, we seized half a billion dollars worth of illegal drugs, the largest seizure of ice in Australian history and the third largest heroin seizure. That's more than we often seize in an entire year. So the amount of drugs and illicit materials we seize in air cargo have more than doubled since we came to office, and that's because we're investing in intelligence. Uh, it's important, and it's, uh, ask any expert in the field, and they'll tell you that intelligence is key to catching crooks and seizing drugs and guns, and that's what we're doing, and we ask the opposition to do the same. Turning particularly to some of the other comments from the members, uh, particularly the member for Cook, who raised concerns about the operation of various powers under the bill. And I want to remind those members that this bill does not enlarge or reduce any such powers. The bill, importantly, harmonises existing provisions across a range of laws to provide a smarter and simpler approach to the maritime enforcement. The explanatory memorandum raises matters regarding the implementation uh, of the Australia's obligations with respect to non-refoulement uh, and under a range of international legal instruments. The issues exist, exist is, in relation to current legislative powers and will continue to exist in relation to the legislation as harmonised in this bill. The member for Cook also queried whether the government has fully engaged with the relevant stakeholders. And allow me to assure the member that over several years, uh, the several years during which the harmonisation process has been carefully undertaken, all relevant departments have been fully engaged. Uh, the members opposite also seem keen to use this bill to debate the question of asylum seekers and the recent expert panel report. I do want to remind members that this bill is not directed to those matters. This bill is an important regulatory step to simplify and harmonise on water enforcement operations. Uh, the Australian government, in conclusion, is committed to ensuring that Australia's laws are effectively monitored and enforced in the maritime domain. The unique aspects of the maritime environment merit a tailored approach to maritime powers. These bills ensure flexibility in the exercise of these powers, allowing maritime officers to deal with quickly changing circumstances in often difficult and dangerous situations. These bills will streamline and modernise Australia's legal framework for maritime enforcement and thereby support the hardworking Australians who work on our behalf to uphold Australia's maritime laws. These reforms are just one aspect of the government's work to provide Australia with a modern legal framework. Uh, I also um, wish to table uh, a revised explanatory memorandum as uh, part of this debate. And uh, in conclusion, I would commend these bills to the House. <coughs> the question is that this bill be narrowed a second time. All those of that have been say aye. Contra no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to provide for the administration and enforcement of Australian laws in maritime areas and for related purposes. I understand it's the wish of the House to grant leave for the third reading to be moved immediately. If there being no objection, leave is granted. I call the parliamentary secretary to move that this bill be now read a third time. Thank you. I move that this bill now be read a third time. I put that question then that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. 
The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to provide for the administration and enforcement of Australian laws in maritime areas and for related purposes. The clerk. Government business, order number two. Maritime Powers Consequential okay. Amendments Bill 2012, resumption of debate on the second reading. I call the, the parliamentary secretary. Please. Oh, the question is that the, the question is the motion be agreed to. I call the parliamentary secretary. The bill. Pardon? Okay. The question is that the bill be read now read a second time. All those who have that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have the clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to deal with consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Maritime Powers Act 2012 and for related purposes. The parliamentary secretary. No, it's, it's is leave granted? I understand it. We to the House to grant leave, and there being no objection, leave is granted. I now call the parliamentary secretary. Uh, I move that this bill now be read a third time. I put the question that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading. A bill for an act to, amend, to deal with consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Maritime Powers Act 2012 and for related purposes. I now call the parliamentary secretary. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I move that orders of the day number four and five government business be postponed until a uh, later hour this day. I put the question as moved by the parliamentary secretary. All those with that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Now we are... I think we... No. Uh, member for Fadden, uh, I'll be the determinant of where we're at. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your assistance. But it being approximately 1.45, the debate is interrupted in accordance with standing order 43, and the debate may be resumed at a later hour. Are there any statements by honourable members? I call the member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I recently had the pleasure of representing the federal government at the opening of the $10 million Winterlear Irrigation Aug Augmentation Scheme, the fourth in a suite of projects completed under the Australian government's $140 million uh, commitment to support the development of modern, efficient irrigation schemes in Tasmania after 11 years of neglect by the Liberal government. The augmentation scheme will not only help secure a long-term sustainable future for Tasmanian irrigation communities, but will lend greater certainty to investment productivity in local communities. It will supply an increased volume of reliable irrigation water, which in turn will provide the opportunity for greater production and more jobs in the region. The Australian government provided funding of more than $4 million for this particular project, which demonstrates the Australian government's commitment to investing in efficient and ecologically sustainable irrigation in Tasmania and helping Tasmanian irrigators produce some of the best food in the world. Projects like this one are assisting Tasmania to ensure water resources within its irrigation sector are used in a sustainable and efficient manner whilst facilitating water reform action under the National Water Initiative. I would like once again to congratulate everyone involved in this project from start to finish. I look forward to seeing a boost in productivity capacity of irrigators in this region. Who do I call the member for Brisbane? I rise uh, to highlight the plight of the Australian seafood industry, which is set to become the latest victim of this inept Labor government and its desperation to remain in power through yet another dodgy deal with the extreme Greens. Um, Deputy Speaker, yesterday I attended a rally in Brisbane's seaside suburb of Shorncliffe, attended by more than 150 people, concerned with uh, Labor's lockout of the 1.5 million square kilometres of fishing zones. 
Deputy Speaker, we don't need to lock up our oceans to protect them, and Minister Burke would know that if this proposal was based on real science as opposed to political science, he would come to that conclusion. The proposed lockout has been undertaken with stealth and unholy haste. The government has not undertaken a proper study or an analysis of the economic impacts of the lockout of the fishing industry supply chain, and as a result, they seemingly don't know that there will be a $4.35 billion impact and there will be a loss of 36,000 jobs. And what's more alarming, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that they just don't care. Minister Burke continues to falsely claim that the lockout will only impact on 1 to 2 per cent of the industry. But this is what you would expect from a minister who not only does, doesn't do his homework, but doesn't want to do his homework as well. No form of fishing has currently managed in the Coral Sea as demonstrated to be a threat to biodiversity. The management of Australia's fishing zones is not only of world-leading standard, but it continues to improve. And we can thank the coalition and the Australian seafood industry for that, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order. I call the member for Canberra. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm incredibly proud of Corporate Canberra for the recent efforts in promoting organ donor awareness. Yeah, yeah. A firm in my electorate, Kassar Slavin, takes their social conscience seriously. Led by Henry Gazar and Michael Slavin, they've become a friend of Donate Life and take every opportunity to promote the cause that is close to my heart. Lyndall Kazar manages their community activism and organised a regional team to participate in this year's City to Surf in Sydney. These are people who have nothing to do with organ donation. They are neither recipients nor donors. But like me, they are touched by the many stories of people dying on waiting lists. The team was 50 strong and came from corporate Canberra and Goulburn. Their camaraderie was strong. They wore short shirts with the Donate Life uh, logo on them, and their bond was cemented on the bus trip to Sydney. They had a team dinner where one of Canberra's organ donor advocates encouraged them not to sample the taste of the big smoke, but to get to bed early. The message was heeded. This is the third year our regional team has participated and many personal bests were achieved. In particular, Dan Del Rio completed the course in 65 minutes. Times were not the purpose, however. It was about people on the route having a conversation about organ and tissue donation. Many of the 80,000 participants noticed this team and commented on their commitment to organ donation. I thank these foot soldiers and urge others to get involved in ensuring that all Australians have had the conversation with their loved ones. Order. I call the member for Solomon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is with regret that I rise today to advise the House of the passing of Gunnar Jack Mulholland, who sadly passed away over the weekend aged 92. Jack was one of the last surviving Darwin defenders. He manned an anti-aircraft gun during the bombing of Darwin, February 19, 1942. I'm pleased that the parliament, at my request, uh, through a private member's motion, acknowledged the bombing of Darwin as a day of significance. I'm pleased that Jack was able to participate in the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Darwin commemorations earlier this year. It's astounding that 70 years on and only now Australians are learning about the bombing of Darwin. It truly amazes me that how many people are not aware of what, what occurred back in 1942, as it certainly never was taught in schools. It's only through the people like Jack that the story of the bombing of Darwin was shared. And in fact, it was while Jack was sharing one of these stories that I first met him uh, at the Darwin Military Museum, a place very dear to him, something else that Jack fought for. From all accounts, Jack was, a, one, was one of the key people in ensuring that the Darwin Military Museum remained at its current <coughs> location despite the Northern Territory government wanting to relocate the museum in town. Rest in peace, Jack. You will never be forgotten. Thank you on behalf of a grateful nation for your <coughs> efforts in protecting Australia. Would I call the member for Robertson. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, I rise to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the Central Coast Business Excellence Awards uh, 2012, which were held in my electorate on the Central Coast of New South Wales in 2012, last Saturday night. Um, I want to acknowledge Coastar Motors and Central Coast Business Review as significant sponsors for this event and a number of other significant partners in our community, uh, New South Wales Trade and Investment, Wyong Shire Council, Bendigo Bank, Print National, Display Power, SV Partners, Apex, TAFE. Newcastle University, uh, Complete uh, Staff Solutions, Gosford City Council and Graphic by Design. The um, talent of uh, business acumen on the Central Coast is something that really needs to be acknowledged and I want to particularly name 
some are the, the winners. Uh, Treehouse Creative, Baltimore Air Coil Australia, Close Financial Group, uh, Naomi Taylor from the M M Mingara Indigo Bank, uh, Bar, sorry, Wyong Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, Independent Portable Business, who were the independent portable build buildings who are actually the winners of the overall business prize, eBiz Print, um, Webstuff.biz. Uh, Jason Van Grenden, Gender and Treehouse Creative won another award. Also, uh, ING Direct, Bubs Customs, uh, Train Ingold, Neat, Independent Portable Buildings, and Lake Haven Shopping Centre. In the categories of sustainability, uh, I particularly want to acknowledge Baltimore Air Coil Australia, whose business is growing on the back of the carbon price, which is bringing about massive change Order. in refrigeration. <coughs> I call the member for Gippsland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I rise to highlight huge concerns in the aged care sector with this government's so-called reform package. Now, I've had the opportunity to meet with aged care providers in my electorate and to say they're alarmed about the future viability of their critically important services would be an understatement. I'd like to refer to the Aged and Community Care Victoria, which released a statement in June this year titled Gillard Government Slashes Aged Care Funding. And in that statement, the CEO, Kate Hoff, said the industry was shocked to learn that the high-profile budget announcement of a $50 million redirection for the next financial year resulted in a real reduction in funding of over $500 million. It goes on to say, modelling by providers has consistently shown that subsidy income will be substantially reduced, a cut of between 5 and 10 per cent for every provider. As a result of this new model, residents with exactly the same care needs in the same facility could be entitled to different levels of funding. The board at Sale Elderly Citizens Village has written to me to express similar concerns, and I'd like to quote from that letter as well. Someone needs to speak up for the aged and for the facilities that provide these people with the love, care and attention they both need and deserve. This impacts on, it, this impacts on us not only by the new charges for electricity, gas, rising insurance costs, the new EBA, which has been negotiated at present, carbon tax, etc., but there will be such a differential between residents that are in our facility now versus the ones that will come in after July 1. Deputy Speaker, I urge the, mem the, the Minister and the Prime Minister to stop hiding behind the spin and actually start delivering better services for older Australians. Order, I call the member for Shortland. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I received a letter from Pastor Louise Schenk, who is a uh, children's pastor at Lakes Baptist Church. And they run a program there, Tears, uh, Transformation, Empowerment, Advocacy and Relief. And it's about making, uh, about contributing to develop aid and development. And they held a weekend's conference for 70 plus children. And, uh, the, and Pastor Shanks uh, said that she found that she went there to educate the children but found that she was educated and challenged by them. And what I thought I'd do was share some of the, the letters that have been sent to me from the children that attended that. Please can you help the poor children and families in the world? And that was from Michaela. Stop and think of the poor. Please think of the very desperate in need. Enough is enough. Uh, rag pickers and the poor, they need your help. Yes, you can help. And uh, there's many such uh, inspiring letters from young people that have a very strong social conscience. From Ella, who's aged nine. Dear politician, please remember to help the poor, people in need. What I'd do is call on all the members of this parliament to support the, those young people at, Gorican, uh, at the Gorican Church and join together and Order. support the poor Order. of the world. I call the member for Ryan. As you're well aware, for 10 days every August, the country meets the city at the Brisbane Ecker. Each year, Scouts Queensland, based in Auckland Farm, my electorate of Ryan, participate in the Ecker's fruit display competition. The fruit display is one of the most popular events at the ECA, with entrants from right across the state. I recently met with Scouts Queensland and they explained the process of putting together a winning fruit display. The display takes about four months to put together, from design concept to the final day of the ECA. Each piece of fruit is painstakingly checked for blemishes and bruises, and last year's display used just over one and a half tonnes of fruit. Once the fruit arrives at the RNA showgrounds, a group of ten people spend almost two days placing the fruit on the display. At the end of the ECA, the fruit that is not sold is donated to Food Bank Queensland for distribution through their network of charities. Judging of the fruit display took place last Thursday week, and I am pleased to announce that Scouts Queensland took out second place in this year's competition. 
I congratulate the Scouts on their hard work and wish them well in future competitions. And Mr Deputy Speaker, may I take this opportunity to congratulate Brendan Christo and all the councillors of the RNA for an outstanding show this year. And, uh, in particular, I did enjoy the wood chopping event by Mr uh, Phil Kesby and uh, Ms Tori Shenstone, who were the MCs, and of course a junior fashion competition uh, where Kenmore uh, State School had several entrants and winners. All in all, it was a great show for all of Brisbane. Order. Chloe, member for Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I present to the House a petition which has been considered by the Standing Committee on Petitions and certified as being in accordance with standing orders. Uh, the petition is signed by 38 petitioners. The principal petitioner is Michael Donovan from the Victorian branch of the Shop Assistants and Allied Employees Union. And it asks the House to amend the National Employment Standards in the Fair Work Act to include an additional public holiday, not a substitute day, on the following Monday or Tuesday, whenever Christmas Day, Boxing Day or New Year's Day fall on a weekend, and also to include Easter Sunday as a public, public holiday. The petitioners have drawn the attention of the House to the fact that weekend and shift workers are disadvantaged whenever Christmas Day, Boxing Day or New Year's Day falls on a weekend and the public holiday substitute is moved to the following Monday or Tuesday. When that substitution occurs, workers rostered to work on the actual special day falling on the weekend don't receive a public holiday, whilst workers rostered to work on the substitute day do. This is unfair to weekend and shift workers. Some states have legislated for Christmas Day, Boxing Day and New Year's Day to be public holidays when they fall on a weekend, plus an additional public holiday on the following Monday or Tuesday. Similarly, there are difficulties in relation to Easter Sunday, and the petitioner asks Parliament to legislate a uniform standard order. across Australia. Order, order. I call the member for Herbert. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It was, it was with great pride that I attended the Vietnam Veterans uh, Service on Sunday at Anzac Park in Townsville. The ranks may be thinning. Uh, they may be getting a little bit tired. But when the RSM called them to order and to line up in fours, they did so with glee. Some weren't able to stand the entire service. It was a great service and a great time to pause and reflect on what has actually gone before. That these men had been overseas and everyone who went to Vietnam probably went through Townsville. That these men had been overseas and the way, they, the way they were treated when they came back and the way they left. Still, they still bear the scars for those things. But we ask them when, we do send them, when they do come back and they do bear the scars now, is that the way they were treated in some way is, is a reason why we treat our soldiers so well now, that the bad treatment before in some way sets the path on how we treat our ADF people and our families. When I was recently to see the uh, two RAR, uh, uh, the, service, the parade to send them overseas, the then Chief of Army stood up there and spoke for 15 minutes. He spoke for nearly 12 minutes to the families of the soldiers who would be, who would be deployed about the services that would be there and how they are included that in some way that the Vietnam veterans have paved the way for this to happen. And so it will in some part, in some measure, make up for the shabby treatment that they received. For those guys who still bear the scars, we say lest we forget. Order. <coughs> I call uh, both people who have spoken or asked already. It's, I can't see there's anyone else. So I'll call the member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I recently attended the Beacon event at uh, schools in my electorate of Bass. Beacon is a not-for-profit organisation aimed at providing brighter and positive futures for our youth. The uh, schools involved in my electorate of the great electorate of Bass, the schools involved in this program were Brooks High School, Kings Meadows High School, City Campus, Quichi High School, Winnelia District Schools. These young adults make a commitment to further education, training or employment. This, I commend this program and look forward to this generation making a positive difference for themselves and their communities. Question, you can do it. Okay. In accordance, oh, well done. In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has concluded. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Last Saturday, the 18th of August, was Vietnam Veterans Day. And this year, 50 years since Australia's war in Vietnam began, Vietnam Veterans Day is a particularly important day. 18 Australians died at Long Tan, but they did not die in defeat. Long Tan stands tall in our memory 
and Deputy Speaker, we do not forget. And its anniversary stands for every Australian who served and suffered in Vietnam. We remember them all every 18th of August. In 1969, on the third anniversary of that dreadful day, their mates remembered them. Many Australians will be familiar with the moving image of bare-chested diggers erecting a cross at the battle site. After the war, the long tan cross was removed from the site by the Vietnamese authorities, but they kept it safe. In 1989, in a remarkable gesture of remembrance and reconciliation, the Long Dat District People's Committee erected a replica cross on the original site. And this year, we are very grateful to the government of Vietnam for loaning the original Long Tan Cross to the Australian War Memorial. It is on display there today, and of course, it is a symbol of supreme sacrifice. Deputy Speaker, it is 50 years this year since the fateful decision to send Australian advisers to Vietnam. And it is 25 years since hundreds of thousands of Australians cheered and applauded tens of thousands of Vietnam veterans in the 1987 Welcome Home Parade. It was one of the Hawke government's finest days. I'm proud of everything our nation has done in the 25 years since to honour our Vietnam veterans of the haunting and magnificent Australian Vietnam Forces National Memorial on Anzac Parade right here in Canberra, of the work we have done to enable our veterans to visit the battlefields and places of Vietnam where they fought for us, of the Australian contribution to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which I opened last year. I am proud of everything the Vietnam generation of veterans is doing now to care for the ageing veterans who served before them. And I'm so proud of what the Vietnam generation of veterans is doing for the young veterans who are coming home now. They are literally caring for their fathers and they will care for their sons. Today, we remember them all and thank them for it all, lest we forget. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the words of the Prime Minister. And yes, uh, it's uh, 50 years now since the beginning of Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War, and uh, Saturday was the 46th anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan, uh, the largest single engagement involving Australians, a remarkable engagement where 100 members uh, of the Australian Army uh, defeated uh, at least 2,000. Viet Cong and North Vietnamese uh, regular army personnel. Uh, it was uh, a great victory. Uh, it was obviously uh, a tragic day, though. And, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is right that we remember the service and sacrifice of all who fought uh, in that conflict. We remember those killed and wounded in action. We also remember all of those who have suffered since as a result of their service. Uh, it's good that the Vietnamese government has made available the original Long, -term, the original long Tan Cross, and obviously, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would urge as many Australians as possible to visit the War Memorial uh, to view the cross uh, as an act of homage uh, to those who fought under our flag in that conflict. The Leader of the House. I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion to enable further statements on indulgence on Vietnam Veterans Day to be made in the Federation Chamber. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I move that further statements on indulgence on Vietnam Veterans Day be permitted in the Federation Chamber. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any questions? Oh, my apologies. The Prime Minister. Sorry. Well, one moment, Deputy Speaker. I inform the House that the Minister for Housing, Homelessness and Small Business will be absent from question time this week for personal reasons. The Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs will answer questions in relation to housing and homelessness and on behalf of the Minister for Human Services. The Assistant Treasurer will answer questions in relation to small business. Are there any questions with that notice? The member for North Sydney. Here, here. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
Will the Prime Minister guarantee a surplus of at least $1.5 billion this financial year and higher over the forward estimates, as promised in the budget just a few weeks ago? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, government will bring the budget to surplus this financial year, as promised. Uh, we will update all of the budget figures in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook, as is appropriate. Yeah. The member for North Sydney on a supplementary. How can the Prime Minister promise those surpluses, given her new promises for $2.1 billion on border protection, $10.5 billion a year for an NDIS, new spending of $26 billion on schools and $36 billion on submarines? Prime Minister, where's the money coming from? I'm, a, I'm assuming from the question that he is seeking an answer from the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I am uh, more than a little amazed to get this question of all questions from the Shadow Treasurer, who has admitted, even though he denies it now, who has admitted that the opposition has a $70 billion costing problem, and their only way of fixing that is to slash health, slash education, slash support to families, because that is what Liberals do. Uh, unlike uh, those opposite who always have their eyes on slashing health, the Leader of the Opposition has got form, slashing education, he's talked today about cutting funding to public schools. Instead of taking that approach, we will continue to take the responsible approach people have seen from us to date, uh, which is, as we work our way carefully through the government's budget, we have shown the ability to invest in the new uh, instruments of fairness that Australians want. We have shown our ability to do that whilst bringing the budget to surplus. To give just one example, we found room in the federal government's budget for a billion dollars for the National Disability Insurance Scheme launch sites. I take it from the Shadow Treasurer's question that the opposition is now out and proud and opposed to the NDIS. Uh, finally, they've come out and done that. We make the hard decisions to get these things done. The member for Canning, Solomon, figures that won't add up and the member who is out plans of to cut health and education and support for families. The member for North Sydney on the second supplementary. The member for North Sydney. Well, the prime no, the member for North Sydney because the clock just needs to be. The member for North Sydney now has the call. Will the prime minister now rule out the introduction of new taxes or levies, or the increase of existing taxes and levies to pay for big new promises in education, NDIS, submarines, and border protection? When the House is silent, the member for Cook promised better behaviour today. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And once again, I'm amazed to hear the Shadow Treasurer shouting about carbon taxes, given he is a very big supporter of putting a price on carbon on the record until he decided uh, that, for the purposes of appearance, he better pretend to be supporting the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, on the way in which we will fund the government's promises, let's be clear. Uh, we have a tax-to-GDP ratio which is less than the one we inherited uh, from the other side. That is, we are a lower taxing government than the government that the Shadow Treasurer was a member of. A lower taxing government, and we will continue to be a lower taxing government. As the Shadow Treasurer would be well aware, I have already dealt with these questions about taxes and levies in relation to the National Disability Insurance Sydney, Scheme. Uh, that is Prime on the public Minister record will and no amount of head tossing. The Prime Minister will resume her seat. The manager, when, when the benches behind the manager of opposition business are quiet, the manager of opposition on a point of order. On the point of order of direct relevance, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister was asked whether she would guarantee the ruling out any of opposition new taxes business or charges to pay for her spending. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. Money for people with disabilities and schools described as a spending spree. How offensive. Uh, the, purpose who, the person who was advocating a tax increase 
for the National Disability Insurance Scheme was Lim Liberal Premier Campbell Newman, right. and as is a matter of public record, I disagreed with him. As is a matter of public record too, company tax will always be higher Member under those opposite Sturt. than under us because of their tax on companies to pay for their paid parental leave scheme. So less tax, less company tax, a prudent budget, a surplus and a better deal for people with disabilities and better Australian schools. And the member for Sturt is warned. The member for Fraser has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. May I ask briefly your indulgence? In 1968, Peter Norman made a bold stand for racial equality. Would you be honoured in the motion in the House tonight? Uh, his sister Elaine, her husband Michael, and his 91 year old mother Thelma are with us in the gallery today. And I wanted to acknowledge them being here with us. The member for Fraser has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform the House of the government's plans to improve all our nation's schools? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for Fraser for his question. Today I had the opportunity to speak to the Independent Schools Association, and I very much welcomed it. I also had the opportunity to attend in front of Parliament House and to meet with public school advocates, principals from public schools and the Australian Education Union. So I've had a morning where I've had an opportunity to speak to great principals from independent schools and from public schools. And I have spoken to them about the determination I share with them to improve every school in this country because we want to see a better education for every child in this country. The government's reform agenda for Australian schools is about every child in every school. We have an opportunity now, after the work of the Independent Review Panel on Funding, to look at the question of funding for the first time in 40 years. But as I made it very clear when I spoke today to independent school principals, to public school principals, we intend to drive a school improvement agenda because we want every child in every school to have a better education and a better opportunity in life. And that is what our economy will require for the future. It is what fairness demands of us. Deputy Speaker, I was very, very disturbed Disturbed. In fact, I would say angered by the approach that the Leader of the Opposition has taken to this very important question. He too went to address the Independent Schools Forum, and what he told them is that public schools have got too much money. Just in case anybody missed the soundbite, he repeated it twice. The Leader of the Opposition thinks public schools have got too much money. And in case anybody thinks it's one of his periodic stumbles, these were prepared and scripted remarks that public schools have got too much money. The opposition is very, very fond of throwing around allegations about hit lists. Today it has been revealed that every public Member school Kenny, in this country is soon. in an opposition hit list on an opposition hit list and is slated for a reduction in funding. Every public school in this country is on their hit list and is due for a funding reduction. And we shouldn't be surprised when the member for Sturt has said he would take one in seven teachers out of classrooms and he's quite happy to see increases in class sizes. That's the difference between both sides of politics. Every child, every school, a better future. On that side, the politics of division and cutbacks for Australian public schools, bigger class sizes, less teachers and no one over there cares. The member for Goldstein, the Leader of the Opposition, has the call. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer her to this letter from Australian Country Choice that indicates that it is now paying a carbon charge of an extra 38 per cent for peak electricity and an extra 86 per cent for off-peak electricity. That's an extra $10,400 a week because of the introduction of the carbon tax. Why aren't businesses like this one being compensated for the Prime Minister's broken promise that there'll be no carbon tax under the government? I yeah, yeah, yeah. The 
Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And uh, to the answer to the leader of the opposition's question, he's had a bit of a morning this morning. He's not only gone out and threatened to cut every public stirred. school in this country. He's finally come clean on electricity prices, and he has said today. Uh, it's true that the carbon tax is not the only factor in the dramatic rise in power prices. Complete, you know, backflip uh, compared with his statements in the run into Parliament that everything else except carbon pricing was apparently a furphy. So the leader of the opposition has finally smacked into the reality that state liberals don't agree with him, experts don't agree with him, the regulators don't agree with him, members of his own team don't agree with him, and he's finally come clean that yes, the dramatic increases in power prices are not about carbon pricing, they are about the other actions. And so for the small business, her seat. the member for McKellar. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. In, on a point in of her order. wildest <laughs> dreams, that is not directly relevant to the question. The member asked for McKellar will resume the her seat. The member for McKellar. The member for McKellar is warned. Abuse of points of order have gone too far and will not be tolerated. The Prime Minister is answering the question. There was a range of issues canvassed in the question. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And of course, the level of abuse is always correlated with their lack of ideas. Uh, now, now that the, the Prime leader Minister of the opposition will be relevant to the question. Now, the now that the leader Sydney, of the opposition has admitted that it is the action of state governments and Dixon, others. Uh, it is uh, factors beyond carbon pricing that has led to dramatic increases in power prices. To his question and to the business that he talks about, presumably he will get that business on the phone and say that he, the leader of the opposition, now understands that that business the would have seen a 50 per cent increase in their power prices, nothing to do with carbon pricing. Presumably he has explained that to them now that the penny has dropped. Uh, presumably he would also explain to them that the impact on electricity prices is exactly as the government predicted it, that that means small businesses are in a position to pass those costs through because they are dealing with consumers who have had the benefit of tax cuts, family payment increases and pension increases. If the Leader of the Opposition is genuinely concerned about the circumstance of this business, instead of continuing his reckless fear campaign, what he would be doing now that he has admitted he was wrong in the run-up to Parliament and that there are other factors causing the rapid escalation in electricity prices, he would be working with the government and he would be instructing his state Liberal colleagues to do the same so that they come to December COAG ready to act on electricity prices. That's what he would do if he was interested in anything else except the reckless fear campaign. The Leader of the Opposition is seeking to table the document. An 86 per cent increase in power the prices the entirely as a result resume of the his carbon. Seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition the Leader of the Opposition needs to follow the rules given by the Chair, and the Manager of Opposition Business has indicated there is no leave to be granted. The member for Karengamite has the call. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is to the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth, and it follows on from the question posed to the Prime Minister earlier. What approach will the government take? And what principles will guide the government's plans to improve Australian schools? The Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth has the call. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for Karangamai for his question because central to this government's values and principles about education is recognising that all Australian students need to get support in the schools that they're in, regardless of where they live and regardless of how much money their parents earn. because a student can only live a fulfilling life if their education is good, and the country can only have a sustainable, productive economy if our education is good for our students. So this is right in the middle, smack bang in the middle, of what we as a government believe in. 
And you can see that commitment because of the pace of reform. We've seen more reform in education nationally than we've ever seen in our lifetime, whether it's the national curriculum, national professional standards for teachers, the My School website, the investment in every single school in modernised school facilities. Uh, this is all about investing in the future, and it's absolutely central to this Labor government's vision for Australia. And the next step for us is to continue that journey. And the Gonski findings of that panel that have been talked about are challenging for us because they show that between 2000 and 2009 our best students fell behind those in neighbouring countries. And they also find that there's a persistent gap, sometimes called the equity gap, between our top and bottom student achievers. We're leaving too many young Australians behind. And we're committed to delivering a national plan for school improvement that will benefit each and every school. It will focus on teacher quality, on funding the needs of students in those schools. And we do that on the basis of a record level of investment and the big reforms underway already. Now, I'm asked about the principles of education funding. They're our principles. But when I look to the other side of the House, Deputy Speaker, all I can see is the persistent, hardwired negativity of the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Minister. $2.8 billion worth of cuts on board, but not only that, no willingness to engage in this reform at all. The Shadow Minister dismissing the Gonski review within half an hour of its release. And then, when it comes to Gonski, I couldn't help but noticing that there are other members on the, on the opposition side, Deputy Speaker, who don't seem to have been listening to the Leader of the Opposition, particularly his speech today. So here we have the member for Bowman. And here it is. Andrew Lamming gives a Gonski. Andrew Lamming Minister. gives a Gonski. Well, I've got to say, I've got to say, Deputy Speaker, at least someone on that side of the House recognises the deficiencies in the approach of the Leader of the Opposition and the delinquency of the member for Sturt in the cavalier negative approach that they've taken to school funding. We understand that we need reform and investment. We're committed to national school improvement, and we will get on with this job now and in the future. Order. The member for Karangamite on a supplementary. I have a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, the minister has talked about improving schools across the country. What will this mean for schools and students in my electorate? The Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth has the call. Well, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, for the supplementary question. By the way, I seek leave to table uh, this photo of uh, Mr Lamming giving a gonski. He doesn't need to seek leave. He can just table the document. Uh, in, in respect of the question that the member has asked me, he, like members in this House, knows what investment this Labor government has provided in his electorate. We've got $103 million of projects benefited about 72 of his schools. He's got 9,000 families benefiting from the school kids bonus. He's got, he's got schools in his electorate, schools like Rokewood Primary School, Colac Secondary College, Trinity College, St Brendan's, all part of the national partnerships. The very national partnerships that the Leader of the Opposition this morning, speaking after the Prime Minister, actually thinks have received too much money. Now, we should pause and think about that for a moment, Deputy Speaker, because we understand the link between student fulfilment of their capacity and economic prosperity and education. We understand the targeted investment on the things that work, and in the case of the member for Karangamite, on teacher quality in his schools, on better resources for students, on making sure that schools have a national improvement plan that's integrated into what they're doing. All of these things will make a difference, and we know that's the case. But in order to do them, you've got to have a yes. conviction about education. That conviction exists on this side of the parliament. It's right at the heart of the Labor government's agenda for improving Australia's future. The minister's time has expired. Just before I call the member for Hughes, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Acting Minister for Manpower and Senior Minister of State, Ministry of National Development from the, from the Singaporean Parliament, Brigadier General Tan Chun Jin. On behalf of the House, I extend to him a very warm welcome. The member for Hughes. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I remind the Prime Minister that Ingleburn High School in Western Sydney has been hit with a carbon tax hike of $450 for just one month. 
with a teacher warning. So much for the carbon tax not having an impact. The money will have to come from funds otherwise allocated to students. Will the Prime Minister apologise to parents of Ingleburn High for promising them there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? The member for North Sydney is warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much. And I'm very glad that the member raises the question of how best to support schools. We are a government that has doubled the amount of funding going into school education. And as the member should know, because of the way the that Prime money Minister is indexed— The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister can't simply rephrase the question and answer a question she would have liked to have asked, like Joe the Manager of Opposition she Business was asked about the carbon will tax and not about the funding of schools. Seat. The Prime Minister has just commenced her answer. I will listen to her answer. The Prime Minister has the call. And as I was just about to say, the member who asked the question doubled the funding for school education. That funding is indexed. The way in which the index works is it takes into account increases like the increase flowing through, the 10 per cent increase flowing through for electricity prices into schools, taken into account in the index. I wonder if the member has ever got the New South Wales State Government on the phone and asked them about the impact of the 70 per cent increase in electricity prices that will have hit the school in his electorate. I wonder if he's ever done the that. The member for North Sydney also... and the member for Dixon will leave the chamber under 94A. They have both previously been warned. The Prime Minister has, and the member for North Sydney, was a double hit. Thank you. It's not my fault if you can't hear me because you're making so much noise. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. And I wonder whether the member who asked the question was embarrassed to stand alongside the Leader of the Opposition at the last election and promise to cut quality teaching money and promise to cut computers in schools and promise to cut trade training centres. And I wonder now whether the member is embarrassed to sit behind the Leader of the Opposition, who today has said to that public school that he's coming for it. Like Jack the Ripper, he is going to be there wielding his knife to cut money out of that the public Prime school. Minister That's will what he's promised today. Her seat. The manager of opposition business on a point other than relevant. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I have been past uh, times been asked to withdraw the reference to the Prime Minister as Lady Macbeth, and I would ask her to withdraw the reference to the Leader of the Opposition that she just made, which is offensive. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. I could actually not hear the reference the Prime Minister made as I was trying to get order back in the chamber. But to assist the House, I will ask the Prime Minister to withdraw. Uh, I withdraw, Deputy and The Prime Speaker. Minister has the call and will be heard in silence. And there are no further points of order on this question. The Prime Minister has the call. Deputy Speaker, to the member who asked the question, I wonder how he feels about sitting behind this Leader of the Opposition who is coming to that school to cut its funding. He has promised that today. And whatever label one wants to put on it, what that means is that that school would have less money for the education of children. The Leader of the Opposition, in his own words today, in a carefully scripted remark, has said that he is coming for public schools to cut back their funding. Every public school in this country, every parent who sends a child to a public school, every community member who cares about the quality of public education needs to know from today the Leader of the Opposition is coming for them, he's coming with cutbacks, he's coming to destroy the opportunity for those school children for a decent education and a decent the life. The member for Gippsland is warned. The member for Dobell has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. In 2007, I secured $20 million funding for five years for the important work of rejuvenating Tugra Lakes. 
Why on council, under the leadership of Mayor Bob Graham, match that funding and have been delivering the necessary work for the lakes? The five years is up soon. Will the government commit to continue funding the vital work needed to save Tugra Lakes? The Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities has the call. Thanks very much, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for Dobell for the question. Uh, Tugra Lakes has been an iconic project for many years across the Central Coast, and an area iconic not only for people on the Central Coast, but uh, it's, uh, you won't find too many people who've grown up in Sydney who haven't had many of their holidays up there, uh, gone, gone prawning in areas of, of Tugra Lakes, uh, and seen the magnificent seabirds, in particular the pelicans, but a series of endangered species there as well. The $20 million, the $20 million uh, commitment that the member for Dobell refers to uh, the, was put into two stages. The, the first was uh, about seven and a half, then there was a, a second stage. The first has been fully expended. Uh, the work's being done by Wyong Council. It feeds from two rivers, uh, the, uh, the, the Wyong and the Arimba. And uh, the work that's actually being done, led by the council there, is a whole lot of volunteers in part, hundreds of volunteers working on revegetating the area. You've got real problems in Tugra Lakes with uh, runoff and nutrients coming through the catchments down into, down into Tugra and the work of volunteers that's been led by the council, and he, he mentions Bob Graham there, has been work that has made a real difference in the water quality uh, and the native vegetation of the area. Uh, I understand there are two payments, I think two milestone payments still to be made, uh, and all the advice that I've received is that they remain on track to be made. The member, I think the next one is due in September. Uh, the member also asks about future funding for Tugra Lakes, and it's something that he's raised uh, in question time today, previously in the parliament, and has raised directly with me. Uh, Tugra Lakes is an area where uh, the funding has been coming out of Caring for Our Country. Members may be aware that Caring for Our Country has finished its first five years and the review is taking place to determine the future of Caring for Our Country and the exact way that will be configured. The funding review submissions for that closed about three or four days ago. Uh, so it won't be long before the government's in a position to be able to make announcements about the exact uh, nature of caring for our country, which programs it gets broken up to uh, into the future. But I've got to say, looking at the progress over the last five years, Tugra Lakes has been one of the great success stories of the project. It's been a great example of community engagement and a great example of a substantial environmental improvement in something that's iconic to the people of Central Coast and beyond. The member for Blair has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the current strength of our economy and why it's important to keep investing in skills and infrastructure to keep the economy strong? Here, here. The Treasurer has the call. Yes, I uh, thank the member for Blair for that very important question because our economy does walk tall in the world. It is 10 per cent bigger than it was prior to the global financial crisis uh, and it is stronger than any, every other major developed economy. We've seen something like the creation of eight hundred thousand jobs in the period this government has been in office. A remarkable outcome given what is going on elsewhere in the world. But also we've seen really strong private business investment. Private business investment has grown by 20 per cent to be at its highest percentage of GDP in something like 40 years. And of course there is a really strong pipeline of investment in resources as well. That advanced pipeline of resources investment has grown by nearly $90 billion in the past year alone. So this investment, this private investment, along with all of the public investment that the government has been making in infrastructure, but also in skills and education more broadly, is what strengthens our economy. It gives us the resilience we need to meet the challenges of the future. The fundamental investment that drives the strength of our economy as we go forward, because these investments have been put in place. And of course, we do need to reverse this decade long decline in productivity which we inherited from the other side of politics. And that is why we are investing in these areas which they refuse to invest in. And as the Reserve Bank said, 
their failure to invest in these areas led to something like 10 interest rate rises in a row. We are committed to investing in education. We are committing, committed to investing in infrastructure because we understand that if you invest in the future, you strengthen future prosperity. We want to build our economy up, and those Liberals on the other side simply want to tear it down. We've got a $3 billion skills package. We've got a huge increase in the number of people in tertiary education. And we've doubled our investment in, in infrastructure, road, rail and port. This is all driving growth and productivity. So we have a plan for the future to support jobs, whereas those on the opposite, on the opposite side of this House don't have a plan to do that. They have a plan to do the reverse, because the shadow finance minister let the cat out of the bag up at Hayman Island the weekend before last. He said the opposition wasn't going to make the mistake that John Hewson had made, where he put out all the fine detail of slashing and burning in health and education. They weren't going to put that out as they went to the next election. They were going to do a Campbell Newman and hide it from the Australian people, the impact on jobs, the impact on education, a hidden agenda from those opposite to slash and cut and burn health and education and to cut away the productive base of the Australian economy. We'll support working families. They have nothing the but contempt for them. The time has expired. The member for Casey has the call. Thank you very much. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the statement of Pat Italiano, owner of Essendon Fruit Supply in the electorate of Maribyrnong, who said with regard to the carbon tax, we are trying to absorb the costs as much as we can, but it's a real slap in the face and making things much harder. Can the Prime Minister explain to Mr Italiano and every other small business owner across Australia why they won't receive a cent of compensation for the world's biggest carbon tax. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and to the uh, member for Casey. Uh, it may be it may be that the example he quotes was an example used in one of today's newspapers. I've seen some of those reports, uh, and in some of those reports we have uh, prices uh, referred to, uh, like tomatoes, going up from five dollars a kilo a couple of weeks ago to eight eight dollars ninety nine a kilo now. Uh, I would say to this House, and I would say to people reading those. Newspapers, Newspapers. If there is anyone in this country who is representing that that increase is anything to do with carbon pricing, then people should ring the ACCC and get that addressed, because that is clearly wrong and meant to deceive and mislead. Uh, for the real circumstances of small business, small businesses do not pay the carbon price. That is paid by the big polluters who generate the most carbon pollution. We have always said that some, some of those costs the would be passed is through uh, to small businesses, particularly in the form of an increase in electricity. And we've talked very clearly with the Australian community about us predicting a 10 per cent increase in household electricity bills, for example, an increase of $3.30 a week on average, and that is why we have provided assistance of $10.10 a week on average. To the small business involved, what I would therefore say is that small business is dealing with consumers who have received tax cuts, family payment increases and pension increases, because our anticipation was that small businesses would pass these modest price impacts on. And when we're talking about modest price impacts, uh, let's remember that the uh, Treasury modelling, which has proved accurate on things like electricity prices, says that the impact overall will be 0.7 per cent of CPI, that is less than a cent in a dollar. Uh, now, to the member who may have a genuine concern about price impacts for this small business, I presume he is talking to them about the price impacts uh, flowing from electricity increases that have absolutely nothing to do with carbon pricing. Now that the Leader of the Opposition has admitted that there are dramatic power price increases, nothing to do with carbon pricing, uh, the member should feel empowered to have a frank conversation about the facts. You no longer have to go around pretending uh, in order to be loyal to the Leader of the Opposition that this is all about carbon pricing. Today he's given the game away and he's pointed to the other sources of big power bills, and I trust the member who asked the question will do precisely that to the small business involved. 
The member for Capricorn. Capricorn uh, thank you, Deputy Capricorn. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Minister update the House on the government's record investments in nation building infrastructure? How are these helping to rebuild the Bruce Highway? And are there any recent observations that confirm the benefit of these investments? The Minister for Infrastructure and Transport has the call. I thank the member for Capricornia for her question. Of course, this federal Labor government has continued to roll out our record, our record nation building program, doubling the roads budget, increasing the rail budget by more than 10 times, and committing more to urban public transport than all governments combined since Federation. And in addition to that, we're committed to spreading the benefits of the mining boom. That's why we've established the $6 billion Regional Infrastructure Fund. And I'm asked about the Bruce Highway, which has benefited from both our nation-building program and the Regional Infrastructure Fund. And recently, as the Leader of the Nationals uh, interjected, he embarked on the equivalent of the uh, National uh, Lampoon's vacation. He went, up, he, he went up the north coast, up the Bruce Highway. And as he went up the Bruce Highway with his National Party family all loaded up there in the car, the member for Gippsland was there and the people over there who were not sure what seat they're from, but that mob over there, that mob over there, they all loaded into the car. Someone on the roof strapped in, going there having a look at the work that's taking place on the Bruce Highway. And as the leader of the National Party left his seat going up north, he would have hit the Corrida Curra section the section in which he said was the worst road in Australia. He said that and he should have known. He was not only the local member, he was the transport minister at the time and did nothing about it. But he would have seen the work underway that will be completed and opened at the end of last year. And when he hit the member for Capricornia's seat, he would have seen the work that's taking place on the Yepin Lagoon Bridge and Roundabout. $40 million coming from the Regional Infrastructure Fund that he would abolish. If they had got their timing right, they could have been with me and the member for Herbert when we opened the $110 million Douglas Arterial. He could have asked the member for Herbert what he thought, because he said this, I'll give Labor a pat on the back and say they have spent more in their four or five years on the Bruce Highway than we did before. That is what the member for Herbert had to say. So throughout his journey, he could have seen the work that's underway, including the $210 million from the Regional Infrastructure Fund. We've spent $2.8 billion over six years. He spent $1.3 billion over 12 long years. So it's no wonder. But as they got to Cairns, as they got to Wally World, their final destination, he got asked, what are you committing? They spent a week, the whole of the LNP, in strapped in this car on the roof when they got to the end. Not one cent of additional funding. Not one single cent of additional funding from those opposite. The member, the member for Capricorn, you're on a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, you've talked about building infrastructure in my home state of Queensland. Why is it important for us to have bipartisan support for this infrastructure, and is the minister aware of any risks to this support? The Minister for Infrastructure and Transport has the call. I, I can assist the member for Capricornia <laughs> with her very good question, because uh, we have committed some $8.7 billion for Queensland as part of the nation building program. $8.7 billion. And in addition to that, we've made additional commitments from the Regional Infrastructure Fund, $430 million in Queensland alone so far that those opposite have promised to get rid of in order to give Gina and Clive a tax cut. That is their position. That is their position. So I was particularly disturbed this morning with the member for Dawson who had this to say about the Peak Downs Highway and his electorate and the $120 million commitment. He said this, it's something that I want to look at, you know, down the track if the Liberal National Coalition get into government. So there it is. They want to cut schools funding for those wealthy public schools around the country. 
the Leader of the Opposition has made that clear, and they want to cut funding, cut funding through the Regional Infrastructure Fund. And indeed, that stands in stark contrast with the Leader of the National Party, who has said at other times that mining companies aren't putting enough back into the local communities. Well, the Gateway WA project, Gladstone Port Access Road, Black Soils Interchange, Townsville Ring Road, all of those are under threat if you get rid of the Regional Infrastructure Fund, because you've the got to say where the money's coming from. Has... <laughs> and the member for Sturt has just committed an own goal, and he will remove himself from the chamber under 94A. Persistent interjection will not be tolerated. The member for Murray has the call. I, I thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to Geoffrey Thompson Holdings, an apple and pear grower and cool store operator in my electorate, whose latest electricity bills show a new item, carbon charges. I stress carbon charges of $23,000 for the month of July alone. $23,000. This new carbon tax cannot be passed on and there is no compensation. How does this government expect a 60-year-old business to survive and the 400 regional jobs preserved? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and to the uh, member who raises the question. Uh, as the member would be aware, we uh, have always said that carbon pricing, the price would be paid by the big polluters. There would be a flow-through impact on electricity pricing. Uh, and the member uh, yelling out is agreeing with me, I see. Uh, that uh, we've been very clear the about what Menzies. that impact would be, and the modelling has been proved to be right. And for small businesses who were not, uh, who are not required uh, to directly pay the carbon price, who are not required to fill in any additional forms, uh, unlike the paperwork burden that came their way with the Howard government's GST. They don't pay the carbon price. They don't fill in additional forms. They will see some flow-through flow impacts for things like electricity prices, which is why we have put consumers in a position that they can pass that on. And consumers are there with their tax cuts, their family payment increases, and their the pension increases. I'd say to the member who asked the question, uh, what has she said to this business about the large electricity prices? The member for Canning. Um, and she, she may well have said that, but I hope she's also said uh, that the Leader of the Opposition today has now acknowledged that the biggest impact on electricity prices is not carbon pricing. Uh, so, uh, having finally moved from a position that everyone knew to be ridiculous uh, when he tried to pretend that all electricity that price word. increases uh, were somehow the fault of carbon pricing. He was repudiated by state Liberals, repudiated by his front bench, repudiated by the regulators. So today he's actually acknowledged that there are other sources of power price increases. What does the member, on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, say to the small business involved about that? I would be in a position to say that we will drive change at the Council of Australian Governments meeting at the end of this year. Is the member in a position to say that this Leader of the Opposition will get Ted Bailey on the phone and Barry O'Farrell on the phone and Campbell Newman on the phone and say it's about time that the Liberals worked with us to address these electricity price increases the at the end of this year. Resume her seat. The member for Murray on a point of order. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I specifically in the question asked to address what this company is going to be able to do, what she's going to tell them when the 400 the jobs are lost. Murray will resume her seat. The Prime Minister is answering the call. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I'm not going to join the member in this fear campaigning, and if she's genuinely interested in this business, she would be looking at costs from all sources, including the bigger electricity costs flowing from other sources than carbon pricing. If she's not doing that, she's not serious about this business or the 400 jobs she's talking about, and I think her constituents would be very interested to know she's not serious about 400 jobs in her electorate. The member for Murray is seeking to table a document. 
bills which identify the carbon charges for the month of July Member alone. Member resume her seat. Is leave granted? The manager, the leader of the house. Could the leader of the house come to the dispatch box, please? The leader of the house. No, deputy speaker. They don't. When they get the things the tabled, they don't table them. His seat. The member for Wannan. The member for Deakin has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Industry and Innovation. How have financial markets factored in the impact of the carbon price on inflation? How does this compare with the predictions that were made before the carbon price came in? The member for Mayo is warned. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency has the call. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for Deakin for his question. Because underlying inflation is actually at a 13-year low, and the carbon price will have quite a small impact on inflation. And we've stated many times in this place that the Treasury modelling found that the impact on the CPI would only be 0.7 per cent in financial year 2012-13. That's less than one cent in a dollar, and certainly much less than the CPI impact of the introduction of the GST, which was 2.5 per cent. And it's nothing like the hysterical claims made by the Leader of the Opposition of unimaginable price increases. Far from it. The carbon price has now been in place for approximately seven weeks, and during this time TD Securities' inflation gauge has shown that the overall inflation impact during the first month of the carbon price was just 0.2 per cent. That is, in July, just 0.2 per cent, one-fifth of one cent. And there's certainly no unimaginable price increase in that, as claimed by the Leader of the Opposition, and nothing to support the ridiculous three-page beat-up today in the Daily Telegraph. But we've also seen in the past week an analysis of inflation expectations on financial markets from financial markets, and this confirms the Treasury modelling. Investors, of course, when considering these issues, back their predictions up with their money, and they are saying that the impact on, of carbon pricing on inflation will be in the order of 0.6 to 0.7 per cent. Bang on the Treasury modelling. Now, in the face of all of these facts, in the face of all of this evidence that is mounting, what does the coalition resort to as part of its mendacious, ridiculous, hysterical fear campaign? They resort to exhorting people to price gouge. And there's a classic example. A refrigerant company, Equipserve, has been pinged by the ACCC after it replicated a statement, in effect, made by the shadow industry minister, the member for Indi. She wrongly attributed increases in refrigerant gas prices to the carbon price, the entirety of the increase to the carbon price. The very same statements that were found in breach of the consumer laws and that led to the giving of an enforceable undertaking by that company to the ACCC. This is the conduct they engage in. They go around misrepresenting, making ridiculous, deceitful claims, encouraging businesses to price gouge, to price gouge. The meat industry, the meat industry has had to disown the silly leaflet that the opposition has put out. Their whole campaign Minister is a fraud Tom and their claim to repeal it is also a The member for Indi is denying her colleague the call. The member for Dawson has the call. Mr. Deputy Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to the statement by the Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Change in a carbon tax debate last week that, quote, farmers will not pay a cent. How does she reconcile his statement with this letter from a tomato farmer in Bowen that shows Vizzy will increase the annual bill for cardboard boxes used on it? his family-run tomato farm by more than $12,000 due to the carbon tax. The Prime Minister has the call. 
Uh, thank you very much. And to the member who asked the question, the parliamentary secretary would have been making the simple point that it is only big businesses that generate a lot of carbon pollution, thousands and thousands of tonnes of carbon pollution, and indeed 25,000 tonnes or more of carbon pollution that pay the carbon price. That's the uh, point he would have been uh, drawing out in that debate. Uh, to the member who is continuing his Anyone question after a series Claire. of questions today, uh, what we are seeing today is a, you know, opposition determined to continue its fear campaign, even though day by day by day the facts are proving this fear campaign wrong. Why Alan was going to be wiped off the map? That's wrong. Price rises were going to be unimaginably large. That's wrong. Electricity bills were going to skyrocket. Even the Leader of the Opposition has had to acknowledge that was wrong today. We can see. The member for Cowper has the call. The member for Cowper has the call. An increase in the cost of cardboard boxes of $12,000 due to the carbon tax. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, to uh, the member who asked the question, uh, num num number one, of course, we'd be checking the assertions in the question when they come from the opposition. We need to. Uh, number two, of course, I've described on more than one occasion in question time today the circumstances of small business. And number three, the continuation of this fear campaign today in the face of the facts. I think is, is uh, because the Leader of the Opposition this morning and his opposition team are now desperate to distract from his pledge this morning to cut the funding to every public school in the nation, because he doesn't want to uh, have public debate focused on his cuts to public schools. Here we go with the fear campaign and the ridiculous points. The member for McKellar, the member for McKellar has the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would refer you to page 519 of the practice, and I would refer you to Standing Order 91, which says, where a member is persistently and willfully refusing to conform to the standing order, as is the Prime Minister, her behaviour is disorderly. Yeah. And I would ask you to just say that she is disorderly in her, her refusal seat. to comply. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I'm making the very simple point. We continue to see the fear campaign despite the facts, and the fact that they want to distract from today is their plan to cut public schools. The member for Dawson is seeking to table a document. Yes, I seek leave to table a letter, which also states never have we seen such a dud government before. The member for Dawson. The member for Dawson will leave the chamber under 94A. Abuse of points of order are now out of control. The behaviour of the opposition and the complete disregard of the standing orders by the majority of the opposition is also on display. The member for Petrie has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment. Will the Minister update the House on the government's plan to create national parks in Commonwealth waters, and what information is the community being given during the current consultation phase? The Minister for Environment has the call. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Petrie for the question. Member for Petrie has been talking to me for some time about the importance of making sure that we got the balance right in the marine national parks proposals, to make sure that we took account of the recreational fishers who were very strong in her electorate without in any way compromising the strong environmental outcomes that we could achieve. What we ended up with was a proposal, particularly down that east coast pathway, Deputy Speaker, was one that met those requirements precisely, one where we were able to become, as a nation, the world leader in ocean protection, a situation where we were as a nation whenever we were given a choice to deliver the same environmental outcome but minimise the, out, the impact on recreational fishers, we took that option. Wherever we could get the same environmental outcome and minimise the impact on commercial fishers, we took that option. That's why the Coral Sea, for example, which I've previously described, 
as the jewel in the crown of the whole, whole proposal is one where the highest level of protection is in the areas furthest out. But in the areas that are closer, between the Great Barrier Reef and where the beginning of the Coral Sea is, you have one area of particularly high value for uh, commercial fishes, which is reserved where trawl is allowed. You've got an area in the north of that Coral Sea area, closer to uh, that entire central band, open to recreational fishing, and in the southern part of it, also open to longliners, to make sure that we got that balance in being able to deliver the environmental outcome, but in a way that minimised the outcome that minimises the challenges that might be otherwise there for the rec or commercial sectors. That's why I was surprised to see that part of the material being distributed during the current consultation phase, Deputy Speaker, uh, involves a leaflet. Uh, I'm not sure what sort of image this is trying to invoke, but uh, a symbol of fish and chips wrapped in the Australian flag. And, and then the Coral Sea Reserve not described as it is in the draft maps, but the entire thing, Deputy Speaker, described as a no-go zone, the entire Coral Sea. This leaflet can only be described as nothing other the leaflet is a lie. The leaflet is nothing other— The minister th can't use that word. About a leaflet? About a leaflet. You can't use the, the standing orders for everybody's benefit. For everybody's benefit, the standing orders, the only word that is truly unparliamentary is lied. You can use another word, but not that one. The minister must withdraw. No, no, that's fine. No, the minister must so, withdraw. Yeah, sorry, I withdraw. I withdraw, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Speaker. The, I just did. The map that is there is entirely incorrect. It is trying to do one thing, and that is mislead the people of Queensland and nothing more. It is authorised by Queensland LNP Senator Sue Boyce. It is put out as fake information to deceive Queenslanders, which the Leader of the Opposition should himself disown. The member for Ryan has the call. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to this electricity bill from Michael Fay in my electorate that clearly states the carbon tax has increased his cheapest rate of electricity by 30 per cent. With an electricity bill that has now climbed to over $3,000 a year, will the Prime Minister apologise to Mr Fay and his family and the millions of Australian households who will now be worse off because of this toxic carbon tax? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And once again, we see the fear campaign continue. Uh, the member who asked the question may want to explain to that business the impact of the 50 and 60 per cent increases that people have seen in electricity prices in Queensland, nothing to do with the carbon price. And the Leader of the Opposition today has acknowledged that there are dramatic increases in electricity, nothing to do with the carbon price. Uh, so the member mightn't like the facts. The leader of the opposition might have been dragged kicking and screaming to the facts, but they the are Prime the Minister facts. The minister will resume her seat. The member for Ryan on a point of order. Point of order, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a household. It's not a business. The Prime, and I'd the like member the Prime for Ryan will resume her that. seat. There is no additional debate, but if clarification was given, the Prime Minister has the call. Okay. Uh, I, I the misunderstood and thought the member not was assisting. referring to a business, but uh, what I've just said is correct for businesses that the big increases they've seen in power prices in Queensland come from other areas, mm -hmm. uh, not the carbon price, uh, and the Leader of the Opposition has acknowledged that there are other sources of dramatic increases in power bills today. For a family, uh, what we have always said for Australian families is that they would see a 10 per cent increase in their electricity bill. Uh, and uh, That uh, has been acknowledged as the regulators as right, that they will see a 10 per cent increase in their electricity bill, a 10 per cent increase in what they pay. And because they will see that 10 per cent increase, which on average for families is $3.30 a week, we have provided, on average, assistance of $10, 10 a week in the form of tax cuts, in the form of pension increases and in the form of family payment increases. These are the facts, and no amount of fear campaigning changes those facts. And No amount of fear campaigning today will distract from the Leader of the Opposition's plan to cut funding to every public school in the member for Ryan's electorate. The member for Wakefield has the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. 
Uh, my question is to the Minister for Regional Australia, Regional Development, Local Government and the Arts. How is the government supporting communities across, across Australia uh, through the regional Wakefield development? Will resume his seat. The Leader of the House on a point of order. I hesitate to interrupt uh, my friend, the member for Wakefield, <coughs> but the Leader of the Opposition should withdraw the interjections that he persistently makes across the chamber along the lines in which you have insisted be withdrawn. The Leader of the Opposition will withdraw without qualification. I withdraw. I thank the Leader of the it's Opposition. Still an the member, statement. the Leader of the Opposition will remove himself from the chamber under 94A and to continually ignore that the member for McKellar, the member, the Leader of the Opposition has now been advised by the chair on more than one occasion that I asked you as you approached the dispatch box to do it without qualification, you could not help yourself. The Leader of the Opposition will, withdraw, will leave the chamber on 94A. The member for Wakefield has the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister for Regional Australia, Regional Development, Local Government and the Arts. How is the government supporting communities across the country through the Regional Development Australia Fund, including the Mid-North region in my electorate? What are the government's future plans for the Regional Development Fund? The Minister for Regional Australia, Regional Development, Local Government and the Arts has the call. I thank the uh, member for Wakefield for his question and his commitment to regional ge development generally, but particularly in his electorate. The Regional Development Australia Fund that he refers to is an important uh, commitment on the part of this government, a billion dollar fund over its term to assist regions make economic and social uh, infrastructure adjustments. In the members' uh, seat recently, in round two, we were able to ensure the funding now of the Wakefield Auburn pipeline. This Deputy, um, Madam, Deputy, Madam Speaker, is a water infrastructure initiative and it is essential to ensuring the development of housing as well as farmland expansion in that area. Without this investment, the housing and the farmland development would not have taken place. The farmland development is very important to support the continued growth of the poultry industry in his electorate. So you can see that this has both social as well as economic impact. Our approach, of course, is stronger regions equal a stronger nation, and that's why we are committed to strengthening regions in our country across the country. This was one of seven programs funded in South Australia in the second round and 46 in the, uh, over, over the country. A new culture has developed. We've gotten away from the rorts that personified regional development under the previous government to a culture of genuine partnership. In fact, the $200 million that we funded in this second round leveraged $800 million, so the multiplier is four to one. We've got a lot in this round that persisted, who, not got knocked off in, who didn't get up in the first round, but persisted in making their projects stack up and they got supported as well as the fact that they paid attention not just to where this proposal would be located but the wider regional significance. Now, I'm also asked about the future of this fund, Deputy, um, Madam Speaker. The future of this fund under us is now secured because we have secured passage of the Minerals Resource Rent Tax, a means by which we want to spread the benefits of the mining booth boom to the rest of regional Australia to ensure that they get their fair share. So under us, there will be more rounds. There will be three more rounds. But as to the future, Ms. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, these rounds would not go ahead if those opposite were in government, because they are committed to abolishing the tax and therefore the means by which they fund this proposal. Now, the challenge on the other side is to either be honest with the Australian electorate and say that you're going to keep the tax or to tell us where you're going to get the money from the to fund a program that is expired. benefiting regions. The minister's time had 
expired. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The member for Boothby has indicated he has a personal explanation. The member for Boothby has. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On three occasions. Does the member for Boothby claim to be misrepresented? I seek leave to make a personal explanation, Ex Madam Deputy Speaker. Does the minister? It's been a long question time. My apologies. Does the member for Boothby claim to be misrepresented? Uh, yes, I have. On, the member on, for Boothby has the call. On three occasions, the Leader of the House has made an assertion that last week, in tabling the electricity bills from the Blair Hotel, I, I tabled something other than that which I said I would. I was very clear. I sought leave to table the electricity the accounts House. of January 2012 and July 2012 of the Belair Hotel, and that is exactly what I tabled. Hansard will confirm that, and the, uh, and the tabling office uh, will confirm that. And the assertion by the Leader of the House is quite simply false. The member for Boothby. Responding. No, the member for Boothby cannot ex cannot respond to interjections. The Leader of the House is not assisting the Chair. The Leader of the House has the call. Trying to help, Deputy They're Speaker, not. as always. The Leader of the House has and a the document call. is tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I move the House take note of the document. Full the details question is, the of question the document will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. The question is the document's been noted. The member for Cowper. Move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I have received advice from the Chief Government Whip that he has nominated Ms Griggs to be a member of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Capital of Territories in place of Mr Secker, the Leader of the House. I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion for the appointment of a member to serve on the Joint Standing Committee on the National Capital and External Territories. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Minister. I move that Mr Secker be discharged from the Joint Standing Committee on the National Capital and External Territories and that in his place Mrs Griggs be appointed a member of the committee. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I have received a message from the Senate returning the Higher Education Support Amendment Student Contribution Amounts and Other Measures Bill 2012 without amendment. The member for Petrie. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I present the report of the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interests concerning the possible unauthorised disclosure of the internal proceedings of the committee, and I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, the member for Petrie has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, on 24 May 2012, I raised in the House a matter of privilege concerning the apparent unauthorised disclosure of the internal proceedings of the committee's private meeting held on the previous night. The disclosure was in articles by Ms Michelle Grattan on the, in the online version of The Age and in the print edition of The Age on 24 May 2012. In my statement, I expressed disappointment about the disclosure, particularly in light of the discussion the committee had about the importance of confidentiality in the committee's consideration of the sensitive issues it was inquiring into. I indicated that the committee would pursue the matter internally and report back to the House as necessary. I am now reporting back on behalf of the committee. Deputy Speaker, the committee has examined this matter in a way consistent with the approach it has advocated for all committees that experience unauthorised disclosures. The committee has been unable to obtain evidence that might reveal the source or sources of the disclosure. Each member of the committee and each secretariat staff member has signed a statutory declaration to the effect that they did not disclose the internal proceedings of the meeting of 23 May 2012 to any person who was not authorised to be made aware of those proceedings. In addition, the committee asked the journalist involved, Ms Michelle Grattan, to appear and give evidence in relation to any information she could provide about the source of the disclosure. In her evidence to the committee, Ms Grattan confirmed she was the author of the two articles in question. She also declined to discuss any, for any matters to do with her sources. Deputy Speaker, in relation to the impact of the disclosure, the committee considers that the particular circumstances make this matter very serious. 
The meeting from which the disclosure appears to have taken place was the first meeting of the committee after the referral of an inquiry by the House into a matter of great sensitivity. The committee also explicitly discussed at that meeting the importance of confidentiality in relation to its proceedings during the course of the inquiry. The disclosure, therefore, has been damaging to the committee. The committee makes no formal findings on this matter as to has, has not been able to identify the source of the disclosure. However, the committee has a number of observations and makes two recommendations to the House. On a number of occasions, the committee has expressed its frustration about inquiries it has conducted into unauthorised disclosures of committee information. These, of course, have been inquiries into disclosures from other committees, not an inquiry into a disclosure from the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interests itself, but the issues are the same. In earlier reports, the committee has acknowledged the difficulty that can be faced in seeking to ascertain the sources of disclosures. Those guilty are unlikely to identify themselves, and the media representatives can be expected to claim that their professional code of ethics prevents them from re revealing the identity of such sources. The person or persons who disclose information from committee proceedings are the most culpable in these matters. However, the committee reiterates the view it has expressed before it that it is also important that where it is necessary to do so, there is a willingness to proceed against those who knowingly publish material. The committee recommends, as it has in earlier reports, that the House adopt a resolution relating to unauthorised disclosure. In addition to the terms previously recommended resolutions, the committee has added specific provisions relating to the publication of unauthorised material and the implications for journalists and the media. The adoption of the resolution will make it clear to journalists and the media which publish unauthorised information that publication is, of itself, potentially a contempt which can be punished by the House with appropriate sanctions. In addition to the resolution, the committee also recommends that changes be made to the process for the approval of parliamentary press gallery passes to require the pass holder to be aware of the prohibition of unauthorised disclosure of committee proceedings and also that, as part of the approval and renewal processes, the pass holder is informed that a breach can result in sanctions. The committee also notes that there is a role for the Press Gallery Committee, which sponsors the passes of members of the gallery, to advise new members to the gallery about their responsibilities. Deputy Speaker, having concluded my remarks on the committee's report, I wish to make some very brief remarks about two matters concerning the register of members' interests that were raised with the committee by the manager of opposition business and the leader of the House. They concerned the matters, the statements of interest of the member for Dabell and the member for Hughes. The committee has considered the matters raised and has obtained information from the members concerned. The committee has concluded that there are no grounds for it to take further actions. Deputy Speaker, I wish to conclude by just thanking the Secretariat for their assistance in preparing the report and their ongoing work with the committee and also the committee members and the Deputy Chair of the Privileges and Members' Interest Committee. The member for Barker is seeking leave to add to the statement. The leave is granted. The member for Barker has the call. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I support the, um, the words of the chair. I think she has summarised the report quite extensively, and so I have very little to add. But I uh, will raise the issues of Appendix B in the report. Uh, one B that a committee concerning uh, with a complaint or unauthorised disclosure or publication has been made must consider whether the matter has caused cause substantial interference with its work. And I think the words of substantial interference is always going to be the problem of defining what is substantial uh, or not. Um, and I suspect this one might not fall on that, but again, it is up to argument. In Appendix C, I believe we have also got a problem with, uh, with E Part 1. Um, because in E it suggests that in considering complaints in, the, in this area and notwithstanding the provisions of Standing Order 51, the Speaker should not allow precedence to a motion on such matters unless, in the light of the information presented to the Speaker, he or she is of the opinion, part one, that there is sufficient evidence that will enable the Committee of Privileges and Members' interest to ascertain the source or sources of the disclosure. 
Uh, we have found through this process that is almost impossible and that may need looking at uh, by uh, one of the procedure committees uh, uh, in the future because I think that almost uh, in every case deletes the possibility uh, of precedence being given to that motion. Thank the member. The clerk. Government business order of the day number five, illegal pro logging prohibition bill 2011, further consideration in detail. The parliamentary secretary. Yes, uh, thanks very much. So just uh, in conclusion of my uh, remarks uh, in uh, reference to the amendment moved by the member for Clare, um, the government does not accept uh, those amendments for the reason that I have given. Thank you. The question is, in the amendment moved by the member for Clare be agreed to, the member for Clare has the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I rise to speak again in lieu of the, the government's comment on our, uh, uh, on our amendment, on the coalition's amendment. We, uh, we are committed to addressing uh, the trade in illegally sourced timber and tim timber products, uh, and, and I, uh, and I uh, underline the fact that it was our policy at the last election. Deputy Speaker, everything I've heard underlines the fact we all agree the need for action is driven by a number of issues, including environmental concerns regarding indiscriminate or poorly logged uh, control logging activities. In addition, under the current legislative regime, the Australian forest sector, which is globally recognised for its forest management regulation and practices, suffers a competitive disadvantage through compliance costs borne locally that are not observed by illegal loggers. So, Deputy Speaker, uh, I don't think there's any argument the intent of the bill is well placed. But not surprisingly, not at all surprisingly, the government has again bungled the delivery of the policy on, uh, on a policy in which both sides uh, of politics agree. And specifically, Deputy Speaker, the government has bungled on the consultation process, a flawed consultation process which has lent, uh, led to concerns amongst significant trading partners, no less than four of whom have voiced concerns. And, and Deputy Speaker, our biggest, our most important near neighbour, Indonesia, which uh, I think probably have reason to uh, be a little wary of policy uh, on trade from this government, uh, have voiced them. And the Ministry of Trade for the Republic of Indonesia, in a submission, Deputy Speaker, in a submission to the Joint Committee of Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade on this bill, stated the negative impact on trade should also not be underestimated, bearing in mind that timber products commonly have long and complex chains of supply with mixed sources from different locations and different kinds of timber. Deputy Speaker, Indonesia have correctly, and with regard to due process, made a submission and, it, and they say it is for this reason. It is for this reason that the government of Indonesia had recommended the deferral of legislation until 2015 to provide time to ensure the legislation will not have the unintended consequences that will unnecessarily harm the mutual trade between our two nations. Furthermore, the three years of adjournment will provide time for proper consultation between both countries, including detail, clarification, as well as period of adjustment for the Indonesian producers, exporters to comply, to comply, Deputy Speaker, with the regulation. Now, this brings to mind, to me, issues which Indonesia have had experience of of lack of consultation. I think it's a thing called the live cattle trade in which not only was there uh, insufficient consultation, I believe none at all. They had to read in the newspaper about Australia's decision uh, to suspend exports to their biggest trading partner in that, uh, in that realm. Deputy Speaker, this again shows complete arrogance on the behalf of this government to snub our dearest trading partners in the same way 
as I said, they did with a live export ban. It is not reasonable for the government to bring these measures into law without giving our trading partners, our domestic timber industry and timber importers, the time they were promised that they were promised to design and implement, implement appropriate systems. In, in, moving, in moving this amendment, Deputy Speaker, while at the same time wanting to uh, ensure Australia only imports timber from proper sources, I want to repeat what Indonesia, our nearest, our biggest and without doubt our most important neighbour said, it is for this reason that the government of Indonesia has recommended the deferral of the legislation until 2015 to provide time to ensure the legislation will not have unintended consequences that will unnecessarily harm the neutral trade between our two nations. Thank you. The question is, the amendment be agreed to. I call the parliamentary secretary. Um, thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. We've just heard uh, the coalition, in a very hollow gesture, uh, claim that it uh, doesn't outright oppose the bill, but they'll vote against it in its current form, which means three more years that's three more years to decimate forests which will be illegally logged, and three more years support for criminal activities of illegal loggers and those associated with this terrible destruction. They haven't made one constructive suggestion about how to improve the bill. They merely say, let's deny it, delay its implementation for almost three years. Now, what type of abrogation of our responsibility as parliamentarians would that be? We'll have legislation on the statutes which was as impotent as the coalition's attempt to salvage some credibility out of this debate. Now, this is, as I mentioned before, a shallow gesture and a reflection on those who put them forward. In 2010, and I want to remind the House and all those listening to this, in 2010 the co Federal Coalition made this pledge to the Australian people, and I quote, the Coalition will legislate to make it an offence to import any timber product which has not been verified as being legally harvested. They go on, we will require Australian timber importers and domestic uh, processing mills to undertake a process of due diligence to verify the legal origins of the timber product and to disclose species, country of harvest and, and any certification. Further, a transition period of two years will be provided to allow industry to adapt to these new measures. The legislation before us delivers the coalition's commitment as well as the Labor Party's election commitment. Today the coalition is proposing to give the green light to sophisticated criminal networks to continue a trade that costs $60 billion per annum. Their amendment effectively says Australia is a haven for the proceeds of crime. And I'd like to remind the member opposite, whilst he's there sitting quietly, that using estimates published by the World Bank, a further 236,520 uh, square kilometres of forest will be harvested illegally with the approval of the Australian Parliament if we agree to your amendment. And looking at the data in the explanatory memorandum for this bill, which you're well aware of, I assume you've read it, the Coalition's amendments will give the green light to a further $180 billion in illicit trade over three years by sophisticated criminal networks, $1.2 billion of which would be delivered in Australia. So those opposite say that the Europe and the United States can do the heavy lifting, heavy lifting on this issue and Australia will be a dumping ground, a dumping ground for illegally logged timber and timber products. As I said before, you do not propose to oppose the bill, yet you do not make suggestions on how to improve the bill. You just say delay its implementation for whatever reason, and in doing so you admit that the government has in fact got it right. Your amendment is a shallow gesture and a reflection on those who put it forward. We will not support your amendments. <clears throat> the question is that the amendment be agreed to all those of that have been saying. Oh, sorry, my apologies. The amended 
I call the member for Bradfield. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In this consideration and detail stage, I'd like to respond to what the parliamentary secretary has just said, in which he said that the coalition had displayed an abrogation of responsibility. Mr Deputy Speaker, let's just focus on exactly what is in the legislation that the government has put before the House this afternoon and why, therefore, we say our amendment is necessary. The government has put forward legislation which establishes a criminal offence with a penalty of five years' imprisonment for a person who, under proposed section 8, imports a thing, the thing is made from or includes illegally logged timber, and the thing is not prescribed by the regulations for the purposes of this paragraph. The government has introduced legislation which would pass into law if they have their way, and yet there is no way for a law-abiding citizen to know at the time that this bill will come into force, there is no way for a law-abiding citizen to know what it is they need to do to avoid breaching section 8. There is no detail as to what the due diligence defence actually requires. In fact, law-abiding citizens will not even be able to find out which kinds of timber are the ones which attract the operation of section 8 which will impose upon those citizens, if they make an innocent mistake, a penalty potentially of up to five years in prison. Let's be completely clear about what this legislation does, Mr Deputy Speaker. Let's not hear all this talk of high and noble aims. Let's focus on a detailed analysis of specifically what this provision does under the bill which the parliamentary secretary is seeking to have the government ram through the House this afternoon. Because if an importer brings into Australia a chair, for example, made almost entirely of plastic or metal, but which happens to include some wood, and if it turns out that that wood is wood which has been illegally logged under the law of another country, then under the operation of proposed section 8, that importer will be liable to the knock on the door from a government inspector and will be liable for being imprisoned for up to five years. Those are the plain words on the face of section 8. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government comes in here and talks about abrogation of responsibility, and they have put forward this legislation without bothering to have the regulations ready which specify what it is that a law-abiding citizen must do in order to comply with this law, without bothering to specify in the regulations what is the nature of the due diligence that a citizen must carry out to be satisfied that he or she is not breaching the law, and without even bothering to specify the list of the kinds of timbers which are defined as illegally logged. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is it is extraordinary in these circumstances that the parliamentary secretary would use the term abrogation of responsibility, because that is the most remarkable abrogation of responsibility by this government to pro propose to introduce legislation imposing such penalties but making it effectively impossible for a citizen to find out what he or she has to do to comply with the law. It's all very well for the parliamentary secretary to talk about the international criminal trade in illegal logging. There is no dispute on this side of the House that illegal logging is a problem that needs to be addressed. But we merely ask this of the government. Get your House in order. Make it clear in the law of the land what is required of a citizen to comply with the law. Get the regulations in place and operational. And that is why we have moved this motion or moved this amendment, not because we have uh, an objection in principle to the notion of greater action being taken against illegal logging. Indeed, as the parliamentary secretary has rightly pointed out, that is our policy. But we make the point that to move to introduce legislation which would come onto the books, which would be part of the law of the land and which would impose these very serious penalties without it being possible for a citizen to find out what he or she needs to do to comply with the law at the time that this act gets royal assent is an abrogation of responsibility. What we are seeking to do here, in fact, is to assist the government to come up with uh, an additional amount of time in which they can do the job they ought to have done before bringing this legislation in, and that is getting the regulations in place following proper consultation with the importing sector and with the timber sector so that citizens know what they need to do to comply with the law. That is not by any means an unreasonable proposition from the opposition. On the contrary, we are seeking to be helpful to assist the government to do what it should have done of its own volition. Order the question is the amendment be agreed to call the parliamentary secretary. 
The only thing the member for Bradfield is being helpful with is to allow illegal logging to continue to decimate forests for three more years. That's all you're doing. And uh, you also either misunderstand, and I wouldn't like to suggest you misrepresent, but the bill does not do what you claim uh, it is, it, 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 it is um, uh, negligent in. One penalty relates to knowing or reckless engagement in the proceeds of crime. The other relates to the regulations which stipulate due diligence requirements. There is no misalignment. The high-level prohibition that applies at clauses 8 and 15 should not be confused with the prohibition that applies to the regulated timber stream, which is implemented two years after the legislation commences. The high-level prohibition places a ban on importing timber products containing illegally logged timber and processing domestic raw logs that have been illegally logged. The prohibition clause 8 and 15 places a minimum burden on uh, importers and domestic processors, as they will not be required to undertake a prescribed process under the bill. Businesses may seek to implement informal measures to ensure they are not a party to supplying illegally, illegally logged timber into the Australian markets. Two years after the commencement of the legislation, legislation, importers of regulated timber products, which the government is in the process of determining, and processes of domestic raw logs will be required to carry out due diligence to minimise the risk of importing illegally logged timber. Well, uh the question is that the amendment be agreed to. I call the member for one. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise today to uh, to support remarks that I made in this chamber last week, but also to comment on remarks which were made by the trade minister at the end of the debate last week, where he was critical of comments which had been made about the relationship with Indonesia and, in particular, referred to a quote in the Australian Financial Review. And he accused um, us on this side of misrepresenting and misleading. Well, let's place the Australian Financial Review article to one side, because what we didn't hear from the Trade Minister and what I would like to hear him comment on, or maybe the parliamentary secretary could comment on was the evidence that was given by Indonesia when the Trade Subcommittee examined this bill. And I quote, the implementation of the bill is also likely to undermine the development of trade between Indonesia and Australia based on our respective mutual interests. In this respect, Reference is made to the recent efforts of the Government of Indonesia to accommodate and resolve the problem faced by Australia during the self-imposed ban on beef exports to Indonesia. That is the quote which needs to be addressed by the other side. And I would ask the Parliamentary Secretary to give us his view on what Indonesia is saying in that, this quote, and if the trade minister is happy to grace, his, grace us with his presence again, I would love to hear his view of what this means. Remembering that Indonesia is our most important market for beef and for wheat, and yet here they are in their submission saying the implementation of the bill is also likely to undermine the development of trade between Indonesia and Australia based on our respective mutual interests. Now, I would ask the government to pay heed to that quote, to think about it, because we have already seen through the absolute debacle which occurred with the live exports to Indonesia what harm that did to our trading relationship with Indonesia. Yet here again we see the government, through its ineptitude, through its incompetence, ready to do exactly the same thing again. The consultation around this bill 
has been nothing short of a disgrace. They haven't taken into account the interests of our near neighbours, how sensitive they are about these measures, how sensitive they are about other countries telling them what they should do, how they should govern their only own internal affairs. And it's time the government woke up and thought about doing things a better way, because if they don't, they're going to cause grave, grave damage to this relationship. And it's at a time where is, there is particular sensitivities. We've already seen that there is a key to helping to resolve the asylum seeker issue here in this country by making sure we have strong cooperation with Indonesia and Malaysia in particular. Yet the way you have mishandled this bill will mean that those countries look at us and say, why should we cooperate with this country when they are bringing into this place unilateral measures like this where we are telling them how to suck eggs? And I call on the government to think again, to step back from this and go back to those countries and say, surely there is a better way to do this. Surely we can do this where we cooperate with you, rather than us telling you this is how you should do it, imposing our views on them, telling them that you should do it our way. How would we like it in reverse? And this is the danger of this bill, because the precedent that we are setting will open it up for other countries to say to us in exactly the same way, this is how we want you doing things. Order. Think again. Order. The question is that the amendment be agreed to call the member for Gippsland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak again in relation to the Illegal Logging Prohibition Bill uh, 2011 and the amendment put forward by the Coalition. And as the House has heard, this bill uh, prohibits the importation and sale of all timber products containing illegally logged timber, prohibits the processing of illegally harvested domestically grown raw logs, requires importers of regulated timber products and processors of raw logs to comply with due diligent requirements, requires the accurate description of legally logged timber products for sale in Australia, establishes enforcement powers and offences, and imposes penalties and provides for review of the first five years of the operation of the Act. And despite the protestation from those opposite, I do believe that the Coalition has acted in good faith in relation, in relation to this uh, piece of legislation and has sought to raise well, some very legitimate order, concerns. Order. The amendment for Giftland should be speaking to the amendment, not thank you, to the thank bill. You. In, 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 in uh, raising the amendment to the bill, Deputy Speaker, I believe that the Coalition has acted in good faith because what we have sought to do is to give the government the opportunity, the time, to actually get this right. And that has been our concern from the outset in terms of the debate as it's, uh, as it's occurred in this place. Mr Abbott actually wrote, the, the member for England, the Leader of the Opposition, actually wrote to the Prime Minister uh, earlier this year suggesting conditions under which the Coalition could support the bill, and that is the, uh, the, the nature of the amendment be, before the House, that we propose a better way forward to accommodate the absence of, some, of, the, of the satisfactory consultation. We have been concerned of the sensitivities both at international, international level, which the member for Wannan uh, quite rightly has uh, reflected on in his uh, contribution to the House, but also the concerns expressed by the domestic industry in terms of the consultation period and the need for uh, extra time to get this right. And that goes to the very heart of the amendment put forward uh, by the coalition, that we, th we are seeking more time and uh, more detail from this government in relation to the regulations. So I believe the amendment that we're putting forward is a sensible approach to delay the onset of the legislation and for the regulations uh, contained uh, to be made available uh, by a settled uh, future date, and that would give us the opportunity to go out and consult with the industry and consult with our international trading partners to ensure that we continue to support a viable uh, timber industry in this country. And of course, Deputy Speaker, the, the position taken by the coalition is consistent with our approach to, to the last election, where we supported the prevention of illegal logging and will continue to work with the government in good faith in that regard. The coalition uh, uh, went into that last election uh, period with an undertaking to legislate to make an offence to import any timber product which has not been verified as being legally harvested. And I must say that the member for Braddon and, and the, and the PALSEC uh, took the opportunity to come to my electorate and meet with uh, the Australian, Australian Sustainable Hardwood Timbers 
uh, quite recently, and uh, I did enjoy that experience. And I think uh, the member for Braddon and the parliamentary secretary also uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with the industry directly on this particular issue. And it must be said that in that discussion, the, um, the, from, with the State Australian Sustainable Hardwoods. They did indicate that the Victorian Association of Forest Industry supports, in principle, the approach being taken by the government in relation to illegal logging, but has reservations about the regulations. And that is to the heart of the amendment put forward by the coalition. We want to see the details. We want the regulations to be uh, fully. Uh, we want the industry to have the opportunity to fully to be fully consulted in relation to the details of this legislation. And we're particularly keen to ensure that the sensitivities at an international level uh, are, uh, are taken into account. So while I do appreciate, I certainly appreciate the um, the member for Braden taking the time to consult with uh, the uh, mill owners at Hayfield. And, uh, and he had, had a great appreciation for the work they're doing at the Hayfield Mill to certify uh, and uh, to be fully audited in, in relation to their operations. And it was a, um, it was a very a useful visit, I think, from many perspectives. And the, indus and the industry did appreciate his, uh, his willingness to uh, discuss in a very full and frank manner what the future uh, challenges will be for the industry. But I, I, just, I, I can't support the bill without the, uh, without the uh, amendment being passed because I believe it is a, it is a, a common sense approach being taken by the coalition and in good faith uh, with the timber industry, but also, uh, sorry, with the domestic timber industry, but also in relation to our international trading partners. And I, th I thank the member for one for his contribution. I think he raised some legitimate concerns uh, regarding the sensitivities that exist when you're talking about uh, putting uh, requirements in place for foreign nations uh, in relation to trade. And I think it's, it would be wrong of those opposite to simply dismiss uh, the coalition's concerns as being political in nature, because they're not. They're, they're, they're being raised on behalf of industry and behalf of our, um, our, our spokespeople who are concerned about the international uh, trading uh, relationships that Australia enjoys in, has enjoyed in the past and will seek to enjoy in the future. So I, I do appreciate the opportunity to discuss again this complex area of legislation. I'll be supporting the coalition's amendment, and I urge those opposite to also uh, support the coalition in its efforts to ensure there's full Order. consultation Order. In, in detail on the regulations. The member's time has expired. The question is: the amendment be agreed to call the honourable member for Riverina. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, this is most important to uh, to get. Uh, this on the record about this, this, this amendment into the illegal uh, logging bill, and uh, certainly it's a pleasure to actually follow the members for Gippsland and Wannan, and certainly the member for Wannan made some very valid remarks about the, uh, the risks uh, inherent in, in this following the, uh, the Trade Subcommittee's uh, recent report. And I quote from that, where it says the implementation of the bill is also likely to undermine the development of trade between. Indonesia and Australia based on our respective mutual interests. In this respect, reference is made to the recent efforts of the Government of Indonesia to accommodate and resolve the problem faced by Australia during the self-imposed ban on beef exports uh, to Indonesia. And, and certainly, as the member for Wanan indicated, the uh, trade that Australia does with Indonesia in respect of wheat and beef cannot be jeopardised. It can't be jeopardised by this particular amendment, this particular bill, and can't be jeopardised for the national interests of Australia and, indeed, of Indonesia, because Indonesia is, as we all know, a very valuable trading partner of Australia. And certainly, uh, this amendment calls for the, uh, the regulations uh, and the amendments to coincide. Now, passing this bill without knowing what the detail is uh, could jeopardise a whole lot, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker trade relations, and we've, we've seen with this Labor government trying to force through other pieces of legislation, uh, and certainly and they have been able to do that in this hung parliament, uh, and, and, and e-health, uh, electronic health records springs to mind, uh, the haste with which that was done. I also caution the parliament about putting in a water policy uh, in a hasty way that is going to impinge upon so many irrigators within my electorate, but certainly this uh, particular amendment and this particular bill, uh, it, it can lead to the jailing of people, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, you know, we, we can't have people, uh, innocent people, perhaps, uh, going to jail um, for, for the want of better legislation, for the want of more time to consider in proper uh, detail uh, what, this, what these amendments and what this, what this bill actually entails. Uh, we need a common sense approach, and certainly the coalition has approached this uh, in good faith, as the member for Gippsland said, and. Uh, we need to make sure that all the detail is considered properly, properly and accurately. Now, the coalition is committed to addressing the trade of illegally sourced timber 
and timber products. And it was certainly coalition policy at the 2010 election, and the need for uh, the legislation is driven, as we all know, by several issues, including environmental concerns regarding uh, indiscriminate or poorly controlled logging activities. And there's certainly a lot of uh, logging activities uh, uh, in the Riverina electorate. And I'm sure when the uh, parliamentary secretary who sits at the table visits the Riverina and he's shown a desire to do so, as he did with the, uh, the member for Gippsland only recently, I'm sure he'll be able to uh, um, uh, take on board, uh, for want of a better word, uh, those logging activities and certainly how valuable they are to the Riverina electorate and indeed to the economic uh, 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 future of Australia, because uh, there is so much logging activity that does take place in Australia and, uh, and certainly so much that takes place in the Riverina. In addition, under the current legislative regime, the Australian forest sector, which is globally recognised for its forest management regulation and practices, it does suffer um, competitive disadvantages through compliance costs, uh, which are borne both locally, which are not observed by illegal loggers. Mr. Deputy Speaker. The coalition acknowledges the government's acceptance of the majority of the recommendations made to the exposure draft. Now, um, the need for further consultation is clearly indicated uh, by a number of media articles, by certainly some of those things that have been said by coalition members today concerned about the effects of this bill and concerned by the, uh, by the details of this bill. Now, as I say, the coalition supports measures to prevent illegal logging. And this, uh, this position was clearly articulated in, the 2010, in our 2010 forestry policy. The Coalition will legislate to make it an offence to import any timber product uh, which has not been verified as being legally harvested. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry estimates that each year around $400 million or 10 per cent of imported forest products were derived from sources which had some risk of being illegally logged. Now, that can't continue. Um, a transition period of two years will be provided uh, to allow industry to adapt to two new measures which will uh, safeguard against illegal logging. The coalition will ensure that all stakeholders impacted are consulted closely in the drafting of any legislation, regulations and other related measures which would indeed benefit uh, this entire bill and these amendments. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order the question is that the amendment be agreed to call the member for Gray. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to speak on this uh Bill in consideration. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, my father unfortunately passed on three years ago now. He used to have a saying, less haste, more speed. Less haste, more speed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I think this is, this is a case of what we are trying to help the government with here. Rush less and let's for once get something right, Mr Deputy Speaker. There are many people out there in, in the general public in Australia who say, why don't the two sides of parliament work together? Well, we're trying to work with the government. We're trying to work with the government, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because in fact we have an almost identical goal. We wish to get rid of illegal logging. Now, but what we're doing here, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is trying to save the government from itself from rushing in. And given the, uh, the, the, the record of this government, which I raised in my second reading speech, I won't go through it again, uh, in the interests of brevity, but. But trying to save the government from yet again a costly and embarrassing stuff up on Australia's, on Australia's behalf, where we will be, where we will be judged uh, as being overbearing, overconfident, the, the colonial masters of the Pacific, uh, and then eventually hauled back to the plate to go back to a previous position, as we've just seen on, as we've just seen on, um, on, on asylum seekers, and 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 having to admit. That we were wrong. Now, of course, of course, we want to see the end of illegal, illegal uh, logging, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because uh, there, there are losers all the way around. The soil losers, the country losers, the people of the country lose. Uh, there, there are very few winners in illegal, illegal logging, except, of course, to those who steal the resource. But we need to get the regulation right. And in fact, in the intent of the bill, it was, it was expressed that it requires an accurate description of legally logged timber products for sale in Australia. Now, what we are trying to do with the member Collier's uh, amendments is to ensure that we have time, that the trading partners uh, have time to implement systems that allow traceability and achieve compliance with the regulations and legislation, and that, very importantly, Australian importers have the time to design and implement processes 
for traceability and demonstration of due diligence. Because the problem we have, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the legislation as it stands at the moment is that the onus is on the importer and on the seller of the timber in Australia to prove, to prove that the timber was not illegally, illegally logged. Now, it is very difficult if you happen to be sitting in your suburban store in Burnside or Melbourne or wherever to look at, a, look at an article and say, well, I definitely know that you know, the sides were made from, from, uh, from legal timber and, and the back was made from legal timber, but the inlay in the top, um, well, I'm not so sure about. Now, those traders are going to have to rely on the, on the compliance mechanisms of the country from where, this, where the timber is sourced. And at this stage, they cannot rely on that, on the, on that regulation. Now, those, companies, those countries are trying, as we speak, to develop that regulation. We know that uh, these are countries that are not as developed as Australia, and from time to time cash might pass under the table to achieve um, such a certificate of, cert of, of certification. But these are the these, this is the time in which these countries, the countries which wish to continue this trade with Australia, have the, have the chance to do the compliance right. Because, of course, if it is wrong and we see major prosecutions in Australia, then we run the risk of the trade stopping altogether. And if the trade stops altogether, you, we don't see a decrease in forestry in these countries. Because, as we know, with any economically traded uh, agricultural produce, as the price falls, production rises, because people try to cover their losses by harvesting more, planting more, and in the case of forestry uh, and illegal forestry, um, logging down more trees, which will find its way to the market, perhaps not into Australia, uh, but to somewhere else in the world. So the net effect is, uh, in fact, counterproductive. Now, we don't come into this chamber in a belligerent manner. Uh, we don't, we, we're not shouting at the government. We're just saying, just hold up a bit. Just hold up a bit. Let's see if, for once, we can get something right. So then we can go back to the people of Australia and say, yes, we have had a conversation, an intelligent conversation, and we've come to an intelligent compromise. So that's what the member for Kalia is asking for, Mr Deputy Speaker. That's why I'm supporting his amendments, and that's why I think the government ought to perhaps listen to us on this one. Order. Question is that the amendment be agreed to call a member for Ryan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise to support the Coalition's proposed amendment uh, to this illegal logging prohibition bill. And just as the member for Gray uh, quoted the wise words of his father, I remember well a former senator of this place, Sir John Carrick, who regularly used to use the phrase, slowly, slowly catchy monkey, which uh, became uh, well known in those days. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, illegal logging poses a significant challenge to the goal of sustainable management of the world's forests. And every member of this House wants to ensure that we do what we can to protect the environment. We must recognise, however, that there are substantial trade-offs involved between, on the one hand, the protection of global forestry and, on the other, the employment prospects and quality of life concerns in developing countries. It is important for this House to constantly keep in mind decisions made today and their ramifications for the future global environment and future generations. But we must also not ignore the fact that there are hundreds of millions of impoverished people in poor countries around the world, many millions of whom undertake illegal logging in places like Indonesia just so that they can survive. This is not a desirable situation, but it is a situation that we must all accept and take into account. The Coalition is moving this amendment to defer the commencement date of the legislation such that the regulations imposed on the importation of timber products can be appropriately put into practice by local industry. Mr Deputy Speaker, indeed the first recommendation of the Trade Subcommittee's report urged the government to continue to consult with the governments of Canada, Indonesia, Malaysia, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea and other important stakeholders prior to the development of subordinate legislation under the bill. This Gillard government is notorious for its ability to alienate foreign countries, and the Labor government is doing so again. If we don't pass the Coalition's amendment today, this bill could harm our bilateral trade relationships with not just Indonesia, but also Canada, Papua New Guinea and Malaysia, among many others. 
in their submissions to Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade's inquiry into this legislation, these countries were very clear. The Indonesian government's submission expressly said that, and I quote, the implementation of the bill is likely to undermine the development of trade between Indonesia and Australia based on our respective mutual interests. Indonesia noted the importance of forestry and the forest sector and noted that the industry employs close to four million Indonesians, often in rural areas where other forms of employment do not exist. Clearly, Indonesia is willing to fight on this issue because it affects so many of its citizens. And if Australia believed that another country was planning to impose deleterious unilateral trade restrictions on our exports, we would no doubt fight just as strongly. Malaysia told the committee that while they understood that the objective of the bill is laudable, Malaysia would like to see that the implementation of the bill will not in any way hamper the good bilateral trade relationship, particularly in timber products. The Canadian government's submission warned that any third-party certification scheme and the reliance on strict chain of custody certification could lead to a barrier, of tra barrier to trade for exporters of timber products. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are some of our most important trading partners. Indonesia is certainly Australia's largest neighbour, neighbour and the single most important export market for our wheat and beef industries. We do not want to harm this important bilateral trade relationship any more than has been achieved by the Gillard Labor government. The worry I have is that this unilateral effort and blanket policy will damage our bilateral relationships. As the member for Curtin said previously, New Zealand in their submission noted the implementation of the bill had the potential to have a significant negative impact on New Zealand's forestry industry. As Judith Sloan has commented in an article in The Australian on 15 May, the point of trade policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, insofar as it actually relates to trade, should be used to promote international trade and should not be used to pursue other objectives such as environmental aims. Mr Deputy Speaker, the coalition went to the 2010 election with a clear policy of real action for the prevention of illegal logging because we understand that illegal logging is a significant challenge to the global environment. We believe in deferring the time frame in which illegal logging measures will be fully rolled out to allow industry to adapt to any new measures. The coalition believes that all impacted stakeholders should be consulted closely in the drafting of any legislation and regulations which to date is still a major concern. I urge the government to address our concerns and support the coalition's amendment to defer the timing of this legislation. Order. The question is that the amendment be agreed to call the member for Lyme. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lyme. Thank you. I'm uh, very concerned that the coalition uh, would oppose these bills. I was a part of the Trade Committee uh, that went through uh, the bills. Uh, I saw the last election uh, promises by the coalition to ban illegal logging, to support bills in the parliament to stop illegal logging, to support uh, Australian industry, Australian manufacturing industry. They have now opposed that. They're now opposing these bills on some really false, really false uh, position. And I am really concerned that the rest of the world, the USA and the Europeans, are moving uh, against illegal logging. The world is moving, but not the coalition. Not the coalition. Who's got to the coalition? The illegal loggers, I think. People that are making money out of bringing illegal logs into Australia and illegal wood and furniture have got to them. Who's paying the bills? Who's making the donations to Liberal members and National Party members for elections? We ought to start looking at this. Right? This is a turnaround from a promise at the last election. A promise. The promise was we will oppose, we will oppose illegal timber and products coming into Australia. Well, you've turned that around. You've turned that around with some spurious uh, uh, arguments about we're worried, we're worried about our neighbours and the trading uh, with our neighbours, when you know that the rest of the world is also moving against illegal logging. I heard the member for Grace say, oh, well, we know that, uh, you know, 
bit of cash passes under the, under the table. He said a bit, of cash, a bit of cash passes under the table to get the accreditation. Well, do we accept that? Of course we don't accept that. That's not world best practice, not what we should accept. And we know that Indonesia is moving toward accreditation systems. And we encourage them and we're helping them. But if we, put up, we don't put up proper laws in this country, we will be going backwards. And we should be supporting these bills and getting them through the parliament. And I'm very disappointed that this attitude has been taken because we did have uh, the Trade Committee did look hard at this matter. It worked through the issues. It had a round table with, uh, with the neighbours, with the, with the neighbouring countries, uh, with their uh, diplomatic uh, and trade people that came to our round table and we worked through issues that they had raised. And that's the way it should have been. But it's our bills to protect Australia and to set a standard for our country, for forestry workers, for the manufacturing sector of Australia. That's what these bills are about, setting the standard. And Australia has a right to do that. And it should be supported by the political parties, not with some spiritous arguments that is coming from the other side, just so they have an extension or some sort of differentiation. Well, I'm telling you, forest workers will make, I make sure that forest workers will understand in this country and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the, big, uh, the large bulk of those that work in, in making furniture in Australia will also be well aware that the coalition is not interested in having proper uh, protection of, uh, of their jobs and having proper processes which meet uh, world standards which is where we're going. And as I said, we know that the rest of the world is moving down these lines, that we need to seek an accreditation process so that when someone uh, buys wood, when they're gonna sell wood in Australia, that it's got an accreditation process on it, which can be many, many different accreditation schemes, but it has to come up to the standards that we're gonna set uh, for Australia. I couldn't see what would be wrong with that. I can't see why the opposition uh, would be opposing this unless there's some other reason. Unless there's some other reason. So maybe the member, uh, the member for Mayo will tell us that reason in an honest flurry uh, from that side. So I believe we should be supporting these bills and they should pass the House and the Senate. Order. The question is the amendment be agreed to. I call the member for Mayo. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on the amendment as well. And, uh, firstly, I, I will say uh, that uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, I'll correct uh, one, one thing he said in his su summation uh, last Thursday, which was that uh, I had said that, that in my second reading speech that these bills should be tremendously amend amended, but then would support the passage uh, if our amendment was successful. Well, I, I don't support the passage of these bills. I made that very clear in, the, in my contribution. I think these bills are a, this bill is a bad idea, Mr Deputy Speaker. I uh, accept our, our party room's decision to allow these bills to pass after our fighting for this amendment, but I think this is a bad way for us to proceed, and that's because um, the member for Lyons just gave away what this bill is all actually all about. Uh, this bill is not about environmental policy, as they will have you believe, as the parliamentary secretary will stand and try and have you believe. This bill is about protectionism. Yeah. The member for Lyons just said exactly that very clearly in his contribution. This bill is about uh, protecting uh, what he says are uh, uh, important manufacturing industry jobs, and I understand he believes that. I understand and accept that that is his view. Uh, and he says, uh, what are, "Who are the people who are telling us to have this position uh, in a, uh, supporting this amendment, opposing this bill, Mr. Deputy Speaker?" Uh, well, I haven't spoken to anyone in this industry. I can make that very clear on the record, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But I know that the member for Lyons has, because he was quoting pretty much from the CFMEU press release. That's who's, this, that's who's telling this bloke what to say, Mr Deputy Speaker. That's who tells all of those people over there what to say, Mr Deputy Speaker. They, the donations from the CFMEU to that side of parliament would make you blush, Mr Deputy Speaker. And they have the gall to suggest that we're being paid by someone to oppose this bill. Give me some strength, Mr Deputy Speaker. The member for Lyons is more honest than that. Others are not so much. But Mr 
Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Lyons is honest enough to admit that his contribution is paid for and endorsed by the CFMEU. That's who he's arguing for, and that's what this bill is all about, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is protectionism, parades, and environmental policy uh, that will do damage to our trading arrangements in our area, Mr Deputy Speaker. In my contribution last week, as I speak to the amendment that we have moved to this bad bill, uh, I made the comment that the parliamentary secretary at the table uh, the, for Pacific Islands or whatever else they call him these days uh, has actually done some reasonable work in this area. I know that's not very popular amongst some of my colleagues and I've been chastised heavily, uh, but I know it will assist him and he's, he's climb up the greasy pole getting that endorsement. But he has done some important work in working away with what are important regional neighbours, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and we want those neighbours to develop. We want Indonesia and we want Papua New Guinea. Uh, well, we do on this side, certainly, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure all those on the other side do. We want Malaysia. We want these countries who have got developing economies, developing countries, to do better. Uh, and if they do better, they will have better certification processes to ensure uh, that this practice that we all agree must come to an end uh, will come to an end in a better fashion. Domestic Australian law will not do that, Mr Deputy Speaker. Using trade policy through domestic law will not prevent uh, illegal logging occurring, as the parliamentary secretary for forests has been suggesting in response to the member for Bradfield's very, very uh, pertinent points. We actually quoted from the bill, parliamentary secretary. You didn't answer his question. Instead, you came up with some flurry about the coalition's amendments get are successful. We'll have three more years of illegal logging. I pose this question to you, Mr. Parliamentary Secretary. Rise to your feet and answer it. If this bill is successful, if it passes the House and the Senate, will illegal logging stop? Will illegal locking stop? Of course it won't. But protection will come back. That's what the Labor Party is all about. They've chucked away the Hawke and Keating reforms. They've gone to the member for lines. They're quoting from the CFMEU. This is what it's all about, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is, this is protectionism, pandering his environmental policy. And I'm ashamed of the member for lines because he's argued against this for years in, in Tasmania. He's argued against those Greens for years for using trade policy and using domestic law to pursue their environmental uh, desires. And now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Lyons is now wholly and solely with the Greens on this, uh, on these, uh, on this bill, this abomination of a bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, and he should, I think, be ashamed of the position he's now taking because it will not assist his workers, it will not assist Australian consumers, it will cost them more and it will not stop illegal logging. I want to hear the parliamentary secretary guarantee in this chamber, on his feet, that it, when these bills pass, the practice of illegal logging in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea uh, and wherever else around the globe will cease, Mr Deputy Speaker. He can't and he won't. Order the question. Is that the amendment be agreed to? I call the member for Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to uh, address this consideration in detail. And I wouldn't be so kind as the member for Mayo in relation to the member for Lyons, because part of the problem with this bill and this legislation is that the government, of course, is being driven by the Australian Greens. And the Melbourne, member for Melbourne, in his contribution uh, to this debate, said that he would like to see the definitions in, definitions in the legislation expanded of illegal timber. He would say, like to see the due diligence requirements increased. And really what that reveals, of course, is that the executive arm of this government, the member for Melbourne and the Greens in the Australian Senate, are really driving this agenda. And it is a green agenda, not a protection of jobs agenda. And it just so happens that last night, member for Lyons, I saw a program on television about the Tasmanian Tiger Trail, that they're trying to promote tourism in many there, about the Tasmanian devil, because they, and it said quite reflected quite somberly that they had lamented locally the loss of so many timber workers in Tasmania. And why have they lost so many timber workers in Tasmania? It's because of the policies of the Australian Greens. So here we have a government that is driven by the Greens on one hand, saying let's expand the definition of illegal timber, let's stop logging altogether in the countries in our region because we are concerned about climate change and all of the things that the Greens are concerned about. And at the same time, we've got the member for Lyons coming in here and saying we've got to protect those few remaining timber workers that we've got in Tasmania. That is the madness of a government that goes too far. And the member for Mayo's points and questions are well made in the sense that does the parliamentary secretary think that passing this bill will stop illegal logging? Well, yes. The, the government here thinks that passing a bill called Illegal Logging Prohibition Bill will stop illegal logging. That's the problem with this government. That's all they think they have to do. Never mind the how, it's always the what. Do we, do we agree with illegal logging? Well, of course we don't. 
Do we, do, we, do we oppose these bills? No. Do we oppose the intention of these bills? No, we don't, Member for Lyon. What we are concerned about is what is in the regulations, what is the definition of illegal timber, how does a citizen or business comply with it, and you cannot separate the what you want to achieve from the how. But this government hasn't grasped the how. It never does grasp the how. We'll worry about the detail later. How will we stop illegal logging? Somehow. Somehow. And that isn't good enough for the parliament to pass bills in these form. That's why the opposition has proposed amendments to allow time for proper consultation. And when you read the Orwellian explanatory memorandum of this bill, which goes through the great detail of consultation of peak industry bodies and groups that have been consulted and how great the consultation is, it is completely at odds with what you find in people's attitudes towards this legislation out there in the sector. Whether you go to our trading partners, whether you go to Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, Indonesia, who have expressed concerns, our hardwood bodies in America or in other countries who have said, look, you can achieve what you're trying to achieve, work with us. Even in the explanatory memorandum, it calls for, and the parliamentary secretary at the table for Pacific Islands would agree, Australia may leverage greater regional government action on combating illegal logging and associated trade through regional capacity building and bilateral and multilateral efforts. Hear, hear. Where's the bilateral and multilateral efforts here? Nobody in this place has come forward into this parliament and suggested a huge issue with domestic illegal lobbying of timber. Nobody's come in here and suggested it. This bill does not achieve the outcome that the government has so loudly vaunted. The member for Lyons has got up and said we need to protect workers' jobs, at the same time being in coalition with the Australian Greens, who want to increase the definitions of illegal timber make it harder to import timber of any nature into, into this country because they are fundamentally opposed to logging full stop. Every tree has to be saved, according to the Australian Greens. How does he sit in coalition with the Australian Greens and then come in here and say, let's use the laws of this country to protect the remaining timber jobs that are left in Tasmania, while at the same time I'm in a government that has this, this uh, Greens-dominated policy uh, which uh, is stripping back workers and jobs in his own state? He needs to answer that question, Mr Deputy Speaker, but the Parliamentary Secretary does need to answer the question about how the government intends to stop illegal lobbying just by passing a bill entitled Illegal Prohibition of Logging Bill, what the regulations will be, how this compliance will lead to a reduction in, in, in uh, logging and get across the detail. Every minister in this government is not across their detail, and this is another blinding example of government failure to produce the appropriate laws and regulations to back up the intention of what they're trying to achieve. Order. The question is that the amendment, as moved by the member for Clare, be agreed to. I call the parliamentary secretary. Yes, thank you, and I thank all uh, members for their um, their contribution. Uh, in short, uh, what the amendment for all the uh, um, the verbosity that's come from the other side and the feigned uh, interest uh, in doing what's right by our international obligations and whatever else, all those opposite are doing opposite, is delaying this legislation in order to allow further illegal logging throughout the world. And we join, we join with others in seeking to introduce legislation to prohibit illegal logging and the importation of products that are illegally logged. Now, if you think that's a joke, and if you also think in a perverse way, if you think in a perverse way that does not assist or affect, that is, the importation of illegally, illegally sourced timber products does not affect industry in Australia, jobs in Australia and businesses in Australia, then I feel very sorry for you, and I think that somehow or another your ideology has driven you to perverse argument which you just put before this House a moment ago. Now we've had inquiry after inquiry, inquiry after inquiry, consultation after cons consultation, regionally and with our neighbours and with, with our uh, trading partners, indeed time and time again, meeting after meeting with our trading partners over this legislation. And what the legislation seeks to do is a two part thing. It's to introduce a higher bar entry to, the, to uh, illegally uh, sourced timber products into Australia and in the meantime to work again with stakeholders and our partners to flesh out uh, the regulations which you are so pleased to want to happen within three years. Three year delay before regulations are introduced. 
You made a commitment in the last election, we made a commitment in the last election and before, to introduce such legislation as we have before us now, and I ask you to honour your commitment to that legislation as we will. And you can't honour your commitment if you support your own amendment. Thank you. Order. <coughs> the question is that the amendment, as moved by the member for Kalea, be agreed to. All those of that have been say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Ayes have it. No. Division. No. The noes have it. And the division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. The doors. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the members for Barker and Parks, tellers for the ayes, and the members for Shortland and Fowler, tellers for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 67, no 70. The question is therefore negated. The question now is that this bill, as amended, be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that this bill, as amended, be agreed to the eyes or pass the right to the chair, the nose to the left. I point the same tellers from the previous division. The result of the division is I 70, noes 67. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. This bill, as amended, has been agreed to. The parliamentary secretary. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The parliamentary secretary. Thank you very much indeed. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Message from the Governor General. I have received a message from Excellency the Governor General. The, the clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to combat illegal logging and for related purposes. Message from the Governor General. I have received a message from Excellency the Governor General notifying assent to the Migration Legislation Amendment, Regional Processing and Other Measures Bill 2012. I have received a message from the Senate returning the Consumer Credit Legislation Amendment Enhancement Bill 2012 without amendment. The clerk. Government business. Order of the day number six, Public Service Amendment Bill 2012, resumption of debate on the second reading. You want to do it now? No. All right. If it's all right with the member from Mim Keller, I would like to give indulgence to the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the Leader of the Opposition claim to be misrepresented? Uh, most grievously, uh, the Madam Leader Deputy of the Speaker. Has repeatedly the call. today in question time, the Prime Minister claimed that I intended to cut funding to public schools. I said no such thing. I intend no such thing. I would do no such thing. There's only one hit list, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's the Prime Minister's hit list under which one in three uh, schools right around Australia will have their funding the cut uh, as the, the Gonski Review stands, even if fully funded. His seat. He has indicated where he has been misrepresented. 
The question before the chair is now that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for McKellar. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This uh, bill, the Public Service Amendment Bill of 2012, uh, is a bill which is largely technical in nature, but in the words of the minister responsible, seeks to uh, simplify the values of the public service uh, from 15 down to 5, uh, and they will be the terms service, ethical, respectful, accountable and impartial. And as he said, are more succinct and memorable, easy to understand, and will help the service to create an ethical, high-performance culture. The one provision in this bill which I do not believe uh, can in any way meet that uh, high aim is the proposed amendment which would allow the Prime Minister of the day to engage on behalf of the Commonwealth on terms and conditions as determined by the Prime Minister to appoint a, parliamentary, a, to appoint a secretary of a department who has resigned or whose t period of office has come to an end uh, to any appointment that the Prime Minister may wish, and that could be an indefinite appointment. Uh, we are on the coalition have proposed to amend the provisions to delete those provisions from the bill, and I flag at this stage that I will be moving those amendments in consideration in detail. Uh, and I note that the government will be moving amendments in consideration in detail, uh, dealing with um, particularly the original concept of a temporary employee, uh, and also uh, another provision which the minister will no doubt himself explain. In discussions over the bill uh, between myself and the minister and his department, uh, we have concluded that the government will accept my, my uh, amendments and the opposition will agree to the government's amendments. But I think before I go on to explain precisely some of the other provisions of the bill that we are accepting, it is important uh, to outline why we feel so strongly about amending the bill so that the only people who will be able to be appointed will remain as uh, secretaries who will be able to be appointed by the Prime Minister remain as they are in the current bill, that is the Public Service Bill of 1999, which provides that if a government department is abolished, the secretary can be appointed um, elsewhere, uh, and also um, should a secretary have his or her term terminated uh, by the Prime Minister after appropriate investigation and reporting. Uh, that person can be appointed elsewhere. We are concerned on two counts about the uh, proposed uh, extension of the ability to appoint secretaries. Uh, and one of those is, of course, that we have the precedent in New South Wales of the so-called swingers list. That is a whole bunch of uh, public servants, including secretaries, who uh, no longer have a job and simply remained on the, pay on the payroll. Uh, I think it reached something like 340 at one stage, and it is only now that uh, uh, Premier O'Farrell uh, is in power that he is now moving to reduce that list of people who are being paid for doing nothing. This provision would have allowed such a list to develop here federally. And uh, although people will say that is nobody's intent, uh, it is still something that we believe is highly undesirable, and accordingly we are moving to uh, moving amendments to take that provision from the Act. The second is, and the reason I quoted the um, minister's words, uh, the words, the proposed values are that the Australian Public Service is committed to service, ethical respectful, accountable and impartial, uh, which are terms that are more succinct and memorable and easy to understand, but will help the service to create an ethical high performance culture. It is always essential that uh, the public service can be relied upon for fair and 
uh, impartial advice uh, that ministers can act upon. And having been a minister in the previous government, I can tell you it is very valuable to have. But by introducing this provision, what would mean is that it could be that a particular secretary, by being obsequious to a prime minister of the day, uh, could seek to uh, resign and have them uh, appointed uh, to a position indefinitely, uh, which to their personal benefit. Now, this is also against the intent of this act as a whole. Um, the difficulty, of course, has shown itself. We have had one example of it. And because there is no provision in the Public Service Act to appoint a secretary who has resigned or whose term has come to an end, uh, the mechanism that has been used on this occasion has been section 67 of the Constitution. And the Constitution allows for the appointment by the Governor-General of uh, persons to uh, positions of uh, advisers, um, which has been utilised by the Prime Minister in the case of the former head of the Treasury. Now, what has happened in that circumstance uh, has made it very public. Uh, what we have seen is that the terms and conditions upon which Mr Henry has been appointed uh, has in fact been uh, that he will be appointed on exactly, and I quote, the Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet be the approving authority for the special adviser to the Prime Minister for leave, including long service leave, for any period that the special adviser performs the duties of the office that he is to be appointed to, shall be on a full-time basis of 40 hours a week. The remuneration and other terms and conditions of employment for the special adviser be the same as those that apply to the person who holds the position of Secretary of the Department of Treasury at the relevant time. The Prime Minister may agree that the duties of the Special Advisor are to be performed on a part-time basis, and for any period that the Special Advisor performs the duty on a part-time basis, the remuneration referred to in clause, clauses C3 above be payable and other entitlements accrue on a pro rata basis. Now, the problem is that this appointment as a special advisor uh, was made under the hand of Her Excellency on the 21st of April 2011. But it was some five months later uh, that he was eventually decided that there was work for him to do on the Asian white paper. In the meantime, as of the 15th of March 2012, the Head of Treasury will, will uh, have an income of $615,000 a year, rising to $653,000 on the 1st of July 2012 and to $805,000 on the 1st of July 2014. Now, on the 14th of February, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet told Senate estimates that Dr Henry was working two and a half days a week. I have received a letter from the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet from Mr Dreyfus, uh, dated the 14th of August 2012, in answer to questions that I asked in consideration and detail of the Appropriations Bill, that in fact, as at the 27th of July 2012, Dr Henry had worked 69 days in total since the 5th of January at an average of two and a half days a week, and that no decisions have yet been taken regarding any future projects in Mr Henry's capacity as Special Advisor to the Prime Minister. That means that uh, as at uh, the 1st of July 2012, the remuneration uh, will be $326,500 and as at the 1st of January 2013, $345,500. And if the, if the appointment continues and there is no end to this appointment, by the 1st of July he will be receiving 
uh, presumably he remains on two and a half days a week, $402,500. In addition to that, he is permitted to take on additional work in the private sector and has taken on the position as a director of the National Australia Bank, which would seem to many of us to be a position of conflict of interest, uh, but which has been disclosed as the appointment required, and he continues in that, uh, in that appointment as well. So we believe that the uh, provision that was put into the Act could have uh, indeed facilitated many more appointments like this, but many of them would of course gone unknown largely because Section 67 would not have to have been used. Now there are some, uh, some good things uh, in the, uh, uh, the legislation uh, which um, are worthy of um, response and, uh, and of support. Uh, and that is that uh, the term of the uh, Commissioner will now be the Australian Public Service Commissioner, but he does have greater powers that come to him and he is given the power to delegate authority uh, to people who will be able to carry out investigations for him uh, where simply the workload, if it was to be done properly, uh, would be too large. There is a code of conduct where there are amendments uh, they will uh, which will apply in the connection with an employee's employment. It amends section 1311 of the Act to require employees to behave in a way that upholds the integrity and the good reputation of their agency, as well as the APS as is the current requirement, and to comply with the proposed employment principles as well as the APS values. With regard to whistleblowers, a section includes provisions to require agency heads to establish procedures for an Australian public service employee to make a whistleblower report and for agency heads to deal with these reports and provides a regulation making power to prescribe basic procedural requirements that must be complied with by the public service commissioner or a delegate in dealing with whistleblower reports. This amendment will provide that the regulations may prescribe circumstances in which agency heads uh, the Commissioner uh, may decline to conduct uh, a, or, or discontinue an inquiry. Other parts uh, deal with the question of temporary employment. Now, in the original uh, legislation, uh, there were only to be two categories of uh, employees, that is, ongoing and temporary. Uh, the government has uh, found on advice that this uh, is, was to be a difficult provision uh, to uh, sustain and they are proposing amendments which will take us basically back to the position as it was previously. Confidentiality of information is another thing which is, was of concern to the government and is subject to uh, some of their amendments and that is uh, where there is uh, required protection from persons who are conducting inquiries to also have the cover of being protected. The legislative instruments section is an amendment whereby the Public Service Commissioner's direction making powers to allow the Commissioner the discretion to issue directions on employment matters relating to all Australian Public Service employees, including SES employees, including on matters such as an engagement, promotion, redeployment, mobility, training schemes and termination are provided for. Uh, there are some miscellaneous uh, amendments which uh, relate to um, Australian Secret Intelligence Service, um, which are supported by the opposition. The current provision is a prohibition on reduction rather than active power, and this has caused some confusion. Uh, with respect to a delegation of power. But I go back to the uh, original uh, point that I wanted to make, that most of this bill uh, is endeavouring to be aspirational in terms of upholding integrity uh, and not bringing the public service or an agency into disrepute. And for those reasons, we believe that by leaving the legislation as it is currently, 
which does not allow a Prime Minister of the day to appoint a former secretary who has resigned or whose appointment has come to an end to any position he or she may choose for an indefinite period of time because of the two reasons I have given. One, that it could encourage the creation of a list of uh, so-called swingers or the unattached list, as it was known in New South Wales, and secondly, because it could undermine those high aspirational ideals um, whereby a secretary of the day uh, could, in fact, uh, wish to be subservient to a government of the day with the aim of securing employment. And I would just like to place on record, uh, particularly because of some debate that has taken place in this chamber recently, uh, concerning uh, whether or not, uh, or what was the determination that uh, the independents chose to listen to in order that they support the government in terms of not uh, voting against the appropriations bills and giving an undertaking that they would not vote on a motion of no confidence. In our costings, uh, as uh, the opposition, uh, we had sought to uh, have our costings done by an independent source because we believe that Treasury had become uh, politicised. And that was in order until such time as the hung parliament was evident and the independents required a briefing from Treasury, indeed from Mr Henry himself, to tell them about the costings of the coalition's policies. Now, in our costings, we had said we had savings of 2.5 billion against the conservative bias allowance, which is the allowance that is in the budget papers that allows for corrections with regard to new policy, a buffer, you might call it. Uh, in that case, that 2.5 billion was disallowed, for want of a better term, by Mr Henry, because he said uh, that it was a buffer and therefore uh, could not, in fact, result in any actual budgetary savings. But in the 2009-10 budget, Mr Henry himself claimed $4.6 million of um, savings over the forward estimates from that conservative bias allowance. Mm. We had uh, claimed $3.3 billion in the Health and Hospitals Fund, Education and Investment Fund and Building Australia Fund to be saved from those three funds. And Mr Henry said he disallowed that because he said that to claim those savings, we would have to have identified which programs would have to be cut prior to the election. He then said there was a secret list of programs because we had actually asked for that list, and he said it was secret and he would not release it uh, prior to the election, despite the fact of having been asked for it. Then we came to the NBN, where we claimed $2.4 billion of savings. We said we would reduce uh, the cost or there would be a savings on borrowings because we would not be borrowing the same amount uh, and there would therefore be savings in interest and that the interest save would be at the rate of 5.5 per cent. Mr Henry said, well, no, that he had decided that the going rate for the future would be 4.9 per cent and therefore you would, he would disallow that as a saving. The only problem was at the time in September, when I checked and first talked about these things, the rate was in fact 5.23 per cent. And then we come to the uh, question of returning people to work and saving on welfare payments, where we said we would save $600 million. Uh, and Mr Henry said no, because that was a second round figure. But Mr Henry himself had used a second round saving of $600 million for the government's purposes with regard to the mining tax. So then we came to the question of the PBS, pharmaceutical benefits scheme, where 40 per cent of savings had been identified uh, by the government and by people prior to the election, but the government had only chosen to use 23 per cent of those savings. So we said there was an additional 17 per cent valued at 1.15 billion, uh, but Mr Henry said no, our savings uh, would not um, uh, could not be allowed um, on the basis 
uh, that there was, uh, uh, and therefore there would be a further hole in our budget. It is interesting to note that since Mr Henry said no, that couldn't be allowed as a saving, that the government itself has ex actually booked that $1.15 billion for its own savings. Now, those amounts added up to $9.95 billion. And the figure that Mr Henry said was a black hole in our accounts was, in fact, $11 billion. And Mr Windsor uh, couldn't wait uh, to get out onto the television and say, because there was a big hole in our budget and we couldn't do our accounting properly, he would have to vote for the government. And so I think it's important to note that the impartiality of the Treasury and of other agencies and other departments is essential if we are to have uh, a trust in the sort of figures that are being produced. The bottom line is that by, if we were not moving our amendment, we could see uh, instances where, again, perhaps people would seek to wish to see the, serve the government of the day, uh, and we don't think that that is good policy, particularly when the whole of the bill is designed to be aspirational in nature. And so I am pleased to say that when we come to the consideration in detail, where we will be moving our amendments and the government will be moving their amendments, we have agreed that each of us will accept the other's amendments so that the bill can go forward and will in fact have its aspirational nature intact. And we trust that those memorable words uh, which the minister used, service, ethical, that the APS is committed to service, ethical, respectful, accountable and impartial uh, um, performance uh, and being more easy to understand and readily at the top of mind will help the service to create an ethical, high-performance culture. Thank the member for McCalla. The question is that the bill be now read a second time, and I call the member for Throsby. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to be speaking on this bill and pleased uh, to have the opportunity to talk about uh, the excellent work uh, that that fine body of men and women uh, who populate the Australian Public Service do on behalf of the Australian people and the government on, of Australia day in, day out, around about 120,000 of them who turn up to work uh, to make our airports safe, uh, uh, to, uh, to patrol our, our coasts, uh, to ensure that uh, the pensioners and the family benefit recipients of this country uh, have uh, their payments made and their inquiries answered to ensure the tax returns are done on uh, time and uh, the people are paying as much tax as they should and no more than they ought. Uh, and to ensure uh, that uh, our defence forces in far-flung places uh, of the globe are, are properly supported, as indeed they should be. Indeed, the men and women who uh, assist in providing services uh, uh, to this House as well. Uh, so it's uh, a great delight to be uh, speaking on this bill, which will in part uh, implement some of the changes recommended in the report ahead of the game a blueprint for the reform of the Australian Government Administration a report itself, which uh, arose from uh, the Moran review of uh, the Australian Public Service, a review that I had a little bit to do with in a former life, Deputy Speaker. And on the 8th of May uh, 2010, the then Prime Minister announced that the government had accepted all of the recommendations made in that re report. And this bill takes forward some of those recommendations for a modern contemporary employment framework that will allow greater agility and responsiveness by the APS to the community and the government. It will result in a greater efficiency and a more effective use of Commonwealth resources. It will also facilitate and accelerate the cultural shift towards operating more effectively as one Australian public service. The amendments in the bill are an important part of modernising the Australian Public Service to ensure the capacity to cope with the challenges of the future. Uh, these amendments are an important part of modernising the Australian Public Service to provide the capacity to cope with those challenges. And if you look at every single one of the challenges that we face as a nation, uh, the Australian Public Service is in the front line in delivering both the policy uh, advice and the service delivery. Uh, which will assist us as a nation uh, in confronting those challenges. The amend amendments will reposition the Public Service Commission and the APSC to deliver on a broad reform goals of the public service workplace. 
The bill will empower secretaries and the leadership group to deliver on the policy goals of the government through greater independence in operation and greater accountability in performance. Deputy Speaker, there are three significant sets of amendments in the bill. Part one of Schedule one to the bill provides new descriptions of the roles and responsibilities of secretaries, particularly in relation to their stewardship of the Australian Public Service. Uh, the revised descriptions make it clear the service and performance of ex expected of secretaries and strengthen secretaries' accountability to the ministers in performance of their role and discharging their responsibilities. The new proposed section 61A of the Act requires an annual review of the performance of a secretary to be carried out in accordance with a framework established by the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department and the Public Service Commission. This will provide for greater accountability, transparency and oversight of the performance of secretaries. The second set of measures will reposition the Public Service Commissioner and the APSC to deliver on broad reform goals and increase its responsibility for Australian government policies on APS agreement making and on pay and conditioners. The Commission will have three broad functions. The first is to strengthen the professionalism of the APS and to facilitate contentious, uh, continuous improvement, probably contentious improvements as well, in workforce management in the APS. It'll secondly, to uphold high standards of integrity and to conduct uh, in the APS and to monitor and re review and report on APS capabilities within and between agencies to promote high standards of accountability, effectiveness and performance. The bill specifically recognises the Commissioner's role as the central authority for APS workforce development and reform. The third set of measures represent a revision of the APS values, Deputy Speaker. The blueprint recognised the power of values as a foundation for reform and thus took the opportunity to revise the APS values as a means of assisting cultural change, which would in turn help to achieve the desired APS performance. The values and the employment principles are statements about the essential character and philosophy of the APS. They define what the APS is and how it should operate. These amendments seek to implement blueprint recommendations to revise the APS values and to establish APS leadership groups. The APS values are to be revised in order to replace the current set of 15 APS values with a shorter set of five APS values and to introduce a set of employment principles. They are committed to service, ethical, respectful, accountable and impartial. Hard to cavil, Deputy Speaker, with either or any of these as employment principles. Uh, the proposed APS values and employment principles together capture the essence of the 15 values, blending contemporary ethics with enduring principles of public administration that go to the heart of the Westminster model. No important concepts have been lost. Agency heads and APS employees will be required to uphold values and the employment principles. Agency heads and SES employees will also be required to promote them, reflecting the key responsibility that they have as leaders within their agencies to set the tone for the right culture. The Deputy Speaker, it is important that we continually uh, review the legislation uh, that uh, enshrines employment arrangements and the performance uh, of work within uh, the Australian Public Service. It is one of our most important and enduring uh, institutions. Uh, from time to time, uh, the capacity of the public service uh, is uh, a stretch to breaking point. And I know that as a member of this government, where we have uh, uh, made uh, as one of our important uh, functioning principles uh, ensuring uh, that we run a tight budget and that we return the budget to surplus as promised, that this has placed a deal of strain on public service agencies. But I know in equal force that uh, the men and women of the public service are committed to delivering on behalf of the Australian government and the people of Australia. Of course, um, tight fiscal environments are not the only threats uh, which face the men and women of the Australian public service. Uh, we know, for example, um, that there are alternative proposals uh, to how the Australian public service uh, should be uh, regulated 
and how it should be funded. For example, we know uh, that the op if the opposition is elected uh, to government uh, at the next election, uh, they will bring uh, 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 huge cuts to the Australian public service in order to fund their $70 billion black hole uh, in their policy costings. And this is a matter that is uh, confirmed uh, as late as today, Deputy Speaker, uh, by the Leader of the Opposition. They have a mammoth target. And make no, uh, make no doubt about it, to enable them to bring in anything like the $70 billion of, uh, of savings that will be necessary for them to meet their commitments, they will have to uh, take uh, to uh, the Australian uh, public service uh, 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 like it has never been seen before. And we've uh, had a taste of what coalition policies mean uh, for the public service around the country. We've seen what their state colleagues are doing, for example, in Queensland, uh, where a recently uh, elected Premier, uh, without forewarning, is taking to that public service and uh, against promises uh, and assurances that have been made that frontline services won't uh, be under attack. Uh, we are seeing attacks to frontline services in Queensland. Uh, Today, where in the health system, in the education system, in the public transport, in fact, there is no se uh, sector of the Australian, uh, the uh, Queensland Public Service, Deputy Speaker, uh, that is being uh, that is being uh, relieved from uh, the dirge of public sector job cuts. Uh, and uh, in New South Wales, in my own state, uh, Deputy Speaker, we are seeing uh, the shape of that looming up as well as the O'Farrell government uh, starts to take a cleaver. Uh, to the frontline services uh, in, in, in that state, and uh, the people of New South Wales are starting to see frontline services at risk because of the ideological desire uh, to, uh, to slash public sector and frontline jobs. I've got to say, Deputy Speaker, it's disturbing that the coalition seems to, in some of the statements that have been made uh, by some of the opposition spokespeople, uh, be embracing the policies of the US, uh, the UK Prime Minister David Cameron's guru, uh, Philip Blonde. Uh, it seems the Blondes are, uh, are all the vogue at the moment. Mr Blonde has been advising the coalition about this notion of so-called big society. There's every sign that the coalition is adopting this conservative government approach to our public services uh, in Australia. We've already heard the family's uh, spokesperson uh, saying that uh, a coalition government would cut federal oversight of aged care, childcare, employment and family services. Uh, we've seen what happens uh, when you cut uh, uh, federal oversight or when you've got fle fe uh, slack federal oversight, Deputy Speaker, uh, of aged care services, for example, um, uh, the uh, devastating impact that that can have on uh, the recipients of aged care services uh, uh, unless you have a strong cop on the beat. Uh, ensuring that uh, some of those most vulnerable people in our community, uh, people reliant on uh, federally funded aged care services, federally funded childcare services, uh, health care and the like, uh, uh, when they're not kept on their game uh, by strong federal oversight. So um, you know, people in this country can have a lot, uh, to, uh, uh, a lot to fear if um, there is an adoption of the blonde approach to public sector administration in this country. It's a failed approach. It's a failed approach. Since uh, it was adopted in the UK, uh, 7,000 charities have been forced to close their door. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the agenda that seeks to enliven civil society. Uh, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, have no doubt about it. Um, the big society agenda is nothing more than a big smoke screen uh, for slashing government services and the people who provide those services. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to make a few observations uh, uh, in response to what was said uh, by the member for McKellar just recently, uh, because one of the measures in this bill, which I think has merit, uh, is the measure which enables uh, the Prime Minister to uh, re-employ former secretaries uh, of uh, an APS department um, to uh, ensure that we can bring them back into service, to ensure that uh, they may commit their knowledge and expertise uh, in the service of the Australian people and the Australian government. And uh, we've seen examples uh, of that most recently where uh, uh, Ken Henry, a man who has served all sides of politics in this country uh, with uh, great uh, distinction, a man 
who has sometimes been uh, defamed in this place uh, uh, for the advice that he has given uh, to government, uh, 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 has been able to be re-engaged by the Prime Minister um, to assist in bringing together uh, our uh, Australian uh, century white paper, the uh, Asian century white paper, sorry, I withdraw that, the Asian century white paper, um, to bring his both economic, uh, his, his, uh, his dozens and dozens of years in economic policy advice and social policy advice to bring to bear on that important issue. Uh, and I know that uh, when that report is finally released, it will be a great contribution to public policy and public debate within this country. And I did listen carefully. Uh, uh, to the member for McKellar's uh, objection to putting in place within the Public Service Act just this sort of arrangement, as I listened carefully to all of the comments that uh, uh, the member for McKellar makes in this particular space. And uh, I've got to say, it doesn't sit easily with their track record. The objections were that somehow you would have um, uh, a lack of security in the top uh, echelons of the Australian Public Service. Uh, the secretaries perhaps put in, I think the words were used, a swingers list. Uh, I've got to say, Deputy Speaker, the word swinger and Australian public service aren't generally used in the same sentence uh, around this place, but they, be that as it may, uh, somehow placed on a swingers list. Uh, I've got to say uh, that that sits very uneasily with their track record in government. Uh, let's contrast what happened uh, when Labor was elected uh, to government in 2007. You never saw a night of the long knives. Uh, you never saw that, but what you did see when uh, the coalition government was elected in 2000, uh, in, sorry, in 1996, was a night of the long knives. Public sector uh, leaders, uh, APS secretaries, in their dozens, were axed from their jobs, as were around about 16,000 public servants, uh, almost uh, within the first 12 months. So, their objections are hollow. The bill is a good one, and it should be adopted by this house in its uh, total. I commend the legislation to the house. Well, I, thank the, I thank the member for Throsby. The question is that the bill be now read a second time, and I call the member for Cowan. Uh, thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's uh, nice to have the opportunity to speak uh, tonight on this bill, and given uh, the, uh, the very wide-ranging debate that has obviously uh, now been allowed to occur uh, after the member for Throsby's comments. But uh, what I would say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that uh, when I was uh, looking around for uh, a little bit of media commentary, a little bit of discussion on uh, this bill, there really wasn't much there. Uh, I guess uh, this bill hasn't exactly uh, uh, it's failed to really uh, inspire too many people of the general public. Uh, but what I would say, though, is that possibly when we, see, when we look back and see that uh, the uh, the second reading speech of the minister, uh, I believe, was on the 1st of March 2012. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure it's, uh, it's exactly inspired the government either, uh, given the amount of time uh, that it has taken to uh, bring, it, uh, bring the debate back into the House. Some five and a half uh, months, in fact, have uh, transpired. But then, of course, uh, the the panel that uh, created this report ahead of the game blueprint for the reform of the Australian government administration, uh, that report, uh, that was originally commissioned, as I understand, back in September 2009. Uh, a, uh, a panel comprised almost entirely of senior public servants were asked about asked to uh, have a look at uh, the public service, and so that uh, that actually uh, so it was commissioned in September 2009. And the report uh, was released on the 2nd of March 2010, again, a little while ago now. Uh, and on the 8th of May 2010, uh, 25 months ago, uh, then Prime Minister Rudd uh, said that he had accepted all the recommendations of the panel and of their report. Uh, but of course, shortly thereafter, uh, unfortunately uh, for the then Prime Minister, he was no longer the Prime Minister. Uh, but in any case, uh, what has happened is that there has been quite a delay, so uh, the priorities uh, have obviously been elsewhere. But I think it is all agreed that we all need to uh, think carefully and that uh, this place needs to be very careful about uh, uh, the need to strengthen uh, leadership within the Australian Public Service, uh, and the, uh, because ultimately the Australian Public Service uh, serves the people and the government of the day. Their policies need to be enacted. 
uh, and goes to the public service to actually uh, uh, initiate and bring those policies uh, to, to uh, this place in the form of uh, the bills and then ultimately to implement those policies out on the ground. I'm not quite so sure I really go with the uh, member for Throsby's uh, comments that uh, the public service is on the forefront of uh, every, uh, every big thing that's happening in the country. Uh, I'm not so sure I would say that is the case. Really, uh, the public service exists to uh, put those policies that the government says before the election, or in this case, this government after the election as well, uh, and bring those through uh, and to the point of initiation and uh, implementation. And it is important as well that uh, we be very clear on the matter that uh, the public service should not be uh, political in any case, and it should certainly not be self-serving in any case. Uh, and so it does uh, behove the government as well to make sure that the, through their actions that the public service is not politicised in any way. Uh, because a public service that is seen to be politically uh, 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 partisan in its uh, activities, of course, undermines confidence uh, in the public service uh, and obviously uh, then leads to um, a, a lack of confidence. And that is obviously not the case with uh, this uh, public service. Uh, we have uh, confidence in, uh, in so much of what the public service does. Uh, but uh, again, the government should be careful, and obviously the public service uh, should be very careful in the way that it uh, is seen to be performing its duties as well. Um, we have heard uh, that there have been negotiations that the Shadow Minister, uh, the member for McKellar, has uh, conducted with the, uh, with the government's minister, which has seen uh, the agreement that there will be uh, amendments, uh, coalition amendments that will be accepted by the government and obviously government amendments that will be accepted by uh, the coalition. And in speaking to that, it is, that is very good news. It is very good news because there is, a, uh, there is a history, sadly, in this country of uh, where there, can be, there have been appointments uh, made by uh, governments. And I, I look back not very far to the uh, Labor uh, government of New South Wales uh, and the creation of, their, uh, of the unallotted list, a burgeoning unallotted list, which, was, uh, which constituted uh, millions of dollars in salaries each year, uh, $16 million a year, apparently. Uh, for uh, SES or very senior public servants uh, employed but actually not having been required to do any work. And so I think it's probably par for the course that uh, the original concept of this bill before those amendments have been agreed on uh, would have seen uh, this government uh, given the opportunity to again create such a list. And when we speak of such a list and uh, the need obviously that uh, 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 being added to a list or being given a job or given a pay grade with no actual responsibilities. Uh, that is exactly the sort of thing which can create a perception of uh, loyalties to those that might create that list or might bring people onto that list. And I think that, that is very clearly a bad idea uh, for a public service uh, because it will be in some ways, just create the, the view that uh, there is a, a level of loyalty that, um, that can be owed to those that make those appointments. And I guess one of the clear, well, one of the, in, I'm sure, sorry, I wouldn't say clear, one of the interesting implications of what happened, as the member for McKellar said, after the last election, that uh, uh, Dr Henry uh, provided a certain level of advice uh, to the independents which uh, undermined and cast doubt upon uh, some of the figures of the uh, coalition, some of the election commitments, some of the, el the election figures of the coalition. Uh, and, and yet, not long after that, uh, then allowed those when the government needed those figures to uh, match up for them. And then when he uh, resigned as Secretary of the Treasury and then received an appointment from the Prime Minister 
uh, again, for uh, quite a deal of money, as I recall. Uh, I think it was uh, something like, uh, uh, on a pro rata basis, a part-time uh, uh, basis of some $307,000 uh, a year. Uh, I guess it's, it's one of those things that uh, if, if you create a system whereby uh, people can be appointed again uh, for uh, an unallotted list, can be appointed to do a particular task, uh, and that the government gets that opportunity, the Prime Minister gets that opportunity to uh, make those uh, appointments, then it, it can be highly desirable, I suppose, uh, for a person to uh, seek one of those appointments. And I guess as well, when you go from a, an important public service position, uh, who had an important role in the post-election uh, uh, administration uh, in dealing with the independence, and you go from that position, and then you go to a government-appointed position uh, at the end of uh, your, previous, your last appointment, then there is the possibility that might, some people might perceive that as being something of a conflict of interest. And that is, of course, very bad for the public service. And uh, I'm quite sure that uh, uh, the, the way... I mean, it is such a good thing that the uh, Special Minister for State has listened to the Shadow uh, Minister, the member for McKellar, uh, and has seen the light in this regard, because maybe it wasn't... Uh, uh, it was a great example of, of what actually happened with regards to Dr Henry, uh, and uh, we now see that there is a, that level of risk. Uh, maybe the government even has seen that element of risk uh, that that might go to uh, undermine this, the position of uh, the public service or senior members of the public service. As I said earlier in my comments, it is obviously clear to the public service that uh, they must remain impartial as well, but also it is right for the government of either persuasion to also not put people in the position whereby uh, the uh, the, the public would have a low, lessened confidence in the impartiality of uh, the public service. So uh, it is certainly good that uh, those amendments have been agreed to, and that we'll see them come out up uh, in the third reading aspects, the consideration and detail of uh, this bill. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to uh, make some comments tonight on this matter, uh, and uh, I do appreciate that the government has uh, embraced uh, the uh, amendments that the member for McKellar has uh, put forward. And I think that uh, what we will have is a uh, much improved bill as a result of that. I thank the uh, member for Cowan. The question is that the bill be now read a second time, and I call the member for Canberra. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to speak to tonight about these important bills, which are designed to improve the way the Australian Public Service responds to the challenges of the future. Uh, this bill and the amendments are very significant in terms of modernising the Australian Public Service. And as the member for Canberra, Canberra, I proudly represent thousands of public servants, thousands and thousands of public servants, and I'm always enormously pleased when the Labor government delivers improvements to the public service. In this case, measures that ensure the public service has the capability to better manage information. Now, as the member for Canberra, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm also a fierce advocate for our public service and the people who work extremely hard to implement government policy and keep our country ticking. Mr Deputy Speaker, the technical amendments contained in this legislation ensure that both the Public Service Commissioner and the Australian Public Service Commission are able to deliver on the wide-ranging reforms that will benefit public service workplaces. Specifically, this legislation will empower secretaries and others in leadership groups to provide a much greater range of independence and accountability in the delivery of policies. The amendments in this bill will clarify the roles and responsibilities of secretaries, and these measures will spell out the, service, the, the, the services and the performance that's expected of secretaries, and will additionally strengthen secretaries, the, the secretary's accountability to ministers. There are specific amendments to the employment arrangements for the secretaries in this bill. And importantly, these amendments revise the APS values, which is really, really important, and introduce a set of employment principles that will assist in unifying the APS around an ethical, high-performance culture. 
They will also modernise the functions of the Public Service Commissioner and recognise the Commissioner's role as the central authority for APS workforce development and reform. Mr Deputy Speaker, this legislation continues the Gillard government's agenda of improving and enhancing the Australian public service. The, the Gillard Labor government has ensured that we have a strong public service and we will continue to build a strong public service and I will continue to advocate for a strong and stable public service, Mr Deputy Speaker. We will always make sure the public service is able to tackle current challenges while keeping growth under tight control. And as every member here knows, I am a passionate and strong advocate for Canberra and for the Australian Public Service and also for our, uh, the ADF as well. Mm. And the reason the Public Service needs to be defended is because of the threats and attacks to its integrity and performance by those opposite. The opposition have made an art form of attacking the Australian Public Service and the integrity of the people who work there. Now, neither the Australian Public nor the Australian Public Service can afford what those opposite could potentially subject the public sector to, um, to uh, particularly in terms of a boom and bust mentality. The budget surplus that the government is committed to will create a buffer against any further global economic turmoil. And however difficult this budget will be, it will not lead to the feast and famine experience that I saw, I witnessed firsthand, in the 1990s when the Howard government randomly slashed almost 30,000 jobs across the public service across the nation and they had to expand public service numbers because of the damage of those cuts. Uh, the coalition thinks that Canberra bashing and demeaning the public service is a good thing. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm constantly in committees where I, uh, there's numbers floating around about 12,000. There's a commitment from um, those opposite to cut 12,000 jobs, but then it gradually increases. I hear that DMO is going to be added to the list. I hear that another government agency is going to be added to the list. I hear another government agency is going to be added to the list. It just keeps going up and up and up. We're probably about 20,000 on the public record, but in conversations I've had with those opposite, I'm probably back up to about 30,000. Now, 30,000 is what we experienced in 1996 uh, nationally, and uh, what that meant for Canberra. Uh, well, we lost about, I think it was between 15 and 20,000 public service jobs here. That's probably about two or three suburbs in my, uh, in my electorate. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, what that meant in Canberra was that house prices plummeted. Uh, people left town. The, the only growth industry was really in removalists. It meant that uh, we uh, had uh, a few um, seasons of um, negative growth uh, when the rest of Australia was growing. Uh, it meant that, and it didn't just have an effect here. I mean, it meant that the local shops closed down. It meant that uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the the house prices plummeted. It had this huge knock-on effect in Canberra, but it also had a significant knock-on effect in the region, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And you only need to speak to my colleague from the member for Mead and Monero to actually understand that. What we saw was uh, this this ripple effect right throughout the region, right throughout the capital region, where uh, jobs, because Canberra is a hub, is a regional hub. We, we provide, it depends on the service, but in some instances we provide up to 50 per cent of services around into the region. Um, in some, I, th I think in cancer, particularly in cancer treatment, we provide up to 50 per cent of treatment for the region. So we have this, in terms of health, it's between 30 and 50 per cent. Education, about 30 and 50 per cent. We provide a range of services to the region and we also employ a lot of the region. So when you're, lose, when you're looking at the loss of about 15 to 20,000 jobs, as we experienced in 1996, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I was one of those jobs, uh, then you, uh, the impact is significant, not just for Canberra but the region. We saw you just go down to the coast and uh, about two-thirds of, uh, two of the houses were on the market uh, because of the, the huge uh, knock-on effect it had in terms of the region, in terms of jobs, in terms of house values, in terms of economic growth. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the coalition is uh, I just I talk to my um, uh, when I talk to constituents, when I go out and do my mobile offices, when I go out and do my community forums, one of the big things that they're really concerned about is an Abbott led government. Because they know that from past experience, from bitter experience, I mean nineteen ninety six the farewells were held en masse, Mr Deputy Speaker. You go to a farewell and there are probably about tw uh, 10 or 12 people at the lunch. Every Friday you go to a lunch of between 10 or 12 people who would lost their jobs. So they know and understand what um, a, uh, a coalition government can mean for Canberra because they have first-hand experience of it in 1996. And, uh, 
That's when we were uh, plunged into that era of, um, of a, a number of quarters of negative growth, and it took us years, about five years, to get out of that. I mean, we've got, we've got huge infrastructure programs here now. We've got BER programs. We've got roads being built. We've got cranes on the horizon. Mr Deputy Speaker, I can't, in, the, in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, I cannot remember seeing a crane on the horizon in Canberra. And it's just wonderful to see so much growth and investment in this city, thanks to Labor. Investment in roads, investment in the Monero Highway, investment in the Madura Parkway, investment in uh, a number of government buildings, investment in BR programs. There's a significant investment in Canberra because Labor is committed to Canberra. Canberra. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, uh, in terms of the uh, legislation, that's, uh, this legislation, it builds on the capacity of the public service to modernise and to meet future challenges. And it just doesn't sort of just look at the public services as, as, a, um, as an expense. Uh, that's something that needs to be taken an acts to. It actually, we rely on a strong and uh, a vibrant public sector, and, it's, and we value it. Now, Mr. Spe De uh, Deputy Speaker, I also want to remind um, those listening here today, this evening, the Australian public service includes men and women who, who I just want to talk about the jobs that they do, because they, do, they perform enormously uh, important functions, and they do it very quietly. They're, they are the real quiet, the silent heroes. I think I called them in my, my first speech. They are they, the invisible heroes. They go about their business just quietly. Uh, and serving the nation, trying to make a difference, trying to improve lives quietly throughout at the local level, quietly and, uh, through at the national level and also at the international level. It's public servants, Mr Deputy Speaker, who provide our health and aged care services. They deliver to the sick and frail. They manage our food production from the farm to the table. They educate our children. They build our universities and our higher education sector and they ensure our workplaces are safe and fair, and the list just goes on and on and on. Now, as I've, I've highlighted the huge contrast between those opposite and uh, Labor on the public service, Mr Deputy Speaker, we will always support the incredible dedication and hard work of Australian public servants by improving the way they op operate. And uh, this legislation, this, these bills and the amendments go a long way towards doing that. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's, uh, the, we're introducing legislation today that uh, will improve and enhance the operations of the Australian Public Service. We are committed to public, the public service and public servants. Uh, we alone recognise and support the thousands of public servants who serve their country in so many ways, in so many, every day, in invisible and quiet ways. These amendments will improve the operations of that service and provide better capacity to manage future challenges. Yeah, and I commend yeah. this bill to the House. Yeah. I thank the member for Canberra. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Hasluck. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I rise to speak on the Public Service Amendment Bill. And in doing this, I certainly read the report ahead of the game to see what the uh, propositions were that were being included, and certainly the uh, public Service Amendment Bill explanatory memorandum, and I think that I would agree that there are many changes proposed within the uh, legislation out of the report that will modernise the public sector, but also will create a sense of change and reform that is for the better of the country. The Public Service Amendment Bill makes a number of amendments to the Public Service Act of 1999 relating to the Code of Conduct conduct for public servants and the changing values and employment principles for APS employees. The Public Service Amendment Bill is in response to the report ahead of the game blueprint for the reform, reform of Australian Government Administration, which was released on March 2010. The proposed amendments, and I'll cite out of the forward, the proposed amendments aim to strengthen the management and leadership of the public service and to help to embed new practices and behaviours in its culture. And I think all of us in this chamber would agree that that is an absolutely necessary uh, undertaking and task, because the public service does provide that level of advice and direction, but certainly in working with ministers, shape the policies and key strategic services, programs and the interrelatedness that exists within a federation. 
And to that extent, the public service fulfils its role uh, tremendously. The report ahead of the game, Blueprint for Reform of the Australian Government Administration, proposes reform to the Australian public sector in four key areas. Firstly, forging a stronger relationship with citizens through better delivery of services and through greater involvement of citizens in their government. And if the legislation enhances that and there is the reality that that does achieve that, then I think that our progress in implementing the legislation has significant merit. Second, strengthening the capacity of the public service to provide strategic big picture policy and deliver advice that addresses the most difficult policy challenges of the day. Third, invest in the capability of the public service workforce through improved recruitment and training processes, greater mobility and alignment of working conditions across agencies and a new, more consistent approach to employee performance. And within that, I would have assumed that all of the members of the senior executive service would also meet those requirements and that if you have a contract, then on merit, you would apply for your position again and if you win the position, you would then be appointed in accordance with the normal practice that prevails. We've seen some variation to that, which is of concern, because when you have unfettered power, you give unfettered power to an individual or a small group of individuals, then we often see some practices come into play that are not uh, conducive to the way in which merit selection processes occur within the public sector. But the report also says, fourth, introducing a stronger focus on efficiency and quality to ensure that the agencies are agile, capable and effective, backed up by measures to help them plan and improve their performance. The blueprint recommends nine key interdependent reforms which seek to deliver better service for citizens, create more open government, enhance policy capacity reinvigorate strategic leadership, introduce a new public service commission to drive change and provide strategic planning, clarify and align employment conditions, strengthen workforce planning and development, ensure agency agility, capability and effectiveness, and improve agency efficiency. I would have thought that our current public sector does a lot of that now. Uh, with the tweaking, though, and the one that excites me most is its responsiveness in the way in which it will engage with citizens, the private sector and relevant sectors for which they develop programs, policies and strategies that will make a difference to the lives of all Australians. And let me assure you that many constituents in all electorates will welcome these changes if they happen uniformly. But equally, let me assure you that they will be very cynical and will continue with the anger and frustration. And it is an opportunity to create an ongoing employment for senior public servants outside of their contract, guaranteeing them a continuance in employment with no significant change in salary. And the recent Ken Henry appointment reflects this to some extent. And that's where I have had constituents raise with me the golden opportunity that are given to individuals within senior executive positions and the salaries that are a continuation beyond the contract which expires for them into new roles where appointments are often seen as political. Every Australian would love that opportunity of going into new roles without having to go through a merit selection process because equally people see themselves as having skills that are commensurate to the types of tasks required for the jobs that are often within the public sector. Every Australian worker knows that on the expiration of a contract they are without a job until they find another through a process of competing on merit for a new position within an organisation. They would love the opportunity of being directly appointed to a high salaried position without going through that process. The blueprint sets an ambitious and interlinked reform agenda that seeks to improve services and programs and policies for Australian citizens. Above all, it recognises that to be strong, the APS must make the most of the talents, energy and integrity of its people. And I would have thought that the appointment processes required integrity, required the integrity that once you finish the contract, then you should compete for a position on merit and undertake that role. All governments, and I have been in the position myself where, as a public servant, 
you look to the whole fabric of integrity within the bureaucracies that you work. The proposed reforms therefore seek to boost and support the APS workforce and leadership and to embed new practices and behaviour into the APS culture. don't have a problem with that. I think that has significant merit. Of concern, however, this bill will give the Prime Minister greater power to extend the employment of departmental secretaries, allowing the Prime Minister to create new positions for secretaries who have resigned or whose contracts have ended. Wouldn't that be great if we could offer the same opportunity to every Australian in the context of their workplace, where they didn't have to compete and could be given high salaried positions on a basis equal to that that is proposed? The Prime Minister recently did this when Mr Ken Henry resigned from the position as Secretary of Treasury in April 2011, being appointed as a special adviser under Section 67 of the Constitution. The unattached list is also an un is a common practice in the public sector, both at the national and state levels and territory. And at times, there are people who have spent considerable time on unattached lists receiving salaries provided by the taxpayers and the battling families of Australia. And I would hope that it is not a practice that will see the transition of retired or uh, members who are secretaries into special appointments without a merit selection process. I acknowledge that there is skills and expertise that we have to seek when we assign a task that requires outside the square thinking. But I think there are other ways that we've done it successfully in the past, and certainly the former Prime Minister, uh, Kevin Rudd, in his 2020 forums sought to have the views of ordinary Australians and people with jobs in particular areas and specialised knowledge in particular areas to be part of the forward thinking that he had in mind when he established the Rudd government's credentials in the period that he led uh, government. I didn't see him appoint particular advisers to continually give him advice. Should this legislation be passed, the Prime Minister will have the power to create similar roles for any secretary who resigns or whose contract has expired. And I wonder if that would apply to somebody who reapplied for their position but didn't win it on merit and were given the opportunity of being slotted into a plum role. The coalition does not oppose the body of the bill. At present, the Prime Minister only has the power to appoint departmental secretaries to another role if their department has been abolished or if she has terminated them from their, from their position, both being rare occurrences in the current public sector. <coughs> the changes to section 60 will allow the Prime Minister to appoint depart departing departmental secretaries to new roles should they resign or when their terms of service expire and are not renewed. This has the potential to beginning of a practice similar to the New South Wales unattached list, which applies at the chief and SES level. The other interesting thing that I was reading was the financial implications and that there would be minimal impact, although the report itself says in a number of areas reform would require an upfront investment. For example, a new funding model would be required to support the APSC's additional responsibilities, including the coordination of workforce planning and agency capability reviews. Similarly, the citizen -centered, the citizen -centered reforms, such as developing and establishing an APS-wide citizen survey, would require resourcing early on. Over the long term, however, it is anticipated that the reforms, when implemented as a package, would deliver efficiencies and a return on investment. By building capacity and improving effectiveness, several reforms will drive effectiveness and efficiency gains across the APS, such as reducing the burden of internal red tape. And all the way through, the report is embedded with some tremendous thinking around the changes that are required, but it doesn't diminish the importance of public servants. What diminishes the importance of the process is the way in which this legislation will allow the Prime Minister, it doesn't matter whether they're coalition or whether they're a Labor-led government, 
to make appointments outside of the normal expected uh, behaviour that has predominantly governed the way in which appointments are made in the public sector. Deputy Speaker, I support the Coalition's proposition to amend the legislation by removing changes to section 60 of the Public Service Act, which will allow the Prime Minister to extend the terms of departmental secretaries <coughs> who have resigned or whose contracts have ended. I would not want to see over any period of time, and I support, some time, I support the sentiments expressed by the member for Canberra, that public servants do play a key and vital role. Uh, that their pathways and their career progression is certainly based on merit standards. It is based on a set of criteria, and they know with certainty that they have the opportunity to apply and be part of uh, their uh, agency or another agency. I think there are many meritorious elements of uh, the ahead of the game, but certainly I would not and could not support a proposition that would give unfettered power to a prime minister to appoint whoever, because sometimes within the public sector you don't necessarily have the particular type of knowledge or skill that is required in the shaping of a strategic direction, the detailed device in respect to uh, legislation. And this could apply to uh, gene uh, technology, the specialised areas of advancing science fields. In those instances, then there is not a problem in bringing in the right people to provide the level of advice. We have used committees effectively for that range of expert advice without having to appoint a retired or uh, senior public servants, secretaries in particular, at the whim of a prime minister. I think it, it is better that we have the integrity within the public sector and that we never ever diminish that. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, I thank the member for Hasluck. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Fremantle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak in support of the government's public service amendment bill. The bill is significant in that it is part of the government's ongoing program of measures to strengthen the integrity and professionalism of the Australian public service, a cause to which this government and preceding Labor governments have made major contributions over the past four decades. The bill represents part of the government's response to the report ahead of the game blueprint for the reform of Australian government administration prepared by the Advisory Group on Reform of Australian Government Administration. In particular, the bill captures the blueprint's recommendation that APS values be revised and restated as a smaller set of core values that are meaningful, memorable and effective in driving change. This recommendation was based on extensive consultation by the advisory group among APS staff and the wider community. It is this focus on core values which I wish to, which I wish to concentrate on in my remarks today. On the 8th of May 2010, then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd announced that the government had accepted all of the recommendations in the blueprint report and said in particular, we are committed to building an Australian public service with a culture of independence, excellence and innovation in policy advice and service delivery. Deputy Speaker, from my personal experience as a UN official, in which capacity I was closely involved with the creation of the UN Ethics Office, and from my current role as Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, I am well aware of the need for strong organisational efforts to give meaning to ethics codes and standards. Anyone who has worked in any organisation will know from experience or from common sense that merely publishing a code of conduct will not of itself entrench ethical practice. As management guru Chester Barnard observed as long ago as 1928, competent and committed man in leadership in managing the values of an organisation is an essential function of the executive in any enterprise. Former Australian Public Service Commissioner Andrew Podger made much the same point in his State of the Service report for 2004 when he observed that the APS values needed to be strengthened by institutionalising them in the day-to-day -day practices and procedures of departments. This is necessarily a task for the leadership, which the bill addresses directly. According to the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the core values of a public service are the basis for judgment about what is proper and improper in serving the public interest. Values stated in public documents such as legislation shape citizens' expectations about the mission and activities of public sector organisations. 
There is also a growing recognition that public servants are not solely motivated by financial rewards, rewards for performance, and that public service plays valuable. Uh, public service values play a role in promoting the performance and integrity of government. It is appropriate, therefore, uh, Deputy Speaker, that Part One of Schedule One to this bill provides new and enhanced roles and responsibilities for APS departmental secretaries, particularly in relation to their stewardship of the Australian Public Service's professional values. The bill strengthens secretaries' accountability to ministers in performing their roles and discharging their responsibilities. The bill's changes enhance both the independence of the processes for appointment and termination of departmental secretaries and the continuity of departmental leadership by countering perceptions that secretaries' terms in office may be tied to the electoral cycle. Deputy Speaker, it is, is perhaps not surprising that the many complex challenges facing the Australian public service today attract less public attention than those other major issues which engage most Australians. What is happening in the One Day International, who's winning in the NRL or the AFL? Will black caviar run away from the field again? Or who is on next week's Q&A? This is perhaps inevitable. But it may just reflect the fact that, as a community, we tend to take good governance for granted. And as a community, Australians should be entitled to take good governance for granted. But good governance does not just happen, and it is not just the responsibility of governments. It takes vision, effort, commitment, resources and a supportive community. Whether the task is delivering better education and health care, or better access to justice, or better use of public funds, or better resistance to corruption, better defence, better policy advice to government, or any of a thousand other goods, the capacity and willingness of the public service to deliver its part of the good governance package remains crucial to public trust in government. The bill, therefore, reflects many of the changes in Australian public administration which have occurred over recent decades, the shift away from central control to a more flexible operating environment while retaining a principles-based approach to decision-making and a strong focus on core values is the key to understanding the bill's objective. In responding to the Blueprint's Blueprint report's recommendation that the 15 APS values from the 1999 Act be revised to a smaller set of core values that are meaningful, memorable and effective in driving change, the bill addresses long-standing concerns about the Howard government's amendments to the Public Service Act in 1999 which were intended to legislate the APS values and code of conduct, primarily so they could be used for disciplinary purposes. Many critics at the time observed that the proposed formulation of the APS values was vague, ill-defined and conceptually incoherent. In commenting on the proposed changes, the Joint Committee of Public Accounts commented that the expectations imposed on employees by the APS values must be clear. In view of the potential seriousness of allegations of failure to uphold the values, which could result in termination of, an em of employment in the APS, it is vital that they be easily interpreted. Five years later, Commissioner Podger reported that much still needed to be done to embed ethics and values in practice. The State of the Service report for 2010-11 reiterates that message. Values and ethical practices cannot simply be stipulated. They must be built into the way an APS organisation manages and selects staff. They must be the basis of all internal and external communications and dealings, especially with ministers. They must be modelled at the top and at all senior levels, and they must be the subject of careful monitoring and continuing professional development education. The restatement of APS values in the bill is a critical part of meeting the Blueprint Report's recommendations. The core values themselves have been reduced from 15 to 5 in number. Integrity, committed to service, accountable, respectful, and ethical, uh, forming the acronym I CARE. Interpretation of the new values in the specific context of individual APS workplaces is to be a primary function of the Public Service Commissioner working with departmental secretaries. All, P all APS employees are to be bound by the code and are required to uphold the APS values. Agency heads and members of the SES are also bound by the code and will have an additional responsibility to promote adherence to the APS values. Deputy Speaker, integrity and ethics in the Australian Public Service has been a long-standing concern of Australian Labor governments. From 1976, when the Whitlam government established the Coombs Royal Commission on Australian Government Administration, to today. This government's particular contribution to the task has been significant. 
On coming into office in 2007, we enacted the 2007 Standards of Ministerial Ethics, which, among other things, endorses the professional independence and integrity of the Australian Public Service as a public, non-partisan resource. We initiated a parliamentary process to develop a forthcoming parliamentary members' code, which will complement the standards of ministerial ethics. The government initiated a parliamentary process for a comprehensive review of whistleblower protection measures in Australia and overseas, and on the basis of the committee's report, we are developing draft legislation, which uh, I, I sincerely hope will come before the House in the very near future. As part of the government's commitment to accountability and integrity, we established the new statutory Office of Information Commissioner and appointed a former Commonwealth Ombudsman, Professor John McMillan, as Commissioner to ensure transparency in APS and government decision-making. This government commissioned the review and report by the Advisory Group on Reform of Australian Government Administration, the report ahead of the game, blueprint for the reform of, of Australian government administration, made wide-ranging recommendations concerning the future management and structure of the Australian Public Service, all of which were accepted by the government. The bill now before the House evidences the government's commitment to ensuring that the blueprint's recommended changes are made, uh, both in legislation and in the daily practice of the Australian Public Service at all levels. Deputy Speaker, the Australian Public Service is a unique enterprise and a uniquely valuable one in a democratic society. We've seen for some time public services everywhere being subjected to higher levels of scrutiny and criticism and greater expectations of efficiency, service and responsiveness to governments and the public at large. We've known for some time that merely legislating for ethics does not work. Equally important is a commitment to recognise the crucial role played by departmental secretaries and the public service leadership generally in ensuring a culture of integrity and public trust in our public institutions. Tone at the top, for many years the mantra of the audit profession applies equally in this context. Setting this tone is one of the key responsibilities of the leadership in any organisation which seeks to function with integrity. Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. I thank the member for Fremantle. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Wright. I oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I rise to speak on the Public Service Amendment Bill 2012. And the bill seeks to make a number of amendments to the Public Service Act of 1999 to ensure that the Australian Public Service is able to continue serving the Australian Government, the Parliament and the Australian public to a high standard of ethics, efficiency and effectiveness. Mr Speaker, it is no secret that the Liberal Party policy when in government is to reduce the amount of public servants. Um, this is a line which is consistent with, with other states at the moment. But when I have the opportunity to speak with public servants in Canberra, relationships that I've made before coming to this place that I still have contact with, um, there is an element of frustration when you're having conversations with these people of the growing amount of compliance and burdens which surround their day-to-day -day activities. I have no doubt that the public service works extremely hard and they go home physically exhausted trying to maintain and upkeep compliance provisions that are thrust upon them. I also get the opportunity to witness the frustration that inhibits itself or surrounds itself with our customs, our frontline staff, as resources are taken from them. Recently I've returned from uh, the Somalian coastline on HMAS Anzac, where I spent time with Australian Defence Force personnel who are eminently frustrated with Labor's cutbacks in defence to the tune of roughly $2 billion and the impacts that it has on their lives. But when we talk about reduction of public servants, we on the coalition side don't talk about reductions at the front line. It's the back end office. It's, it's the back end stuff that we, that we will be focusing our energies on. How can we as a government, when it comes to public service amendments or, or, or reform, ask the Australian businesses, mums and dads, to tighten their belt with continually growing, I think it's now up to 30 new taxes, how can we ask businesses to tighten their belts when we have seen since 2007 the public service exponentially grow by an, a roughly 22,000 personnel? 22,000. 
And when I talk to my businesses in the electorate of right and ask them for um, feedback on how their day, how their day in their business is made easier by the number of public servants that, that are there, they're often, I'm often met with a, a very similar result or, or a comment of, my day hasn't got easier. In fact, it's got harder. I'm burdened with compliance. The Australian Institute of Chamber of Commerce and Westpac survey for the 17th consecutive quarter has indicated that the single biggest inhibitor of business growth is government taxes and compliance. On May 8, 2010, the then Prime Minister announced that the government had accepted all of the recommendations made in the earlier March release report ahead of the game, the blueprint for the reform of the Australian government administration. This report, the blueprint, print, outlined a comprehensive reform agenda to position the Australian public service to better serve the Australian government and the Australian community. It is an agenda that requires modernisation of the Public Service Act, bringing it into line with contemporary needs. The amendment of the bill will strengthen the management and the leadership of the public service and help to embed new practices and behaviours into its culture. Now, when we talk about new practices and new behaviours, the public service is, the public service is, is a quite an, an oddity because when you go through, as a businessman, before coming here as well, when we go through a line item, we don't start with a bucket of money whereby we have the mindset that if we don't appropriate this, this line item, we'll lose it. Business doesn't do that. That money drops to the bottom of your balance sheet and it becomes net profit. So when we look for areas of, uh, of waste or areas that we can be more efficient or diligent, there are a number of commercial practices. Um, and I understand that, that in the whole cold, hard light of reality, administrators shouldn't or cannot on occasions be, um, you know, treat their position as commercial. But it's interesting to do uh, an analysis of the difference of mindsets. This bill recognises that the delivery of high quality services and the policy advice requires effective and committed leadership, supported by a public service that is efficient driven by its desire to serve the community and contemporary in its outlook. Presently, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has the role to appoint de uh, departmental secretaries to, an to another role. And, it, and, their department has been, and if their department has been abolished or if the position is terminated, uh, both of those situations seem rare. Of concern, however, this bill will give the Prime Minister greater powers to extend the employment of departmental secretaries, allowing the Prime Minister to create new positions for, tr for secretaries who have resigned for those contracts that have ended. The Prime Minister recently did this with Mr Ken Henry when he resigned his position from the Secretary, uh, from the sec uh, from the Secretary of the Treasury in April 2011, then to be appointed as a special adviser under Section 67 of the Constitution. Should this legislation be passed, the Prime Minister will have the power to create similar roles for any secretary who resigns or contracts have been expired. This is a measure which would add to the number of public servants, and as such, it's in conflict with our policy, which I mentioned earlier, to reduce the, the, to reduce the public service numbers. Overall, the Coalition does not oppose this bill. However, the Coalition proposes to amend the legislation by removing changes to Section 60 to the Public Service Act which will allow the Prime Minister to extend the terms of the departmental secretaries who have resigned or whose contracts have ended. At present, the Prime Minister has only the power to appoint departmental secretaries to another role if their department has been abolished or if she has terminated them for their position, both being rare occurrences. The changes to Section 60 will allow the Prime Minister at will to appoint departmental secretaries to new roles should they resign or when their terms of service expire and or are not renewed. This has, the potential to, this has the potential to be the beginning of a practice similar to the New South Wales unattached list, which applies to chiefs and SES levels. Now, Before <coughs> coming to this place, I'm only a new member, I had no idea that there was such a thing as an unattached list. And learning and sharing with the Australian people, a ton of, an unattached list is actually um, quite a common occurrence in, in government when you have a high-ranking uh, official on normally superior 
uh, wage bans, when their, when their tasks or duties become um, uh, complete or their, their jobs are, are refilled with other positions, rather than in, in the commercial world you would take a back seat or you, you'd, be, uh, you'd be looking for another job. But these guys are actually kept on what we call, or what I'm now learned to, to understand, an unattached list. Well, I cannot point to anywhere, I cannot to point to anywhere in the commercial world or the corporate world or in mums and dads' businesses where that practice exists. It, 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 is, it bewilders me. Whilst this legislation at the moment is limited to secretaries, it sets a precedent and is contrary to our policy in reducing uh, to reduce rather than increase the public payroll. In New South Wales, Premier O'Farrell is moving to end the unattached list with a reported initial, initial saving of $16 million a year by removing 250 persons from the list. Well, if we've got state governments moving to reduce these lists and current legislation moving to introduce the list, uh, I, can only, I'm, I'm only, I can stand here and only say that I'm proud to be a part of the Liberal Party camp. If the Prime Minister has the authority to extend the employment of departmental, sec departmental secretaries indefinitely, the potential for even greater politicalisation of these roles could occur. Uh, in Queensland, we're making reductions to the, to the public service, trying to refer or trying to re, 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 uh, reunite the state with some economic <coughs> credibility and accountability. Whilst the loss of our credit rating in Queensland is not completely attributable to uh, the public service, there are you mean, ultimately our capacity to lose our, pub, our, um, our, our uh, credit rating um, is diminished by the fact that we are spending more than we are earning. Uh, we, <laughs> we are spending more than we are earning. So, as a result, tough decisions have to make. And I feel for I feel for the public servants that will ultimately lose their job, both in New South Wales and in Queensland, and into the future here in Canberra. But, however, I, mean, I encourage I encourage the Australian Labor Party when making these appointments into the future that history has a tendency of repeating ourselves. We are a government that ultimately pays back enormous debts, and we are a government that ultimately tries to reduce overheads. Uh, bear that in mind when in government in trying to, um, you know, trying to make prudent, prudent fiscal decisions. For, the good of things, uh, uh, for all the good things that this bill might bring to the Australian public service, it's the Labor way to surround themselves with those that may stay the political line. <coughs> Convenient appointments of ex-department secretaries into other roles under the discretion of the Prime Minister is not something that needs to be endorsed by legislation. At the 15th of March 2012, the head of the Treasury will make $615,000 a year, rising through to 653, and then by 2014, $805,000 a year. Not a bad gig if you can get it. On the 13th of February 2012, Ms. Renee Loam from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet told Senate estimates that Mr. Dr. Henry was working two and a half days a week. Uh, assuming that's still the case, um, and allegedly, uh, if, if Dr. Henry is, is still engaged in the Prime Minister's office on two and a half days a week, he could be picking up around $402,000 a year by, two, uh, by 2014. Uh, not bad salary for someone who's part time. I, I don't suspect that, that Dr. Henry is actually claiming. That, as he's now um, a, uh, a director or, or involved in, in the National Bank of Australia in some capacity, um, I first learned about Dr. Henry's um, involvement with the Australian Labor Party when I had the opportunity to read *The Australian Moment*, a, a book recently put out by George Megalogenis. And uh, at, up until that point, I had no idea that that, that um, Dr. Henry had actually spent some time in in uh, Previous Prime Minister's office in the way of Bob Hawke, and also did some some work with uh, with Paul Keating in then the floating of the Australian dollar. Um, I can't take anything away from the guy's capacity, uh, um, but it does it does um, it does bring into question the the capacity of politicians' salaries when uh, 
which are on the public record, when we start looking at, at salary bands of around 805,000, ours tend to fall into insignificant, yet we take the political heat um, of defending those in the electorates. Deputy Speaker, the Coalition will seek to amend the legislation by proposing the removal of section 60 of this bill. The public service sector should at least send, be seen to be non-political or impartial. These amendments seek to protect those public servants who do go about conducting their duties without any unbiased skewer. Uh, we support merit selection basis. We support a transparent application process. And I think with the uh, political tact that Dr Henry has shown in the past in serving Prime Minister of this, of this nation, um, one can only assume that he has left himself exposed and accepting a position with, by all accounts, limited uh, uh, transparent application processes for the position that he holds currently in the Prime Minister's office. Um, those, those comments are on the public record that there, I believe that there was no, no uh, advertised position, there was no <coughs> selection criteria to apply for. It was just a very cosy, friendly little uh, you're with us now. And as a result, uh, the government has led with a glass jaw on this one. And um, yeah, I wouldn't support I wouldn't support that further practices along those lines uh, be continued. I thank the speaker. I thank the member for right. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'm fortunate enough to be a member for a seat based in the ACT, and that means that I have the privilege of representing, meeting and working with a large number of public servants. Public servants form a significant part of my constituency, and I'm proud of the work they do and the contribution they make to a better Australia. Deputy Speaker, Labor is committed to the high standards of integrity and conduct in the Australian public service. We on this side of the House understand the importance of a strong, effective, efficient public service. And Deputy Speaker, there is a similar tradition on the other side of the House, a tradition that goes back to uh, Robert Menzies, a, condition, a tradition uh, carried through with uh, uh, so the uh, uh, member for Wentworth, a tradition that recognises uh, that it is through having strong and dedicated public servants uh, that we are able to implement policies that we believe will generate, create a better country. Uh, but I am concerned, Deputy Speaker, when I see in this debate uh, the growing incursion uh, of American-style attacks uh, on public servants, the notion that government isn't the solution, government is the problem. Uh, and nowhere more is that epitomised uh, than in the coalition's uh, pledge to cut 12,000 public service jobs uh, as the first way uh, of filling their massive funding gap. Uh, and it is through that, uh, that almost Pavlovian response, whenever the co coalition members are asked how they will manage to meet their budget shortfall, uh, what cuts they will make, uh, they go immediately to firing public servants. The member for Wright said that he feels for the Canberrans who would lose their jobs uh, were an Abbott government to be elected. Uh, well, I'm sure my constituents uh, are grateful for his concerns, but I suspect, Deputy Speaker, they'd rather just keep their jobs. And, Deputy Speaker, we see uh, this sort of, uh, uh, these sort of antics uh, when the member for North Sydney is, uh, is, uh, is giving particular examples of the public service departments that he would axe. Uh, the member for North Sydney is an honourable man, but uh, when it comes to speaking about public service departments, uh, has something of the Rick Perrys about him. Uh, members of the House will uh, remember uh, uh, Governor Perry uh, as the man who dropped out of the Republican race uh, when he couldn't manage to remember the third government department he was going to cut. Uh, the member for North Sydney uh, has said uh, that he will, uh, he will cut at least three government departments. Uh, the only difference between him and Governor Perry is he can remember them. Uh, he wants to get rid of much of the Department of Health, which he believes is overstaffed. 
which is odd, really, given that it employs about the same number of public servants uh, that it employed when the Leader of the Opposition was the Minister for Health. Uh, he wants to get rid of much of the Department of Climate Change, and he believes the Department of Defence Materiel uh, is also uh, in, in line for the cut. We on this side of the House have a different view of the public service. Uh, our view is that uh, uh, there is a valuable contribution made by public servants. Obviously, those closest to my heart are, are those in my own electorate, uh, but nationwide there are public servants uh, day in, day out making a contribution to build a better country. Deputy Speaker, in May this year I moved a private member's motion calling for a strong public service. Uh, the motion moved that the House recognise the important role played by the Australian Public Service in upholding and promoting our democracy and its key role in ensuring stable government. And the House commend the Australian Public Service on continuing to be one of the most efficient and effective public services in the world, and that the House condemn plans by the opposition to make 12,000 public servants redundant. In terms of the importance of a strong public service, Deputy Speaker, I join, draw the House's attention to the Centre for Policy Debe Development's uh, report, The State of the Australian Public Service, an Alternative Report, uh, authored by James Whelan, commissioned by Miriam Lyons, CPD's Executive Director. Uh, the report uh, goes through a range of aspects of public service reform, uh, including uh, pulling out some quotes uh, from parliamentarians uh, about the importance of the public service. Uh, the report, for example, notes the member for Wentworth judiciously observing, I think the critical thing is to ensure that government delivers its services efficiently at every level, but you just have to be smart about it. Uh, and that, that's what we have in this country, Deputy Speaker, uh, one of the most efficient and effective public services in the world. We saw that when the global downturn hit, uh, the rapid fiscal stimulus that saw Australian household payments uh, out before Christmas 2008 was only made possible thanks to dedicated, hard-working public serv servants. We were able to put in place uh, rapid fiscal stimulus, and we were able to do it in a way that was directed to households thanks to the, to the efficient work of public servants. When it's heading in, uh, uh, de dealing with natural disasters, uh, it's often public servants who are there making sure people receive their government payments. Uh, sometimes within days of a disaster hitting. Uh, there's public servants going to workplaces to make sure their conditions are safe. There's public servants keeping infectious diseases out of the country. There's public servants finding the best ways of protecting our natural environment. Deputy Speaker, there's more of the Australian public service than the work they do in policy development, implementation and service delivery. Uh, in, uh, uh, there, there are a range of jobs performed by local public servants, uh, and those public servants are often contributing to their community uh, outside their hours. I see their passion for community translating into a greater local benefit in the ACT, with our higher than average levels of volunteering, participation in sport and recreation. Uh, in, uh, in other states of Australia, we see uh, exactly that dedication as well. Uh, when the uh, Queensland floods hit, for example, Centrelink worker Gillian Harmon spent a month volunteering in flood-hit Queensland in Dalby. After she finished volunteering, Centrelink worker Ms Harmon returned home on Sunday night. The next day went straight back to work in the her Centrelink office in Juria in northern New South Wales. As the then Minister for Human Services, the member for Sydney, informed the House, uh, Ms Harmon was tragically killed that Monday going home for the office. I remember once hearing uh, uh, Vice President Al Gore uh, make the point that on September the 11th in the Twin Towers it was the government workers who were the only ones running up the stairs. When natural disasters hit, we're proud to have strong public servants uh, doing, the, doing the job uh, that they, they, are, they, do, they do so ably. Deputy Speaker, what concerns me is the coalition's strong commitment to making public, public service cuts. Uh, their policy at the last election, 12,000 public service cuts, uh, appears to be just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, asked on 7.30 on the 8th of May whether or not the coalition get rid of 20,000 public service jobs, the member for North Sydney refused to rule it out. Uh, and of course, the coalition has form on this. Uh, they went to the 1996 election saying their plan was a plan to reduce 
departmental running costs by 2 per cent. I actually have a copy of this uh, uh, policy document in, uh, in my office. Uh, you can even see on the back, uh, written and authorised uh, by Andrew Robb, uh, now of course the member for Goldstein. Uh, but did the coalition do just that? Well, sadly no, Deputy Speaker. They went much further. Uh, they had said they would uh, achieve their targets by not replacing a proportion of those who left over the first term of the coalition government through a process of natural attrition with no forced redundancies. They said there would be up to 2,500 positions. That's what this policy statement uh, with uh, Andrew Robb on the back of it says. But when they came to office, we saw in 1996-97 10,070 public service retren servants retrenched. 1997-98, 10,238. 1998-99, public servants. So upon winning office, the Howard government got rid of about 30,000 public sector jobs, about 10 times more than they said they would. Now, the coalition's desire, as the uh, uh, CPD report notes, the coalition's desire to reduce the size and cost of the Australian public service taps into small government movements that have been prevalent here and in other Western countries since at least the 1970s. The values, vision and policies of these movements are currently expressed by the Tea Party in the United States and Big Society in the United Kingdom. Deputy Speaker, uh, the, uh, the, I note that the Minister for the Public Service has said that he will support the member for McKellar's proposed amendment, uh, but I do want to uh, correct uh, something that has been said uh, by a number of opposition speakers, uh, that uh, these changes have something to do with Ken Henry. Uh, that, in fact, is not the case. Uh, the intention to broaden Section 60 of the Public Service Act had been part of proposed amendments since 2006, initiated under the forward, former government. But, Deputy Speaker, I can understand why those opposite are keen to bring Dr Henry into this debate, uh, and that's because uh, their attacks on Dr Henry are in some sense uh, symbolic uh, of how far they've moved from good economic policy. Uh, let's remember Dr Henry's career, a man appointed Secretary of the Treasury by Peter Costello, somebody who's faithfully served governments of both sides, uh, who advised uh, the, uh, the Hawke and Keating governments uh, and, through his experience and the downturn of the early 90s, uh, was able to move rapidly in the, when the global financial crisis threatened, but also a man who assisted the Howard government in implementing the goods and services tax somebody who operates very much in the bipartisan traditions uh, that uh, uh, Australians hold dear. Uh, but we've seen some, frankly, scurrilous attacks in this House uh, on Ken Henry's reputation, I think probably stemming uh, from the coalition's uh, uh, feeling sore about the $11 billion black hole that Treasury identified in their 2010 election costings. Uh, these are costings that the opposition decided they would have uh, done by a team of accountants uh, who were later uh, found guilty of professional misconduct for claiming they'd, committed, they'd carried out an audit where, in fact, they had done no such thing. Possibly better than using a catering firm to do your costings, as uh, the member for Cook has advocated, but not much better. Uh, and, uh, of course, those costings were later found to be uh, out by a cool $11 billion. The response of those opposite are, was, uh, is akin to the response of a rich kid whose maths teacher has told him he's got an answer wrong. Uh, they went straight to the principal and asked for the maths teacher to be fired. Uh, in the case of Dr Henry, uh, they set about attacking his reputation, suggesting that the costings exercise was somehow political. Uh, and that, I think, was, uh, was a low point uh, and a departure from what I think has been a, a strong tradition on their side of the House as well as ours a tradition that respects public servants, that recognises that public servants uh, impartially serve both sides of this House. And I think no one has done that uh, better than Dr Henry. He has, taken his, he has made his fair share of criticisms uh, of Labor policies as he has for coalition policies. But he has a core set of beliefs and he is driven by va the values of making Australia a better place. Uh, and I, I would call on those opposite uh, to allow cooler heads to prevail uh, and to focus their attentions on reforms, uh, not on playing the man. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in the, uh, the couple of minutes uh, re remaining to me, uh, let me uh, simply note 
the, the, the bill proposes uh, uh, further amendments to the Public Service Amendment Bill 2012. Uh, that bill implemented legislative changes recommended by ahead of the game. Uh, those changes included a range of amendments aimed at good governance to sustain an Australian public service that's fit for purpose. The changes were a provision of, the, of a performance framework for departmental secretaries, the minimum length of initial appointment to be five years, revision of AP, APS values, uh, recognising the public service commissioner's role and allowing the commissioner to undertake a special review in specific circumstances. The first set of amendments in the bill concern temporary employees and will re restore the provisions currently in the Public Service Act that provide for subcategories of non-ongoing employment. The second concern the protection from information, of information and immunity from civil suit provisions. And they make clear that information obtained by entrusted persons acting under the direction of the Commissioner or the authority of those assisting the Commissioner are protected from unauthorised disclosure or use. The amendments in this and the parent bill are an important part of modernising the Australian public service. Deputy Speaker, every year thousands of young and not so young people move to the ACT to take up jobs as graduates in the Australian public service. I'm enormously pleased that through a difficult period of efficiency dividend, public service departments are continuing to hire new graduates. I call on all Australian young people to consider a career as a public servant. It is a challenging one, but it is a worthy one. And those public servants in my electorate and throughout Australia are working hard to build a better country. I commend them for their work and I commend the bill to the House. I thank the member for Fraser. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Bradfield. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the member for Fraser and I commend him on the, on the way in which he's used this piece of legislation to demonstrate that he is in support of public servants. And who would have thought that from a member from the Australian Capital Territory? Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak on the Public Service Amendment Bill, which, as we have heard from a number of speakers, amends the Pub Public Service Act 1999 with the intention of revising the Australian Public Service values, clarifying the roles and responsibilities of secretaries and uh, amending their employment arrangements, revising and clarifying the roles and functions of the Public Service Commissioner and improving the day-to-day -day workforce management of the Australian Public Service through a range of operational amendments. The purpose of this exercise, we are told, Mr Deputy Speaker, was to position the Australian Public Service to continue to serve the government to a high standard and to equip it to meet current and future challenges and the expectations of the government and the Australian community. Well, those are all very worthwhile objectives, and in the main, the coalition uh, supports the broad direction of this bill, with one very significant exception, which I'll come to. I'd like, in the brief time available to me, to make essentially three points. The first, that on the coalition side of the House, as much as on the government side of the House, we are strongly in support of the proposition that a high-performing public service is very much to be supported and desired. The second observation I'd like to make is that some key recent trends in the public service tend to increase the urgency of improving the efficiency and performance of the public service, which, as we are told, is the objective of this bill. And I want thirdly to make the point that the coalition does not support one aspect of this bill, which is the provisions which would make it easier to redeploy departing departmental secretaries. Let me turn firstly to the importance of the public service. Some 160,000 Australians are employed by the Australian Public Service, with the biggest employers being the Australian Taxation Office and Centrelink, and, uh, as well as uh, being employed in a whole range of other departments and agencies. And it's certainly an uncontentious proposition that a high-performing and well-organised public service is vital to the good operation of government. Under the traditional Westminster model that uh, applies in Australia, Departments manage and implement government policy across all of the range of policy areas for which government has responsibility. And so the public service has a critical role to play in the overall system of government. As the former Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Peter Shergold, has noted, uh, the range of things that public servants do is wide. He notes that they deliver welfare benefits and health benefits, identify labour market opportunities, issue passports, scrutinise tax returns 
and decide on migration visas. They administer grants and award contracts. Every day they make decisions that affect the hopes of citizens. And so, therefore, it is exceptionally important to the lives and well-being of Australians that all of these tasks are carried out as well as they might possibly be. The blueprint for the reform of Australian government administration, the document which underpinned the legislative changes the House is now considering, made some key points about the importance of the Australian uh, public service. It noted that Australia's prosperity will be influenced by the ability of the Australian public service to tackle future domestic and global challenges and that the Australian public service needs to respond to organisational challenges, including a tightening labour market and fast-paced technological change. And the report notes that a capacity to provide high-quality, innovative and forward-thinking advice to government will be critical for addressing future challenges. Well, I think we can all agree with those propositions, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And that brings me to the second area that I wanted to address in the time available to me, which is to look at key recent trends in the public service and ask ourselves whether those trends are consistent with the objectives set out in the legislation before the bill this evening. The question really is whether we are seeing the efficiency and effectiveness of the public service improving or, under this government, being threatened. We have certainly seen a massive blowout in the size of the public service uh, since the last full year of the Howard government in 2006-07 to this year, 2012-13, there will be an increase of some 20,000 government employees. Uh, I have asked a question on notice uh, of every cabinet minister as to how many new departments, agencies, commissions, government-owned corporations or such bodies have been created within their portfolios since the Rudd government was elected to office. Not all ministers have so far responded, but to date some 34 different bodies have been identified, ranging from NBN Co with about 1,300 staff to the Australian Qualifications Framework Council with three staff. And total staff numbers across all of those newly formed entities number around 4,700. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are seeing a growth in the public service and on ordinary principles of productivity and efficiency, uh, when you see growth, at the very least you want to see a corresponding increase in output and ideally you want to see a greater increase in output if you are to achieve productivity, that's to say more delivered per unit of input, in this case per unit of input labour. And I'm sorry to say that um, it's hard to be satisfied that we are in fact seeing that improvement in productivity. What we have seen is uh, an extraordinary increase in regulation and in the volume of legislation which is being generated in the 42nd parliament, some 409 acts, and in the 43rd parliament to date some 273 acts are centred. Now the government will say that that is of course evidence that everything is going marvellously well. A competing view is that we are seeing an explosion of regulation imposing in many cases ill-considered and poorly thought through burdens upon citizens seeking to live productive lives. We could look, for example, at the introduction of the carbon tax with its thousands of pages of legislation and, of course, the massive bureaucracy to administer that legislation. According to a report in The Australian, there are some 118 officials in the Department of Climate Change and Sustainability who are part of the senior executive service. Uh, certainly, I think it's an uncontentious proposition that the Department of Climate Change uh, has proved to be a very happy source of employment for a large number of people, many of them on very large salaries indeed by community standards, bearing in mind that according to taxation st statistics, 90% uh, of Australians are learning, earning less than $100,000 a year. Well, a very large number of people in the Department of Climate Change are earning significantly more than that. Madam Deputy Speaker, another area which raises concern about the efficiency of the uh, public service, the purported objective of the changes in this bill, is the increasingly chaotic administrative arrangements followed by the Rudd, Gill the Rudd government and subsequently the Gillard government. Uh, the general principle for good administration in business and in government is to have clear, a clear organisational and reporting structure so that you can then have clear accountability and good outcomes. Unfortunately, the Rudd and then the Gillard governments have followed arrangements which have been the absolute antithesis of these principles. Historically, it's been accepted that you would have a cabinet minister appointed with executive and political responsibility for each department of state. The cabinet minister would be supported by a junior minister and in some areas there would also be support from a parliamentary secretary. This 
produced a clear and logical structure, each portfolio represented in Cabinet by one minister and each ministerial, ministerial portfolio with one department. This meant, amongst other things, that junior ministers and parliamentary secretaries would operate clearly within the confines of one portfolio, and there was a clear and direct relationship between the department and portfolio ministers. This basic approach, in fact, was entrenched in reforms in the late 1980s by the then Hawke government. Unfortunately, since the commencement of the Rudd government, we've seen a very significant deviation from this approach. Mr Andrew Podger, who is a former Health Department Secretary and also a former Public Service Commissioner, has uh, analysed these changes, uh, both with those perspectives and in, in his current capacity as Professor of Public Policy at the Australian National University. And he's been very critical of the approach to public sector administration under the Rudd and Gillard governments. It seems that what we have is a move from simplicity and accountability to complexity and confusion. Certainly the traditional role of one port rule of one portfolio and one cabinet minister has gone out the window. Following the most recent reshuffle by the current Prime Minister, there are now six portfolios with more than one cabinet minister. And even more problematically, some cabinet ministers have responsibility across several departments. For example, uh, the, uh, uh, Greg Combe is the Minister for Industry and Innovation within the Department of Industry, Innovation, Science, Research and Tertiary Education. He is also Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency within the department of the same name. Bill Shorten is another cabinet minister who has two portfolios, um, uh, one sitting within Treasury and one sitting within Education, Employment and Workplace Relations. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, this approach of multiple cabinet ministers across portfolios uh, can tend to mean a lack of accountability and uh, a lack of clarity as to who has ultimate responsibility. I have no doubt that these arrangements will be leading to administrative confusion and inefficiency and will be undermining the critical relationship between a department and its minister, which is so important if the work of government is to be done effectively and, of course, if public servants are to be able to work clearly and effectively to achieve the priorities of the government of the day. The chaotic arrangements that have been put in place under the Rudd and subsequently the Gillard governments mean that many ministers are now required to manage multiple relationships with multiple departments and, more problematically, the departments, of course, are required to manage multiple ministers. No doubt there are also practical problems arising, for example, from the fact that different departments use different IT systems or on matters as simple as whether it's necessary to have departmental liaison officers from multiple departments in the office of one cabinet minister. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, the performance of this government when it comes to actually getting the best out of the public service has been a long way short of the rhetoric which underpins the bill which is before us this afternoon. I think if you look at how effectively cabinet government worked, certainly under the Rudd government, it's pretty clear that the guiding principle was to sideline cabinet as a proper decision-making body and leave most decisions to be made by a kitchen cabinet comprising the then Prime Minister and three other ministers. And that approach, that chaotic approach, has been reflected, I would argue, throughout uh, the entire public service as it seeks to respond to the priorities set for it by government. If government's not doing a good job of setting those priorities, then necessarily the public service is not going to be very efficient and productive. Let me turn now to the final point that I wanted to make, which is to highlight the perspective the opposition takes on one particular element of the bill before the House, which is the proposal contained within the bill to amend uh, section 60 of the Public Service Act so as to give the Prime Minister the power to extend the terms of departmental secretaries who have resigned or whose contracts have ended. This is something that the Prime Minister recently did when Mr Ken Henry resigned from his position as Secretary of Treasury in April 2011 and was then appointed as a special advisor under section 67 of the Constitution. If the bill before the House uh, passes in its present form, the Prime Minister will have the power to create similar such roles for any secretary who resigns or whose contract has expired, but without the scrutiny which is required under section 67. 
The coalition's concern is that, amongst other things, this is a measure which would materially, uh, risks materially adding to the number of public servants, and we don't think it is consistent with good principles of public administration. It contrasts with the law as it presently stands, under which the Prime Minister only has the power to appoint a departmental secretary to another role if that secretary's department has been abolished or if the Prime Minister has terminated that secretary from his or her position. And both of those are relatively rare occurrences. The amendment which is proposed in the bill before the House would allow the Prime Minister effectively at will to appoint depart departing departmental secretaries to new roles should they resign or whenever their terms of service expire and are not renewed. In the coalition's view, this has the potential to be the beginning of a practice similar to that which has been pursued in New South Wales for many years of having an unattached list at the um, senior executive service level within the public service. I'm pleased to note that in New South Wales, Premier O'Farrell has moved to end the unattached list arrangements, reportedly to secure savings of $16 million a year by removing some 250 people from the list. The coalition is very concerned that this amendment would lead to a similarly uh, wasteful and profligate approach in the administration of the Commonwealth Public Service, and so that is an amendment we do not support. Let me close by uh, reiterating, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that on this side of the House we are very strong believers in the importance of having a productive and efficient public service. To the extent that the amendments in this bill are designed to uh, increase um, the productivity and efficiency of the public service, they have our support. We note that there is something of a gulf between the objectives stated in this bill and the actual way in which the Rudd and Gillard governments have conducted themselves and managed the relationships between ministers, particularly cabinet ministers, and the public service, which has tended to reduce the efficiency of the public service. And we certainly hope that the objective of increasing the productivity and efficiency of the public service is one that can be achieved um, and that this bill will uh, make some contribution towards that. The member's time has expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the minister. Madam Speaker, I thank members for their contribution to the debate on the public service amendment bill. I thank the members for McKellar, Cowan, Hasluck, Bradfield, Wright, Throsby, Canberra, Fremantle and Fraser. I thank you all for your contributions. Today is the third anniversary of my father's funeral. I mention that purely because it allows me to tell a story of the Australian Public Service. It allows me to tell a story of the day my father died, which was just three days ago, three years ago. And the day following my father's death, my mother and I went to visit Centrelink. And we went to visit Centrelink because mum had to rearrange her pension affairs. And I thought it was an interesting exercise in accompanying mum and showing mum all the love, care and support that she would expect her son to provide her with. But I was also interested to watch and to see the performance of Centrelink on that day when they had to deal with a grieving, frail 78-year-old who had lost her husband of 51 years. Now, when Mum arrived with me at Centrelink, she was saddened, she was teary, um, but she had things that she needed to do documents to fill in. The people at Centrelink were simply fantastic. They supported Mum as she needed to be supported. They provided her with the comfort that she needed and they provided her with the care and consideration that she needed. It made me proud. It made me proud as a parliamentarian. It made me proud as a son. And it made me proud of the way in which that service was delivered by our public service. Now, we're in Canberra, the capital of the Australian Public Service, and if that were an event that had happened at Woden, it would be pretty good. If it happened at Parramatta, we'd be pretty pleased. If it happened in Sydney or in the Perth CBD, we'd be pleased. If it happened in Wyala, 400 kilometres north of Adelaide. And what it showed to me was 
the care, the consideration and the capability of our public service could reach with such consideration and cradle my mum at her time of need. Centrelink is a fantastic organisation put together 15 years ago by a government seeking efficiencies, but by a government seeking to ensure that it delivered its services with care, consideration, compassion and precision. And my word, does it work well. And so I bring myself to this bill. It does make important amendments to the Public Service Act 1999. The government has accepted all of the recommendations made by the advisory group on reform of the Australian Government Administration. The group's report, ahead of the game, a blueprint for the reform of Australian Government Administration, outlined a comprehensive reform agenda to position the Australian Public Service to better serve the Australian Government and the Australian community. It was a reform agenda that requires the modernisation of significant aspects of the Public Service Act, bringing it into line with contemporary and foreseeable needs. Madam Speaker, the amendments in the bill strengthen the governance of the public service. The amendments in the bill strengthen the independence of the public service. The Australian public service is fundamental to the success of our country and our society. Our high-performing public sector is like a golden thread running through our history, building our nation while binding our nation together. The commitment and expertise of our public service directly affects the lives of all Australians. The bill clarifies the roles and responsibilities of secretaries to better reflect established practice, and it strengthens the independence of secretaries. Madam Speaker, this bill restores a gold standard. The appointment and termination of departmental secretaries that will return to the one supported that supported the integrity and consistency of our public sector for generations. The 1922 Act provided that all appointments as permanent head, that is secretary in today's terms, were made by the Governor-General. From the late 1940s, Prime Ministers Chifley and Menzies saw the Chairman of the Public Service Board advise the Prime Minister of the day on suitable candidates that could be recommended to the Governor-General for appointment. That system fostered a cadre of leaders that helped successive Australian governments transform our public service and build our nation. It was these leaders whose contribution created the modern Australian public service that was able, in the words of former Prime Minister Robert Gordon Menzies, to, and I quote, supply honest advice and to carry out honest and fair administration for whatever government or minister it may serve. Leaders such as Sir Robert Garran the Solicitor General and father of our Constitution, Sir Arthur Tangy, who laid the foundations for the Department of Foreign Affairs and helped build a modern Australian defence organisation. It cultivated leaders such as the great West Australian Dr Herbert Nugget Coombe, former Governor of the Commonwealth Bank, who helped rebuild post-World War II Australia, and committed our public service to work towards full employment. Now, most nations in our world created in the past hundred years have not been successful liberal democracies. Indeed, very few nations created since 1900 have enjoyed anything like Australia's success. Indeed, Madam Speaker, I'm fond of saying no other nation has enjoyed our nation's degree of success since our states came together to create the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901. A quality public sector leadership has helped us in our mission and it's ensured our success. And so it's preferable to restore the situation where the Governor-General is responsible for appointing departmental secretaries acting on the advice of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister would receive a report from the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department before making a recommendation in this regard. That report must be prepared after consulting the Public Service Commissioner and, for appointments, the relevant Minister. The strengths, this strengthens the independence of secretaries. The revised formulation makes clearer the roles and responsibilities of secretaries and the relationship between secretaries and ministers. Together, these changes provide for continuity of leadership and strengthen the integrity and transparency of the appointment process. And, Mr. Speaker, this bill establishes the Secretaries Board with a clear mandate for the stewardship of the APS. 
Likewise, the bill revises the roles and responsibilities of the senior executive service, making clear that their role includes promoting cooperation in the delivery of outcomes across portfolio boundaries. The functions of the Australian Public Service Commissioner will be modernised to recognise the Commissioner as the central authority for the Australian Public Service workforce development and reform, an authority that will take a leading role in ensuring that the service has the organisational and workforce capability to meet current and future needs. Madam Speaker, together, these amendments will strengthen the management and leadership of the Australian Public Service. It is the senior leadership of the Australian Public Service that is critical to driving the changes needed to enable the service to meet its challenges both now and in the future. This will also ensure that the expectations of both the government and our citizens are met. The bill also establishes a more succinct set of APS values, which continue to reflect enduring principles of public administration that go to the heart of the Westminster model of government. The values and employment principles together define the character of the APS and guide the way in which it conducts its activities and serves our community and the government. They continue to articulate the culture and operating ethos of the Australian Public Service and underscore its professionalism. The bill also contains a number of other operational amendments aimed at more effective management of the Australian Public Service. These amendments are informed by the experience of the operation of the Act over the last 12 years. I note that the Shadow Minister, the member for McKellar, will move an amendment to the government's bill. The government will accept this amendment in the spirit in which it's made and in the interests of achieving meaningful reform supported across this parliament. Madam Speaker, it is important that the public service legislation supports a service that is fit for purpose. This bill provides for a streamlined contemporary employment framework that will allow greater agility and responsiveness from the APS to our community and to the government. It will facilitate greater efficiency and more effective use of Commonwealth resources. The bill will also accelerate the cultural shift towards operating more effectively as a unified Australian public service, a 166,000 strong service that is accountable to ministers, equipped to deliver the government's priorities and responsive to the complex needs of our Australian community. Now, one of the most fantastic and enjoyable things a minister for the public service can do is engage with our graduate program. I've heard speakers in this debate today refer to the importance of that graduate program. Around the world, we see governments engaged in slashing and cutting budgets. And on occasions, that has meant that graduate programs have been compromised in those public services. I can state unequivocally the value of a graduate program isn't simply that it allows our public service to continue to recruit the very best, but it keeps our public service always with a youthful bent, with a capacity to always look attractive to the young people which it needs to recruit into its future leadership cohort. For any of those members present or who are interested in our fantastic Australian public service, I, as Minister for the Public Service, will be very happy to ensure that members are able to engage with that program and to see the quality of our graduates and to see the quality of the leadership that they will bring to our public service in the future. Ours is a public service that is working in the interests of all Australians, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year. As I'm fond of saying, every hour of every day of every week, a public servant is looking out for us, and I thank them for that. And I thank the opposition for their support of this bill, and I commend the bill to the House. I'll put the question that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The House will now. The clerk. Second reading a bill for an act to amend the Public Service Act 1999 and for related purposes. 
The House will now consider the bill in detail. I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. The question is that the bill be agreed to. The Minister. If I present a supplementary explanatory memorandum to the bill. I ask Leader of the House to move Government Amendments 1 to 28 as circulated together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Minister. I move the Government Amendments 1 to 28 as circulated together. Madam Speaker, the Public Service Act Amendment Bill amends the Public Service Act 1999 to provide for a modern contemporary employment framework for the Australian Public Service. The Government proposes two further amendments. The first relates to Part 10 of Schedule 1 of the Bill, which concerns temporary employees, and the second is a technical amendment concerning the protection of information and immunity from civil suit provisions in Parts 12 and 13 of Schedule 1, respectively. Part 10 of Schedule 1 of the Bill amends the provisions concerning the engagement of Australian public service employees. The bill, as introduced, includes amendments that provide that agencies may engage persons as temporary rather than ongoing employees, with the subcategories of temporary employment being prescribed in the regulations. The amendments moved today will restore the provisions currently found in Section 22.2 of the Public Service Act, which provide for subcategories of non-ongoing employment. Under the Act, a non-ongoing Australian public service employee may be employed for a specified term, for the duration of a specified task or for duties that are irregular or intermittent. The bill will continue to provide for regulations to be made to prescribe rather than limit the circumstances under which a non-ongoing employee may be engaged and to continue to prescribe grounds applicable to the termination of employment of a non-ongoing employee. Madam Speaker, Part 12 of Schedule 1 of the bill is intended to protect information obtained by the Public Service Commissioner or the Merit Protection Commissioner or other entrusted persons in the course of the Commissioner's review and inquiry functions. The amendments moved today will make clear that information obtained by entrusted persons who are acting under the direction or authority of or are assisting either of the Commissioners is protected from unauthorised disclosure or use. The bill, as currently drafted, is ambiguous in this respect. It is important that these provisions operate as intended to ensure inquiries are conducted properly and with the full cooperation of witnesses. The amendments to Part 13 of Schedule 1 of the Bill also make clear that such persons are immune from civil proceedings when acting in good faith. Madam Speaker, I commend these amendments to the House. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Um, all those of that opinion say aye. Those against, those against no. I think the ayes have it. I call the member for McKellar. Thank you. I seek leave to move the amendments that are circulated in my, in my name. Is leave granted? Member for McKellar. As I foreshadowed in my second reading speech, uh, I said I would be moving these amendments to take out of the bill those provisions which would have made it possible for the Prime Minister of the day to appoint a secretary who either resigned or whose term had expired to any position that Prime Minister wished, and it would be unended. Uh, I also said I'd be moving these provisions for the reason that this could create what is uh, known in New South Wales as the unattached list and has risen to vast numbers of public servants who remain on the payroll with no job to do, and secondly, because it could undermine the aspirational aims of this bill, which is to ensure that the public service is there to uphold the principles, which have now been uh, reduced from 15 to 5, and that the aspirations were at all times to give uh, true and fair advice to ministers, to government, but also to serve the public well. And indeed, the minister across the table has outlined some personal experience he had had where he found the public service acted uh, to give great comfort uh, and also to act for the benefit of, the, of a particular Australian who happened to be his mother. And I guess we've heard other stories in this chamber and there would be many people who can speak of uh, 
great experience and uh, important experience they have had from individual members of the public sector. But my concern all along is that we should not see uh, the aspirational terms of the Act undermined by having a situation where it would be possible for a um, departmental head to act to ingratiate him or herself with the Prime Minister of the day with the aim of obtaining a preferential uh, treatment upon resignation or the term coming to uh, expire. And during the course of that debate, we spoke about the appointment of Mr Ken Henry as the Head of Treasury, who had subsequently been appointed by the Prime Minister uh, on very favourable terms, but uh, to become an advisor to her on the same salary uh, as the current uh, serving head of the Department of Treasury receives for just 40 hours of work a week. Uh, and if less than that is worked, than on a pro rata. So in moving this, it was that dual concern that I had, that this is an aspirational bill and we don't want a provision in it that would undermine that aspiration of service to government and service to the people of Australia. Uh, and secondly, that we would uh, not wish uh, the bill to create the sort of situ allow the sort of situation that developed in New South Wales, uh, which has so outraged so many people to become a possibility in the federal arena. And for those reasons, I am moving these amendments, which very simply remove those provisions uh, that uh, would have facilitated uh, that to occur. Uh, and I'm delighted that the government has agreed to those amendments. So I uh, recommend those amendments to the House. Could I ask the um, member for Mackellar to formally move the amendments one to three oh, as I'm circulated sorry. in I her name I formally move together. the amendments one to three uh, as circulated in my name. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. Oh, it's my apologies, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The proposed amendment to section 60 of the Act was to allow the Prime Minister to re-engage a former secretary on terms and conditions determined by the Prime Minister. This provision was not aimed at conferring any additional entitlement on secretaries and it was expected to be used infrequently. It was intended to improve leadership capability in the Australian Public Service by making it easier to draw on the talents and the experience of former secretaries. I understand that the opposition does not support this provision and has proposed an amendment to the Public Service Amendment Bill 2012 to restore Section 60 of the Act. I'm prepared to support the opposition's amendment. I put the question that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that this bill as amended be agreed to. Um, I put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. <laughs> Excuse me. I think the ayes have it. This bill, as amended, has been agreed to. Minister. Thank you. I ask the Leave of the House to immediately move the third reading. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. I put the question that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Reading a bill for an act to amend the Public Service Act 1999 and for related purposes. I call the member for Fadden. You, you just called the Veteran Affairs Bill, do you, ma'am? She's got to call it, yes. <laughs> Next order of the day Government Business, number four, Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 2012, resumption of debate on the second reading. Now I call the member for Fadden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I move the amendments as circulated in my name. I move that all words after that be omitted with a view to substantiating the following words. The House declines to consider this bill until such time as the government introduces legislation to index military superannuation pensions for defence force retirement benefit schemes 
and Defence Force Retirement and Death Benefit Scheme members aged 55 and over in the manner as aged and service pensions are currently indexed. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Veteran Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill makes a series of minor technical amendments to various pieces of legislation that impact upon veterans. These amendments are generally non-controversial. The coalition supports the measures contained within the bill. However, the legislation can be made better. The coalition will seek to do so. First and foremost, we will draw a line in the sand tonight. We will seek to legislate fair indexation as a requirement for passing of this legislation. Enough is enough. We have called for this. We have gone to an election for this. We have moved a private member's bill in the Senate for this. We have re-announced it at the RSL at, uh, at Bendigo by the Leader of the Opposition. We will now seek to legislate this as a requirement of passing this legislation. Once this legislation is agreed to by the House, the Coalition will seek then to make the Veterans Pharmaceutical Reimbursement Scheme the fair system it deserves to be. We don't move this amendment lightly, Madam Deputy Speaker. The bill before the House makes important legislative changes, uh, which we support, although for the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme we seek to make better. But we believe that this government now needs to consider and introduce the fair, just and equitable arrangements for military superannuants. By preventing passage of the current bill through the House, until fair indexation is introduced, this line in the sand is drawn now. The time has come and it's time for this parliament to deliver this important reform. The government speaks about reform often, and in the government's words, every reform it does is either historic, monumental or world-leading. All I ask, all the coalition asks, is that a simple reform so that veterans have the same entitlement for indexation of pensions as per the age pensioners in Australia is considered now. It is a simple request. There is no hyperbole of the world's greatest reform. It is a simple request. Can I say the Coalition has a very proud record of supporting ADF personnel, whether they are serving or in requirement. We believe in the unique nature of military service. In the case of veterans and ex-service personnel, we are committed to fair indexation of military superannuation pensions. We committed to it as a policy at the 2010 election. We introduced a private member's bill. As I simply said, the Leader of the Opposition reiterated, no ifs, there is no buts. The government is fond to tell people within the country that we won't do it, as fond as they are of saying we won't roll back the carbon tax. Well, let me say very clearly to the nation, do not, do not doubt our firm view that we will do both of these. We will index the fair indexation of military pensions and we will roll back the carbon tax. We will do it. The Leader of the Opposition formally recommitted the Coalition on a number of occasions since the 2010 election. On 20 September 2011 at the RSL National Conference in Melbourne, Tony Abbott said, and I'll quote, it has long been to me and my colleagues in the Coalition verging on the scandalous that defence retirees do not enjoy the same indexation arrangements as other people who have retired. And again this year on Bendigo on the 5th of March, the Leader of the Opposition, together with the Shadow Minister for Veteran Affairs, Senator Reichel Ronaldson, signed the Coalition's pledge to deliver fair indexation. The pledge says, in no uncertain terms, that the Coalition is committed to our veterans and committed to delivering fair indexation to 57,000 military superannuants and their families. It says that the Coalition will ensure DFRB and DFRDB military superannuation pensions are indexed in the same way as aged and service pensions for those aged 55 and over. The Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Minister for Veteran Affairs signed two large pledges. Senator Ronaldson has one of them and I have one of them. 
If anyone doubts our commitment to it, walk into my office and there you'll see it signed by the Leader of the Opposition—a pledge a metre high and half a metre wide. That couldn't be clearer. Do not, do not believe the government's hyperbole. We will deliver this important reform. Frankly, I'd rather we delivered it now. I'd rather the government agreed with the amendment we are making tonight and did the right thing and indexed military superannuation the same as the age pension. My good colleague Senator Ronaldson, who I mentioned is a coalition spokesperson on veterans affairs, has at every veterans forum and every opportunity committed the coalition to this policy. In conjunction with these commitments, the coalition has also taken the concrete steps of introducing legislation to fairly index pensions. As I said on my behalf, Senator Ronaldson introduced my fair indexation bill into the Senate on the 18th of November 2010 to provide the fair, just and equitable indexation for DFRB and DFRDB military superintendents. On the 24th of March 2011, the Greens and Labor called for a Senate inquiry into the legislation. The coalition opposed yet another inquiry. The Greens and Labor used the inquiry to oppose fair indexation, the first time the parliament has ever opposed fair indexation. On the 16th of June 2011, in a shameful day for the Senate, the coalition's fair indexation legislation was defeated by Labor and the Greens. Therefore, let me say again, be under no illusion. The coalition is resolutely behind its policy that it has stated time and time again. The policy it took transparently to the last election in 2010, which is why I stand in the chamber this evening to seek to amend the Veteran Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 2012 so that the issue of fair indexation is given its due right of adherence. Can I say Labor's record on military superannuation reform is nothing short of a litany of hyperbole, hot air and inaction? Let's not forget that before the 2007 election, Labor led the veteran community to believe they would fix military superannuation indexation. And as I stand here, the Minister for Veteran Affairs is at, in front of me at the desk. Uh, and it is, it is great to see the Minister for Veteran Affairs to be here, and it is great to see him sitting here during the entire debate. And I thank you, Minister, for coming to listen to this important debate. And I know, Minister, that deep, deep down you want to do the right thing. The challenge is, since 2007, the government of which you, sir, are a minister has led the nation to believe that you would fix it. In fact, the member for Eden Monero, who is currently the parliamentary secretary for defence, together with Senator Kate Lundy, who is the minister for sport, both of them said in a letter to the former finance minister, Lindsay Tanner, dated 14 September 2009, and I'll quote it, minister, so we can all hear the words clearly. These two, including the junior minister for defence, said, Significantly, many people genuinely believe that prior to the 2007 election, the ALP had committed to determining a fairer method of indexation and a review would provide the direction. It is entirely appropriate, fair and consistent with our election commitment that the introduction of this improved indexation arrangement should coincide with that for pensions and benefits as announced by Minister Macklin. This is the words from the current Minister for Sport and the Parliamentary Secretary for Defence, a close colleague of the Minister for Veteran Affairs, who is sitting here tonight. They have both unequivocally called upon the government to honour what it led the Australian community to believe in 2007 to index military DFRDB and DFRB pensions. Their words have only been met by more obfuscation. Let's not forget that Labor failed to respond to the Podger review which was released publicly back in December 2007, four and a half years ago, and the government has not, it has not officially responded to the Pod review. And let's not forget the Matthews review, Minister, as I hear you talk about the reviewer review, sir, which I believe you spoke to and but indeed commissioned. It was a whitewash in name, it was a whitewash in fact, it was a whitewash in substance. 
It was a whitewash over its own false election commitment. Ten high-level inquiries into military superannuation indexation that all recommended change in the current arrangements. But yours, Minister, your inquiry was the only one that, surprise, surprise, said that we should keep the status quo as it is. Ten to one. Where I come from, Minister, it's three to one and you're out. It doesn't stop there. Labor's finance minister, Senator Wong, and veteran affairs minister, the Hon. Warren Stoden, who sits here tonight, have launched an ongoing scaremongering campaign in an effort to distract from Labor's lack of policy. Their argument is that the cost of fair indexation is too high. Minister Wong claims that the coalition's $100 million cash cost is actually $1.7 billion and that the scheme will cost $4.5 billion to fully implement. The finance minister, like Minister Snowden, is deliberately misleading. The cost over the forward estimates in cash terms is between $100 and $150 million, depending upon which side of the view you take. That's it in cash terms. No one argues with that in terms of the accrual accounting over the next 40 years. Uh, yes, the cost goes into the billions over 40 years, but when was the last time you heard a debate in this House in terms of increasing age pensions looking at the cost over 40 years? When was the last time that was done? We deal with everything in this House in terms of cash terms. We deal with every announcement in terms of cash terms. We deal with every single increase in pensions in terms of cash terms. And to be completely consistent, in line with everything else that the House does, we should deal with this issue in cash terms. And when we deal with this issue in cash terms, over four years, we come out to cash terms at between $100 and $150 million. This point was reinforced by the Commonwealth Actuary during the debate surrounding my fair indexation bill. In advice to Finance Minister Penny Wong in January 2011, the Commonwealth Actuary Michael Burt said, great care should be exercised when using fiscal balance figures for decision-making purposes, particularly in the area of unfunded superannuation arrangements. Madam Deputy Speaker, in case the House missed that point, I shall read it again. I think that's a in good advice idea. To, to Finance Minister Penny Wong in January 2011, the Commonwealth Actuary Michael Burt said, Great care should be exercised when using fiscal balance figures for decision making purposes, particularly in the area of unfunded superannuation arrangements. He blew an almighty hole in this government's claims of the cost of fair indexation is too high. The cost of fair indexation over the next four years is approximately $100 million. The government has told me about $150 million. I'm happy to accept either amounts. And that's before clawback, because, of course, it is taxable. It is not the inflated $1.7 billion that this government, the Labor Party, claims by confusing the accrual side with the cash side. In the first year, it's something like five or six million dollars, and then increases slowly, 100 to 150 million dollars to achieve that. Compare that to 4.7 billion dollars this government has spent because of pride over rolling back the proven Howard government border protection solutions, the Pacific solution, that have led to the debacle we have right now. Can you imagine what that 4.7 billion dollars could have been spent on if this government had left? proven border security solutions alone, we're talking about $100 to $150 million. In negotiating with the Greens, the leader of the Greens, Bob Brown at the time, asked me to come up with the savings on how we would pay for this prior to the vote on our private members' bill in the Senate. Uh, in the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee hearing, I questioned the then Secretary, Secretary Watt, uh, and Mr Minns, who was the DEPSEC people. Uh, and asked them about the 12.8 per cent increase uh, over the Ford estimates of public servants. And they indicated, because of a range of things, not notwithstanding the government's cut for the defence budget, that that increase would not be as high. I suggested 30 per cent less. They agreed, which came up to about 200 to $250 million, which I took to Senator Brown as the savings, notwithstanding the Greens actually promised 
in 2007 and 2010 to index DFRDB pensions, and when given the savings to make true and real their promise in writing, they still voted against it. And surprise, surprise, the Minister for Defence, a number of months later, announced the savings in exactly the same quantum and the exactly the same numbers as I brought up in the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee meeting. Not only did I indicate where the savings could be, where the money could be found in the budget, not only did the government then a few months later take those exact savings, those exact numbers, and pocket that exact amount of money, but that money was identified to fund, over the Ford estimates, the indexation of super, but they took the savings and dudded 57,000 veterans and their families. And the tragedy is that we've just come to expect this. We've come to expect this from a government that can't even put pink bats in roofs without blowing two and a half billion dollars, that can't put up school halls without private schools getting a 60 per cent advantage over public schools because of a $5 billion in waste that went to Labor state governments. $36 million spent on advertising the carbon tax ads and, of course, $4.7 billion because of pride in rolling back the border protection solutions that worked, of which the government has now done an amazing backflip. The money was found, it was identified, the government pocketed it and delivered nothing. More recently, of course, the Veteran Affairs Minister, Minister Snowden, at the table this evening, argued that a superannuant on $58,000 per year didn't need fair indexation. They were already well off. Labor's politics of envy are alive, especially when it comes to military superannuants. What Minister Snowden failed to acknowledge, however, is that the average DFRDB military pension is just $24,386, two and a half times less the figure he quoted in June. Labor is misleading the public. Not to mention that in June veterans were sent letters offering them a few cents extra per fortnight in their pensions. Many veterans received an increase of less than a dollar a fortnight. As Tony Abbott said on his Brisbane radio in 2010, you can turn this into a huge figure, if you like, in any one year, though it is bearable, and it should be borne. At the last election, we identified more than $50 billion in savings to meet these commitments. But more specifically, I identified over $200 million in savings on defence personnel, savings the minister re-announced two months later that he pocketed that was not spent on indexing pensions. Madam Deputy Speaker, on another matter of importance regarding the bill, when this legislation passes the House, the coalition will seek to further amend the legislation to deliver fairness for disabled veterans with higher pharmaceutical costs. Labor's pharmaceutical reimbursement scheme is flawed and it is unfair. It has created two classes of disabled veterans, those with qualifying service and those without. What we do know is up to 1,500 of our most disabled veterans get no assistance from the scheme. These are, are our most disabled veterans receiving the special rate or TPI pension, but who don't, do not have qualifying service as defined by the Veterans Entitlement Act 1986. The coalition has a better way. At the last election, we proposed a comprehensive veterans pharmaceutical reimbursement scheme which delivered financial relief to more than 80,000 disabled veterans. Importantly, it did not create two classes of veterans and ensure that all of our most disabled veterans had no out-of-pocket pharmaceutical expenses. The coalition scheme was also immediate. There were no cumbersome requirements needed, nor was there any need for technical amendments, as this legislation proposes to ensure the scheme functioned properly. Under the coalition scheme, a veteran who qualified for the scheme would only pay for 30 scripts per year. Once they reached this veteran's pharmaceutical safety net, they paid no more for their scripts. This meant immediate financial relief for veterans. Significantly, the coalition scheme did not require cumbersome reimbursements. Labor's scheme leaves veterans waiting for the calendar to tick over to a new year before they receive any financial relief for the costs of pharmaceuticals. In the Senate, the coalition will move amendments to extend eligibility for the veterans 
pharmaceutical reimbursement scheme to include all special rate or TPI service pensions. Our amendments will extend the coverage of the scheme beyond just those disability pensions, pensioners with qualifying service to also include all special rate pensioners. This amendment will bring fairness and justice to Labor's flawed and unfair scheme. These amendments will cost 234,000 per year, based on the government's advice about the average cost of the reimbursement and the approximate number of 1,500 special rate pensioners without qualifying service. The government scheme is budgeted to cost 30 million over the next four years, making this extension a very, very modest additional cost to provide the extra fairness. It's a small price to pay to ensure our most disabled service personnel are not further disadvantaged by Labor's unfair pharmaceutical reimbursement scheme. If successful in the Senate, I'll be supporting the Senate's request for the House to amend the legislation in this respect. I look forward to coming back and doing so, again with the Minister for Veteran Affairs at the table. Providing fair indexation for Australia's DFRB and DFRDB military superannuation, superannuants is the right and proper thing to do. My amendment to the Veteran Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill, this bill, has only been necessary due to the continual intransience of this government. Recently I spoke, in fact last week, in response to the Minister of Defence's ministerial statement, and the member for Eden Monero, Parliamentary Secretary for Defence, the Hon. Mike Kelly, AM, was also at the table. I had heard that he had been saying to his veteran groups that he would be seeking, at a later juncture, to move a private member's bill to index DFRDB pensions the same way as we are seeking to do. And I said to the member for Eden Monero, I have heard this. I am happy to be wrong. I am happy to apologise if I was wrong, and I would provide every assistance on indulgence for the member for Eden Monero to rise from his seat to approach the dispatch box to point out the error of my way, to say I was wrong and that that was not his intent, or if it was his intent to move a private member's bill straight away. The member for Eden Monero did nothing. He didn't move. His silence was acquiescence, and he walked out the chamber. He had the opportunity to say I was wrong and I would have apologised, but he didn't. He didn't, because he has no intention of moving a private member's bill. He is all talk and no action on this. He was all talk and all writing letters, all signatures and ink, when he wrote to the then Finance Minister, Minister Tanner. But when the rubber hits the road and he's called to the dispatch box, to either refute and I would back down or to back up his words with action, he shrunk like a wilting violet. The member for Eden Monero is a fine man, Madam Deputy Speaker. He's a decent Australian. But he failed that test on that day last week. In urging all to support this amendment, I look in front of me and there is the member for Blair looking to speak next. The member for Blair in relation to the latest CPI increase said, and I'll quote the member for Blair, it is ridiculous to expect people to accept a 0.1 per cent increase. That is unviable given the cost of living. It is too meagre and it needs to change. The current situation is unsustainable. It's become exacerbated by a series of fairly low CPI rises. The government needs to look at this again. Well, I say to the member of Blair, I have read your comments faithfully, sir. If I haven't, stand and correct me. If they are indeed your words, and I know they are, join us in indexing fair and equitable military superannuation. Match your words, sir, with action. Do that. You have the chance tonight, or if the vote comes tomorrow, to do that. The Greens, in their 2010 election policy, said in a long-running campaign current and former Defence Force personnel have been pushing to ensure their superannuation pensions are indexed fairly and appropriately. It is a campaign the Australian Greens support wholeheartedly. Except when a private member's bill in the Senate, except when savings are identified and at the time they are needed to match the words that they took to an election they were found wanting. Bob Brown in March 2011 said at the outset, I should say that fair indexation is consistent with the Australian Greens policy of the last election. Well, he says that when he needs the votes of 40-odd thousand Tasmanians, but when it comes time to vote in the Senate, he is found wanting. 
The independent in this House, member for Dobell, Craig Thompson, said of supporting fair indexation, I am the only MP of the Central Coast who is prepared to support them. There are two others will won't, who won't. Well, when this comes to the vote, I expect the member for Dobell to be a man of his word and to back up those statements, as I expect it for the member of Blair, who I know to be a man of his word. I know the member uh, for Denison, Andrew Wilkie, has also publicly supported indexing fair and equitable DFRB and DFRDB in the past. He said, and I'll quote, the ALP should be condemned for not doing something about it since its election in 2007. Defence Force retirees in particular would be better cared for if the unsatisfactory indexing of defence pensions were overturned in favour of a, of a system that at least keeps up with the cost of living. The independent member for Lyne, Rob Oakshot MP, has moved two motions in the House of Representatives calling for fair indexation, the last motion seconded by the member for New England, Tony Windsor. The member for Lyne said, there are many in the community who are aggrieved and their concerns deserve to be heard in the House. There are many who are frustrated that government report after report seems to get the concerns about a lack of purchasing power within the current military superannuation scheme, yet when it actually comes to doing something about it, the arguments of cost and difficulty in making those changes seem to be directed towards those who have done military service. He continues, I wanted to be recognised that defence service is unique within the public service. The uniqueness of defence service lies in defending the nation, our sovereignty and our freedoms. They are fine words, fine words to the member from Lyne. He continues, I hope it is generally recognised that CPI is not a good indicator for cost of living messages and for measures and for purchasing power. In my view, the alternatives that are worthy of consideration are in the form of age and welfare pensions, which are indexed by the new living cost index to reflect the falling or the failing of CPI in the pensioner and beneficiary living cost index, or the male total average weekly earnings, whichever is greater. And of course, the independent the member for New England, Tony Windsor, asked the Minister for Finance, Minister Lindsay, in 2010, he asked what measures will he take and when to address the ongoing concern within the veteran community that a, the indexation of military superannuation pensions against the current price index is not an accurate measure of the cost of living and b, inequality exists between the indexing of military superannuation pension and other pensions such as age and welfare and will he consider introducing a fairer indexation method for military superannuation pensions in line with that used to calculate age and welfare pensions. Mr Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, prior to the 2007 election, the Labor Party indicated that they will index pensions. Many of their front bench wrote to the Minister Tanner seeking the pensions to be indexed. Many of the independents I've just read through have all publicly stated their desire to index military pensions. The cost is about $100 to $150 million in cash terms over the next four years. Savings of up to $250 million were outlined in the private member's bill in the Senate last year. And within two months of that private member's bill being defeated by the Labor and the Greens, the Minister for Defence acted on those savings and pocketed that money. It was promised. The independents have backed it. The money was outlined, the money was found and the money was pocketed. There is no reason, none, why this parliament this week shouldn't join with and support the coalition, that no more steps will be taken in this area on this bill until the fair indexation of DFRB and DFRDB pensions is addressed. We call on those that have publicly called on, on the issue. We call on those that have made a point of this issue. We call on those that have stood on soapboxes about this issue seeking votes to now stand and put their vote where their mouth is, support the coalition on indexing pensions. Is the amendment seconded? <coughs> Member for Canning. 
The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable member Fadden has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. If it suits the House, I will state the question in the form that the amendment be agreed to. The question now is that the amendment be agreed to. I call the member for Blair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I speak in support of the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 2012. Deputy Speaker, the Repatriation Commission is responsible for determining and managing claims under the uh, Veterans Entitlement Act. And the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission is responsible for determining and managing claims under the MRCA and the SRCA. And lest we think that this, these sort of bits of legislation are irrelevant or small, they do certainly affect people across the electorates in this place. MRCA active clients in the electorate of Blair as at the 30th of March 2012, 129 people. Um, SRCA active clients in Blair, the 30th of March 2012, 252 people. So these are people whose lives will benefit by this form of uh, legislation. There's a range of miscellaneous measures here in this particular uh, bill that tidy up, to a certain extent, uh, things that have happened. Also, who, to exempt from income tax purposes um, certain things and to make sure that, uh, for example, uh, people on Norfolk Island uh, are eligible for clean energy payments under a Veterans Entitlement Act and the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Act. And, Deputy Speaker, I'll deal with each of those as we go through, and I'll deal briefly in relation to them. The uh, first element of this particular bill that's before the chamber deals with travel expenses for treatment. Now, the DFA uh, funds eligible uh, people for travel yeah, to appointments for medical treatment. It's a sad fact of reality that as uh, veterans get older, and sometimes because of what they've experienced, uh, they have more medical treatment and need more travel uh, than other, for those purposes than other Australians, and particularly if they're living in regional and rural areas in electorate like mine. So the amendment makes clear that policy which has been happening in practice, uh, that within the act, this type of travel can be approved by the DVA after the travel has been undertaken by that particular person who is eligible for reimbursement. Um, this has been a practice uh, that has been undertaken by the DVA for a very long time, um, and it really uh, now is simply authorised uh, by the legislation to avoid any um, hint or suggestion that it is not actually covered. The next in relation to um, is eligibility under the Defence Service Homes Act for an operation in the Red Sea from the 3rd, uh, 13th of January to the 19th of January 1993, an operation Damascus 6, being reclassification here and a reclassification as operational service. That makes sure that those who have been engaged in this particular operation for that short period of time, um, as a result, will be eligible for subsidised home loans and insurance under the Defence Service Homes Act of 1918. The third aspect that I wish to deal with briefly uh, is special assistance. The, the VEA and the MRCA gives the Commission the power to extend uh, special assistance and benefits to people not otherwise provided for under the legislation. And currently that is provided uh, by means of regulation, and the amendment here um, makes it clear that that sort of assistance is provided by way of a legislative instrument rather than regulation, and it permits a more timely uh, payment and assistance provided. The next one, the fourth one, it deals with debt recovery, the technical amendment in making sure that debt recovery provision within the legislation applies to all possible circumstances relating to um, uh, debt recovery. Uh, the, fourth, the fifth one, as I said before, it deals with clean energy payments uh, payable to those people residing in Australia. Um, I'm not always sure that the people who live in Norfolk Island think they actually are Australians, and having visited the place 
uh, myself and enjoy the holiday there. They are unique people, the Norfolk Island residents. But this amendment makes sure that uh, Norfolk Island residents are eligible for clean energy assistance payments also, as any other Australians would be. But the next aspect deals with the MRCA supplement. Um, as we did in 2009 the most historic pension reform, the largest pension increase we've ever seen in the history of the Commonwealth of Australia, this Federal Labor government did that. And it, and, uh, that as part of that package, we introduced the MRCA supplement, which replaced uh, the telephone and the pharmaceutical allowances that were payable. Uh, the amendment really just fixes up a clause making sure that all references to the previous telephone and pharmaceutical allowances are replaced with a reference to the actual supplement that now exists and how it's described now as the MRCA supplement. The next one deals with uh, a bereavement payment. The VEA provides a bereavement payment to the estates of a deceased a veteran or member in receipt of a special rate or extreme disability adjustment, disability payment, and died in really circumstances that were indigent. So very poor circumstances. The amendment makes sure that that bereavement payment is exempt for income tax purposes. Uh, the next aspect of this particular amendment bill, as I said, it's a very tidy up uh, provision deals with the Veterans Pharmaceutical uh, Reimbursement Scheme, and pro which provides reimbursement of all out-of-pocket expenses incurred in the purchase of pharmaceuticals under that scheme. Um, the approximately 70,000 veterans and members are eligible for annual automatic uh, reimbursement of those costs, and those payments uh, will commence from the 1st of January 2013. And the amendment simply makes crystal clear that the Payments here are tax-free. Now, Deputy Speaker, uh, the previous speaker dealt with issues in relation to DFRDB. What he failed to say um, was that for nearly 12 years the coalition did nothing in relation to that issue. And it, there was a lot of sanction and unction mentioned and displayed and passion there, but really uh, they did nothing in relation to that issue. And further, he didn't he didn't point out the fact that that what they were proposing excluded about 150,000 military superannuation benefits scheme members from, the, from June 2011. Also, he, didn't, he failed to mention the fact that on his proposal he's excluding other public servants, common public servants, receiving similar type schemes. So uh, a lot of uh, passion and unction, but simply uh, failed to specify to the House that that proposal, which he now says they would do, which the Howard government never did, and which the then fin Minister for Finance, uh, Nick Minchin, opposed passionately, uh, could never get it through past Peter Costello nor John Howard, is something that he claims that they will do. Um, but what he really should simply say is that in the past they've always opposed that, and he also now wants to discriminate in his proposal in relation to this. I think that it's not appropriate to bring this amendment to this particular legislation, and, and I think in the circumstances at this time, because this is a fix-up type legislation, um, and uh, what the, uh, the member is trying to do is simply discriminate, as, he, as I say, between different forms of military service and in service on behalf of the public. To be speaker, the legislation that's before the House is very clear legislation that, that is in the benefit of, to the benefit of lots of Australians and particularly Australians who live in my electorate, and I support the legislation. Order is the question is now is that the amendment be agreed to. I call the member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker.